Chapter One of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter One Despondency and Consolation. Before I begin to tell you some of the things I have seen and heard, in both of which I have had to take a share, now from the compulsion of my office, now from the leading of my own heart, and now from that destiny which, including both, so often throws the man who supposed himself a mere onlooker into the very vortex of events, that destiny which took form to the old pagans as a grey mist high beyond the heads of their gods, but to us is known as an infinite love, revealed in the mystery of man. I say before I begin, it is fitting that, in the absence of a common friend to do that office for me, I should introduce myself to your acquaintance, and I hope coming friendship. Nor can there be any impropriety in my telling you about myself, seeing I remain concealed behind my own words. You can never look me in the eyes, though you may look me in the soul. You may find me out, find my faults, my vanities, my sins, but you will not see me, at least in this world. To you I am but a voice of revealing, not a form of vision. Therefore I am bold behind the mask, to speak to you heart to heart. Bold, I say, just so much the more that I do not speak to you face to face. And when we meet in heaven, well, there I know there is no hiding. There, there is no reason for hiding anything. There, the whole desire will be alternate revelation and vision. I am now getting old, faster and faster. I cannot help my gray hairs, nor the wrinkles that gather so slowly yet ruthlessly. No, nor the quaver that will come in my voice, not the sense of being feeble in the knees, even when I walk only across the floor of my study but I have not got used to age yet. I do not feel one atom older than I did at three and twenty. Nay, to tell the truth, I feel a good deal younger. For then I only felt that a man had to take up his cross, whereas now I feel that a man has to follow him, and that makes an unspeakable difference. When my voice quavers, I feel that it is mine and not mine that it just belongs to me like my watch, which does not go well now, though it went well thirty years ago, not more than a minute out in a month. And when I feel my knees shake, I think of them with a kind of pity, as I used to think of an old mare of my father's, of which I was very fond when I was a lad, and which bore me across many a field and over many a fence, but which at last came to have the same weakness in her knees that I have in mine and she knew it, too, and took care of them, and so of herself, in a wise equine fashion. These things are not me, or I, if the grammarians like it better. I always feel a strife between doing as the scholar does, and doing as other people do. They are not me. I say, I have them, and, please God, shall soon have better. For it is not a pleasant thing for a young man, or a young woman either, I venture to say, to have an old voice and a wrinkled face and weak knees and grey hair, or no hair at all. And if any moral Philistine, as our queer German brothers over the northern fish-pond would call him, say that this is all rubbish, for that we are old, I would answer, Of all children, how can the children of God be old? So little do I give in to calling this outside of me, me, that I should not mind presenting a minute description of my own person, such as would at once clear me from any suspicion of vanity in so introducing myself. Not that my honesty would result in the least from indifference to the external, but from comparative indifference to the transitional. Not to the transitional in itself, which is of eternal significance and result but to the particular form of imperfection which it may have reached at any individual moment of its infinite progression toward the complete. For no sooner have I spoken the word now, than that now is dead, and another is dying. Nay, in such a regard there is no now, 
only a past of which we know a little, and a future of which we know far less and far more. But I will not speak at all of this body of my earthly tabernacle, for it is on the whole more pleasant to forget all about it. And besides, I do not want to set any of my readers, to whom I would have the pleasure of speaking far more openly and cordially, than if they were seated on the other side of my writing-table. I do not want to set them wondering whether the vicar be this vicar or that vicar, or indeed to run the risk of giving the offence I might give, if I were anything else than a wandering voice. I did not feel as I feel now, when first I came to this parish, for, as I have said, I am now getting old very fast. True, I was thirty when I was made a vicar, an age at which a man might be expected to be beginning to grow wise but even then I had much yet to learn. I well remember the first evening on which I wandered out from the vicarage to take a look about me, to find out, in short, where I was, and what aspect the sky and earth here presented. Strangely enough, I had never been here before, for the presentation had been made me while I was abroad. I was depressed. It was depressing weather, Grave doubts as to whether I was in my place in the church would keep rising and floating about, like rain-clouds within me. Not that I doubted about the church. I only doubted about myself. Were my motives pure? What were my motives? And to tell the truth, I did not know what my motives were, and therefore I could not answer about the purity of them. Perhaps, seeing we are in this world in order to become pure, it would be expecting too much of any young man that he should be absolutely certain that he was pure in anything. But the question followed very naturally. Had I then any right to be in the church, to be eating her bread and drinking her wine without knowing whether I was fit to do her work? To which the only answer I could find was, The church is part of God's world. He makes men to work, and work of some sort must be done by every honest man. Somehow or other, I hardly know how, I find myself in the church. I do not know that I am fitter for any other work. I see no other work to do. There is work here which I can do after some fashion. With God's help I will try to do it well. This resolution brought me some relief, but still I was depressed. It was depressing weather. I may as well say that I was not married then, and that I firmly believed I should never be married, not from any ambition taking the form of self-denial, nor yet from any notion that God takes pleasure in being a hard master. But there was a lady, well, I will be honest as I would be. I had been refused a few months before, which I think was the best thing that ever happened to me except one. That one, of course, was when I was accepted. But this is not much to the purpose now. Only, it was depressing weather. For is it not depressing when the rain is falling and the stream of it is rising? When the river is crawling along muddily and the horses stand stock still in the meadows with their spines in a straight line from the ears to where they fail utterly in the tails? I should only put on galoshes now and think of the days when I despised damp. Ah, it was mental waterproof that I needed then for let me despise damp as much as I would, I could neither keep it out of my mind, nor help suffering the spiritual rheumatism which it occasioned. Now the damp never gets farther than my galoshes and my mackintosh, and for that worst kind of rheumatism I never feel it now. But I had begun to tell you about that first evening. I had arrived at the vicarage the night before, and it had rained all day, and was still raining, though not so much. I took my umbrella and went out, for as I wanted to do my work well, everything taking far more the shape of work to me then and duty than it does now, though even now I must confess things have occasionally to be done by the clergyman because there is no one else to do them, and hardly from other motive than a sense of duty, a man not being able to shirk work because it may happen to be dirty. I say, as I wanted to do my work well, or rather, perhaps, because I dreaded drudgery as much as any poor fellow who comes to the treadmill in consequence, I wanted to interest myself in it, 
and therefore I would go and fall in love, first of all, if I could, with the country round about, and my first step beyond my own gate was up to the ankles in mud. Therewith, curiously enough, arose the distracting thought how I could possibly preach two good sermons a Sunday to the same people, when one of the sermons was in the afternoon instead of the evening, to which latter I had been accustomed in the large town in which I had formerly officiated as curate, in a proprietary chapel. I, who had declaimed indignantly against excitement from without, who had been inclined to exalt the intellect at the expense even of the heart, began to fear that there must be something in the darkness, and the gaslights, and the crowd of faces, to account for a man's being able to preach a better sermon, and for the servant girls preferring to go out for the evening. Alas! I had now to preach, as I might judge with all probability beforehand, to a company of rustics, of thought yet slower than of speech, unaccustomed in fact to think at all, and that in the sleepiest, deadest part of the day, when I could hardly think myself, and when, if the weather should be at all warm, I could not expect many of them to be awake. And what good might I look for as the result of my labor? How could I hope in these men and women to kindle that fire which, in the old days of the outpouring of the Spirit, made men live with the sense of the kingdom of heaven above them? and the expectation of something glorious at hand, just outside that invisible door which lay between the worlds. I have learned since that perhaps I overrated the spirituality of those times, and underrated, not being myself spiritual enough to see all about me, the spirituality of these times. I think I have learned since that the parson of a parish must be content to keep the upper windows of his mind open to the holy winds and the pure lights of heaven, and the side windows of tone, of speech, of behavior, open to the earth, to let forth upon his fellow men the tenderness and truth with which those upper influences bring forth in any region exposed to their operation. Believing in his master, such a servant shall not make haste shall feel no feverous desire to behold the work of his hands, shall be content to be as his master, who waiteth long for the fruits of his earth. But surely I am getting older than I thought, for I keep wandering away from my subject, which is this, my first walk in my new cure. My excuse is that I want my reader to understand something of the state of my mind, and the depression under which I was laboring he will perceive that I desired to do some work worth calling by the name of work, and that I did not see how to get hold of a beginning. I had not gone far from my own gate before the rain ceased, though it was still gloomy enough for any amount to follow. I drew down my umbrella and began to look about me. The stream on my left was so swollen that I could see its brown in patches through the green of the meadows along its banks. A little in front of me, the road, rising quickly, took a sharp turn to pass along an old stone bridge that spanned the water with a single fine arch, somewhat pointed. And through the arch I could see the river stretching away up through the meadows, its banks bordered with pollards. Now, pollards always made me miserable. In the first place, they look ill-used. In the second place, they look tame. In the third place, they look very ugly. I had not learned then to honor them on the ground that they yield not a jot to the adversity of their circumstances, that if they must be pollards, they still will be trees, and what they may not do with grace, they will yet do with bounty, that, in short, their life bursts forth, despite of all that is done to repress and destroy their individuality. When you have once learned to honor anything, love is not very far off at least that has always been my experience. But as I have said, I had not yet learned to honor pollards, and therefore they made me more miserable than I was already. When, having followed the road, I stood at last on the bridge, and looking up and down the river through the misty air, saw two long rows of these pollards diminishing till they vanished in both directions, the sight of them took from me all power of enjoying the water beneath me, the green fields around me, 
or even the old world beauty of the little bridge upon which I stood, although all sorts of bridges have been from very infancy a delight to me. For I am one of those who never get rid of their infantile predilections, and to have once enjoyed making a mud bridge was to enjoy all bridges for ever. I saw a man in a white smock frock coming along the road beyond but I turned my back to the road, leaned my arms on the parapet of the bridge, and stood gazing where I saw no visions, namely at those very poplars. I heard the man's footsteps coming up the crown of the arch, but I would not turn to greet him. I was in a selfish humor, if ever I was, for surely, if ever one man ought to greet another, it was upon such a comfortless afternoon. The footsteps stopped behind me, and I heard a voice. I beg your pardon, sir, but be you the new vicar? I turned instantly and answered, I am. Do you want me? I wanted to see your face, sir, that was all, if you'll not take it amiss. Before me stood a tall old man with his hat in his hand, clothed, as I have said, in a white smock frock. He smoothed his short gray hair with his curved palm down over his forehead as he stood. His face was of a red-brown from much exposure to the weather. There was a certain look of roughness, without hardness in it, which spoke of endurance rather than resistance, although he could evidently set his face as a flint. His features were large and a little coarse, but the smile that parted his lips when he spoke shone in his gray eyes as well, and lighted up a countenance in which a man might trust. "'I wanted to see your face, sir, if you'll not take it amiss.' "'Certainly not,' I answered, pleased with the man's address, as he stood square before me, looking as modest as fearless. The sight of a man's face is what everybody has a right to, but for all that I should like to know why you want to see my face. "'Why, sir, you be the new vicar. You kindly told me so when I axed you. Well, then, you'll see my face on Sunday in church, that is, if you happen to be there. For although some might think it the more dignified way, I could not take it as a matter of course that he would be at church. A man might have better reasons for staying away from church than I had for going, even though I was the parson, and it was my business. Some clergymen separate between themselves and their office to a degree which I cannot understand. To assert the dignities of my office seems to me very like exalting myself, and when I have had a twinge of conscience about it, as has happened more than once, I have then found comfort in these two texts. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And it is enough that the servant should be as his master. Neither have I ever been able to see the very great difference between right and wrong in a clergyman, and right and wrong in another man. All that I can pretend to have yet discovered comes to this that what is right in another man is right in a clergyman, and what is wrong in another man is much worse in a clergyman. Here, however, is one more proof of approaching age. I do not mean the opinion, but the digression. Well, then, I said, you'll see my face in church on Sunday, if you happen to be there. Yes, sir, but you see, sir, on the bridge here, the parson is the parson, like, and I'm old Rogers, and I looks in his face, and he looks in mine, and I says to myself, This is my parson. But o' Sundays he's nobody's parson. He's got his work to do, and it moan be done, and there's an end on it. That there was a real idea in the old man's mind was considerably clearer than the logic by which he tried to bring it out. Did you know parson that's gone, sir? he went on. No, I answered. Oh, sir, he were a good parson. Many's the time he come and sit at my son's bedside, him that's dead and gone, sir, for a long hour on a Saturday night, too. And then when I see him up in the desk the next morning, I say to myself, Old Rogers, that's the same man as sat by your son's bedside last night. Think of that, old Rogers. But somehow I never did feel right sure of that same. He didn't seem to have the same cut somehow, and he didn't talk a bit the same. And when he spoke to me after sermon in the churchyard, I was always of a mind to go into the church again and look up to the pulpit to see if he were really out of it. For this warn't the same man, you see. 
but you'll know all about it better than I can tell you, sir. Only I always liked Parson better out of the pulpit, and that's how I come to want to make you look at me, sir, instead of the water down there afore I see you in the church tomorrow morning. The old man laughed a kindly laugh, but he had set me thinking, and I did not know what to say to him all at once. So after a short pause he resumed. You'll be thinking me a queer kind of a man, sir, to speak to my betters before my better speaks to me. But mayhap you don't know what a parson is to us poor folk that has ne'er a friend more larned than themselves but the parson. And besides, sir, I'm an old salt, an old man o' war's man, and I've been all around the world, sir, and I have been in all sorts of company, pirates and all, sir, and I ain't a bit frightened of a parson. No, I love a parson, sir, and I'll tell you for why, sir. He's got a good telescope, and he gets to the masthead, and he looks out, and he sings out, Land ahead, or Breakers ahead, and he gives directions accordin'. Only I can't always make out what he says. But when he shuts up his spyglass, and comes down the riggin', and talks to us like one man to another, then I don't know what I should do without the parson. Good evening to you, sir, and welcome to Marshmallows. The pollards did not look half so dreary. The river began to glimmer a little, and the old bridge had become an interesting old bridge. The country altogether was rather nice than otherwise. I had found a friend already. That is, a man to whom I might possibly be of some use, and that was the most precious friend I could think of in my present situation and mood. I had learned something from him, too, and I resolved to try all I could to be the same man in the pulpit that I was out of it. Some may be inclined to say that I had better have formed the resolution to be the same man out of the pulpit that I was in it, but the one will go quite right with the other. Out of the pulpit I would be the same man I was in it, seeing and feeling the realities of the unseen, and in the pulpit I would be the same man I was out of it taking facts as they are, and dealing with things as they show themselves in the world. One other occurrence before I went home that evening, and I shall close the chapter. I hope I shall not write another so dull as this. I dare not promise, though, for this is a new kind of work to me. Before I left the bridge, while in fact I was contemplating the pollards with an eye, if not of favor, yet of diminished dismay, the sun, which for anything I knew of his whereabouts, either from knowledge of the country, aspect of the evening, or state of my own feelings, might have been down for an hour or two, burst his cloudy bands, and blazed out as if he had just risen from the dead, instead of being just about to sink into the grave. Do not tell me that my figure is untrue, for that the sun never sinks into the grave, else I will retort that it is just as true of the sun as of a man for that no man sinks into the grave, he only disappears. Life is a constant sunrise, which death cannot interrupt, any more than the night can swallow up the sun. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Well, the sun shone out gloriously. The whole sweep of the gloomy river answered him in gladness. The wet leaves of the pollards quivered and glanced, the meadows offered up their perfect green, fresh and clear out of the trouble of the rain, and away in the distance, upon a rising ground covered with trees, glittered a weathercock. What if I found afterwards that it was only on the roof of a stable? It shone, and that was enough. And when the sun had gone below the horizon, and the fields and the river were dusky once more, there it glittered still over the darkening earth a symbol of that faith which is the evidence of things not seen. And it made my heart swell as at a chant from the prophet Isaiah. What mattered then whether it hung over a stable roof or a church tower? I stood up and wandered a little farther, off the bridge and along the road. I had not gone far before I passed a house, out of which came a young woman leading a little boy. They came after me, the boy gazing at the red and gold and green of the sunset sky. As they passed me, the child said, "'Auntie, I think I should like to be a painter.' "'Why?' returned his companion. "'Because then,' answered the child, "'I could help God to paint the sky.' 
What his aunt replied I do not know, for they were presently beyond my hearing. But I went on answering him myself all the way home. Did God care to paint the sky of an evening that a few of his children might see it, and get just a hope, just an aspiration, out of its passing green and gold and purple and red? And should I think my day's labor lost if it wrought no visible salvation in the earth? But was the child's aspiration in vain? Could I tell him God did not want his help to paint the sky? True, he could mount no scaffold against the infinite of the glowing west, but might he not with his little palette and brush, when the time came, show his brothers and sisters what he had seen there, and make them see it too? Might he not thus come, after long trying, to help God paint this glory of vapor and light inside the minds of his children? Ah, if any man's work is not with God, its results shall be burned, ruthlessly burned, because poor and bad. So, for my part, I said to myself as I walked home, if I can put one touch of a rosy sunset into the life of any man or woman of my cure, I shall feel that I have worked with God. He is in no haste, and if I do what I may in earnest, I need not mourn if I work no great work on the earth. Let God make his sunsets, I will model my little fading cloud. To help the growth of a thought that struggles towards the light, to brush with gentle hand the earth stain from the white of one snowdrop, such be my ambition. So shall I scale the rocks in front, not leave my name carved upon those behind me. People talk about special providences. I believe in the providences, but not in the specialty. I do not believe that God lets the thread of my affairs go for six days, and on the seventh evening takes it up for a moment. The so-called special providences are no exception to the rule. They are common to all men at all moments. But it is a fact that God's care is more evident in some instances of it than in others to the dim and often bewildered vision of humanity. Upon such instances men seize and call them providences. It is well that they can, but it would be gloriously better if they could believe that the whole matter is one grand providence. I was one of such men at the time, and could not fail to see what I called a special providence in this, that on my first attempt to find where I stood in the scheme of providence, and while I was discouraged with regard to the work before me, I should fall in with these two, an old man whom I could help, and a child who could help me the one opening an outlet for my labor and my love, and the other reminding me of the highest source of the most humbling comfort, that in all my work I might be a fellow worker with God. End of chapter 1 Recording by Lee Smalley Chapter 2 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter 2 My First Sunday at Marshmallows. These events fell on the Saturday night. On the Sunday morning I read prayers and preached. Never before had I enjoyed so much of the petitions of the church, which Hooker calls the sending of angels upward, or the reading of the lessons, which he calls the receiving of angels descended from above. And whether from the newness of the parson, or the love of the service, certainly a congregation more intent or more responsive a clergyman will hardly find. But, as I had feared, it was different in the afternoon. The people had dined, and the usual somnolence had followed. Nor could I find in my heart to blame men and women who had worked hard all the week for being drowsy on the day of rest. So I curtailed my sermon as much as I could, omitting page after page of my manuscript, and when I came to a close, was rewarded by perceiving an agreeable surprise upon many of the faces round me. I resolved that, in the afternoon at least, my sermon should be as short as heart could wish. 
But that afternoon there was at least one man of the congregation who was neither drowsy nor inattentive. Repeatedly my eyes left the page off which I was reading and glanced towards him. Not once did I find his eyes turned away from me. There was a small loft in the west end of the church, in which stood a little organ, whose voice, weakened by years of praising and possibly of neglect, had yet, among a good many tones that were rough, wooden, and reedy, a few remaining that were as mellow as ever praiseful heart could wish to praise withal. And these came in amongst the rest like trusting thoughts amidst eating cares, like the faces of children born in the arms of a crowd of anxious mothers, like hopes that are young prophecies amidst the downward sweep of events. For, though I do not understand music, I have a keen ear for the perfection of the single tone, or the completeness of the harmony, but of this organ more by and by. Now this little gallery was something larger than was just necessary for the organ and its ministrants, and a few of the parishioners had chosen to sit in its forefront. Upon this occasion there was no one there but the man to whom I have referred. The space below this gallery was not included in the part of the church used for the service. It was claimed by the gardener of the place, that is the sexton, to hold his gardening tools. There were a few ancient carvings in wood lying in it, very brown in the dusky light that came through a small lancet window, opening not to the outside, but into the tower, itself dusky with an enduring twilight. And there were some broken old headstones, and the kindly spade and pickaxe. But I have really nothing to do with these now, for I am, as it were, in the pulpit, whence one ought to look beyond such things as these. Rising against the screen which separated this mouldy portion of the church from the rest, stood an old monument of carved wood, once brilliantly painted in the portions that bore the arms of the family over whose vault it stood, but now all bare and worn, itself gently flowing away into the dust it commemorated. It lifted its gablet, carved to look like a canopy, till its apex was on a level with the book board on the front of the organ loft, and over, in fact, upon this apex appeared the face of the man whom I have mentioned. It was a very remarkable countenance, pale and very thin, without any hair, except that of thick eyebrows that for overhung keen questioning eyes. Short bushy hair, gray, not white, covered a well-formed head with a high, narrow forehead. As I have said, these keen eyes kept looking at me from under their gray eyebrows all the time of the sermon, intelligently without doubt, but whether sympathetically or otherwise I could not determine. And indeed I hardly know yet. My vestry door opened upon a little group of graves, simple and green, without headstone or slab, poor graves, the memory of whose occupants no one had cared to preserve. Some men must have preceded me here, else the poor would not have lain so near the chancel and the vestry door. All about and beyond were stones, with here and there a monument, for mine was a large parish, and there were old and rich families in it, more of which buried their dead here than assembled their living. But close by the vestry door there was this little billowy lake of grass, and at the end of the narrow path leading from the door was a churchyard wall, with a few steps on each side of it, that the parson might pass at once from the churchyard into his own shrubbery, here tangled, almost matted, from luxuriance of growth. But I would not creep out the back way from among my people. That way might do very well to come in by, but to go out I would use the door of the people. So I went along the church, a fine old place, such as I had never hoped to be presented to, and went out by the door in the north side into the middle of the churchyard. The door on the other side was chiefly used by the few gentry of the neighborhood, in the lick gate with its covered way, for the main road had once passed on that side, was shared between the coffins and the carriages, the dead who had no rank but one, that of the dead, and the living who had more money than their neighbors. For, let the old gentry disclaim it as they may, mere wealth, derived from whatever source, will sooner reach their level than poor antiquity or the rarest refinement of personal worth. Although, to be sure, the oldest of them will sooner give it to the rich, their sons or their daughters to wed, to love if they can, to have children by, than they will yield a jot of their ancestral preeminence 
or acknowledge any equality in their sons or daughters-in-law the carpenter's son is to them an old myth not an everlasting fact to mammon alone will they yield a little of their rank none of it to christ let me glorify god that jesus took not on him the nature of nobles but the seed of adam what could i do without my poor brothers and sisters i passed along the church to the northern door and went out the churchyard lay in bright sunshine all the rain and gloom were gone if one could only bring this glory of sun and grass into one's hope for the future thought i and looking down i saw the little boy who aspired to paint the sky looking up in my face with mingled confidence and awe do you trust me my little man thought i you shall trust me then but i won't be a priest to you i'll be a big brother for the priesthood passes away the brotherhood endures the priesthood passes away swallowed up in the brotherhood it is because men cannot learn simple things cannot believe in the brotherhood they need a priesthood but as dr arnold said of the sunday they do need it and i for one am sure that the priesthood needs the people much more than the people needs the priesthood so i stooped and then lifted the child and held him in my arms and the little fellow looked at me one moment longer and then put his arms gently round my neck and so we were friends when i had set him down which i did presently for i shuddered at the idea of the people thinking that i was showing off the clergyman i looked at the boy and his face was great sweetness mingled with great rusticity and i could not tell whether he was the child of gentlefolk or of peasants he did not say a word but walked away to join his aunt who was waiting for him at the gate of the churchyard he kept his head turned toward me however as he went so that not seeing where he was going he stumbled over the grave of a child and fell in the hollow on the other side i ran to pick him up his aunt reached him at the same moment oh thank you sir she said as i gave him to her with an earnestness which seemed to me disproportionate to the deed and carried him away with a deep blush over all her countenance at the churchyard gate the old man-of-war's man was waiting to have another look at me his hat was in his hand and he gave a pull to the short hair covering his forehead as if he would gladly take that off too to show his respect for the new parson i held out my hand gratefully it could not close around the hand unyielding mass of fingers which met it he did not know how to shake hands and left it all to me but pleasure sparkled in his eyes my old woman would like to shake hands with you sir he said beside him stood his old woman in a portentous bonnet beneath whose gay yellow ribbons appeared a dusky old face wrinkled like a ship's timbers out of which looked a pair of keen black eyes where the best beauty that of loving-kindness had not merely lingered but triumphed i shall be in to see you soon i said as i shook hands with her i shall find out where you live down by the mill she said close by it sir there's one bed in our garden that's always thrives in the hottest summer by the plash from the mill sir ask for old rogers sir said the man everybody knows old rogers but if your reverence minds what my wife says you won't go wrong when you find the river it takes you to the mill and when you find the mill you find the wheel and when you find the wheel you haven't far to look for the cottage sir it's a poor place but you'll be welcome sir chapter three of annals of a quiet neighborhood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg giordano annals of a quiet neighborhood by george macdonald chapter three my first monday at marshmallows the next day i might expect some visitors it is a fortunate thing that english society now regards the parson as a gentleman else he would have little chance of being useful to the upper classes but i wanted to get a good start of them and see some of my poor before my rich came to see me so after breakfast 
on as lovely a monday in the beginning of autumn as ever came to comfort a clergyman in the reaction of his efforts to feed his flock on the sunday i walked out and took my way to the village i strove to dismiss from my mind every feeling of doing duty of performing my part and all that i had a horror of becoming a moral policeman as much as of doing church i would simply enjoy the privilege more open to me in virtue of my office of ministering but as no servant has a right to force his service so i would be the neighbor only until such time as the opportunity of being the servant should show itself the village was as regular as a village should be partly consisting of those white houses with intersecting parallelograms of black which still abound in some regions of our island just in the centre however grouping about an old house of red brick which had once been a manorial residence but was now subdivided in all modes that analytic ingenuity could devise there was a portion of it which from one point of view might seem part of an old town but you had only to pass round any one of three visible corners to see stacks of wheat and a farmyard while in another direction the houses went straggling away into a wood that looked very like the beginning of a forest of which some of the village orchards appeared to form part from the street the slow winding poplar bordered stream was here and there just visible i did not quite like to have it between me and my village i could not help preferring that homely relation in which the houses are built up like swallow nests on to the very walls of the cathedrals themselves to the arrangement here where the river flowed with what flow there was in it between the church and the people a little way beyond the farther end of the village appeared an iron gate of considerable size dividing a lofty stone wall and upon the top of that one of the stone pillars supporting the gate which i could see stood a creature of stone whether natant volant passant couchant or rampant i could not tell only it looked like something terrible enough for a quite antediluvian heraldry as i passed along the street wondering with myself what relations between me and these houses were hidden in the future my eye was caught by the window of a little shop in which strings of beads and elephants of gingerbread formed the chief samples of the goods within it was a window much broader than it was high divided into lozenge shaped panes wondering what kind of old woman presided over the treasures in this cave of aladdin i thought to make the first of my visits by going in and buying something but i hesitated because i could not think of anything i was in want of at least that the old woman was likely to have to be sure i wanted a copy of bengal's gnomon but she was not likely to have that i wanted the fourth plate in the third volume of law's behemen she was not likely to have that either i did not care for gingerbread and i had no little girl to take home beads to but why should i not go in without an ostensible errand for this reason there are dissenters everywhere and i could not tell but i might be going into the shop of a dissenter now though i confess nothing would have pleased me better than that all the dissenters should return to their old home in the church i could not endure the suspicion of laying myself out to entice them back by canvassing or using any personal influence whether they returned or not however and i did not expect many would i hoped still some day to stand towards every one of them in the relation of the parson of the parish that is one of whom each might feel certain that he was ready to serve him or her at any hour when he might be wanted to render a service in the meantime i could not help hesitating i had almost made up my mind to ask if she had a small pocket compass for i had seen such things in little country shops i am afraid only in france though when the door opened and out came the little boy by whom i had already seen twice and who was therefore one of my oldest friends in the place he came across the road to me took me by the hand and said come and see mother where my dear i asked in the shop there he answered is it your mother's shop yes i said no more but accompanied him of course my expectation of seeing an old woman behind the counter had vanished but i was not in the least prepared for the kind of woman i did see the place was half a shop and half a kitchen a yard or so of counter stretched inwards from the door just as a hint to those who might be intrusively inclined beyond this by the chimney corner sat the mother who rose as we entered she was certainly one i do not say of the most beautiful but until i have time to explain further of the most remarkable women i had ever seen her face was absolutely white no pale cream color except her lips and a spot upon each cheek which glowed with a deep carmine you would have said she had been painting and painting very inartistically 
so little was the red shaded into the surrounding white now this was certainly not beautiful indeed it occasioned a strange feeling almost of terror at first for she reminded one of the spectre woman in the rhyme of the ancient mariner but when i got used to her complexion i saw that the form of her features was quite beautiful she might indeed have been lovely but for a certain hardness which showed through the beauty this might have been the result of ill health ill endured but i doubted it for there was a certain modelling of the cheeks and lips which showed the teeth within were firmly closed and taken with the look of the eyes and forehead seemed the expression of a constant and bitter self-command but there were indubitable marks of ill health upon her notwithstanding for not to mention her complexion her large dark eye was burning as if the lamp of life had broken and the oil was blazing and there was a slight expansion of the nostrils which indicated physical unrest but her manner was perfectly almost dreadfully quiet her voice soft low and chiefly expressive of indifference she spoke without looking me in the face but did not seem either shy or ashamed her figure was remarkably graceful though too worn to be beautiful here was a strange parishioner for me and a country toy shop too as soon as the little fellow had brought me in he shrank away through a half-open door that revealed a stair behind what can i do for you sir said the mother coldly and with a kind of book propriety of speech as she stood on the other side of the little counter prepared to open box or drawer at command to tell the truth i hardly know i said i am the new vicar but i do not think that i should have come in to see you just to-day if it had not been that your little boy there uh, where has he gone to <laughs> he asked me to come in and see his mother he is too ready to make advances to strangers sir she said this in an incisive tone oh but i answered i am not a stranger to him i have met him twice before he is little darling i assure you he has quite gained my heart no reply for a moment then just indeed and nothing more i could not understand it but a jar on a shelf marked tobacco rescued me from the most pressing portion of the perplexity namely what to say next would you give me a quarter of a pound of tobacco i said the woman turned took down the jar arranged the scales weighed out the quantity wrapped it up took the money and all without one other word than thank you sir which was all i could return with the addition of good morning for nothing was left me but to walk away with my parcel in my pocket the little boy did not show himself again i had hoped to find him outside pondering speculating i now set out for the mill which i had already learned was on the village side of the river coming to a lane leading down to the river i followed it and then walked up a path outside the row of pollards through a lovely meadow where brown and white cows were eating and shining all over the thick deep grass beyond the meadow a wood on the side of a rising ground went parallel with the river a long way the river flowed on my right that is i knew that it was flowing but i could not have told how i knew it was so slow still swollen it was of a clear brown in which you could see the browner trouts darting to and fro with such a slippery gliding that the motion seemed the result of will without any such intermediate and complicate arrangement as brain and nerves and muscles the water beetles went spinning about over the surface and one glorious dragonfly made a mist about him with his long wings and over all the sun hung in the sky pouring down life shining on the roots of the willows at the bottom of the stream lighting up the black head of the water rat as he hurried across to the opposite bank glorifying the rich green lake of the grass and giving to the whole an utterance of love and hope and joy which was to him who could read it a more certain and full revelation of god than any display of power in thunder in avalanche and stormy sea those with whom the feeling of religion is only occasional have at most when the awful or grand breaks out of the common the meek who inherit the earth find the god of the whole earth more evidently present i do not say more present for there is no measuring of his presence more evidently present in the commonest things that which is best he gives most plentifully as is reason with him hence the quiet fullness of ordinary nature hence the spirit to them that ask it i soon came within sound of the mill and presently crossing the stream that flowed back to the river after having done its work on the corn i came in front of the building and looked over the half-door into the mill the floor was clean and dusty a few full sacks tied tight in the mouth they always looked to me as if joseph's silver cup were just inside stood about in the farther corner the flour was trickling down out of two wooden spouts into a wooden receptacle below the whole place was full of its own faint but pleasant odor no man was visible 
the spouts went on pouring the slow torrent of flour as if everything could go on with perfect propriety of itself i could not even see how a man could get at the stones that heard grinding away above except he went up the rope that hung from the ceiling so i walked round the corner of the place and found myself in the company of the water-wheel mossy and green with ancient water-drops looking so furred and overgrown and lumpy the one might have thought the wood of it had taken to growing again in its old days and so the wheel was losing by slow degrees the shape of a wheel to become some new awful monster of a pollard as yet however it was going round slowly indeed and with the gravity of age but doing its work and casting its loose drops in the alms-giving of a gentle rain upon the little plot of master roger's garden which is therefore full of moisture-loving flowers this plot was divided from the mill-wheel by a small stream which carried away the surplus water and was now full and running rapidly beyond the stream beside the flower-bed stood a dusty young man talking to a young woman with a rosy face and clear honest eyes the moment they saw me they parted the young man came across the stream as a step and the young woman went up the garden towards the cottage that must be old roger's cottage i said to the miller yes sir he answered looking a little sheepish was that his daughter that nice-looking young woman you were talking to uh, yes sir it was and he stole a shy pleased look at me out of the corners of his eyes it's a good thing i said to have an honest experienced old mill like yours that can manage to go on of itself for a little while now and then this gave a great help to his budding confidence he laughed well sir it's not very often that's left to itself and jane isn't at her father's above once or twice a week at most she doesn't live with them then no sir you see they're both hardy and they ain't over well to do and jane lives up at the hall sir she's upper housemaid and waits on one of the young ladies old rogers has seen a great deal of the world sir so i imagine i am just going to see him good morning i jumped across the stream and went up a little gravel walk which led me in a few yards to the cottage door it was a sweet place to live in with honeysuckle growing over the house and the sounds of the softly laboring mill wheel ever in this little porch and about its windows the door was open and dame rogers came from within to meet me she welcomed me and led the way into her little kitchen as i entered jane went out the back door it was only to call her father who presently came in i'm glad to see you sir this pleasure comes of having no work to-day after harvest there comes slack times for the likes of me people don't care about a bag of old bones when they can get hold of young men well well never mind old woman the lord will take us through somehow when the wind blows the ship goes when the wind drops the ship stops but the sea is his all the same for he made it and the wind is his all the same too he spoke in the most matter-of-fact tone unaware of anything poetic in what he said to him it was just common sense and common sense only i am sorry you are out of work i said but my garden is sadly out of order and i must have something done to it you don't dislike gardening do you well i bean't a right good hand at garden work answered the old man with some embarrassment scratching his gray head with a troubled scratch there was more in this than meet the ear but what i could not conjecture i would press the point a little so i took him at his own word i won't ask you to do any of the more ornamental part i said only plain digging and hoeing i would rather be excused sir i am afraid i made you think oh i thought nothing sir i thank you kindly sir i assure you i want the work done and i must employ some one else if you don't undertake it well sir my back's bad now no sir i won't tell a story about it i would just rather not sir now his wife broke in now old rogers why won't you tell the parson the truth like a man don right if ye won't i do it for ye the fact is sir she went on turning to me with a plate in her hand which she was wiping the fact is that the old parson's man for that kind of work was simmons to other end of the village and my man is so afeard o a hurtin or another that he'll turn the bread away from his own mouth and let it fall in the dirt now now old oman don't it be lie me i'm not so bad as that you see sir i never was good at knowin' right from wrong like i never was good that is at tellin exactly what i ought to do so when anything comes up i just says to myself now old rogers what do you think the lord would best like you to do and as soon as i ax myself that i know directly what i've got to do and then my old woman can't turn me no more than a bull and she don't like my obstinate fits but you see i daren't sir once i axed myself that stick to that rogers i said 
"'Besides, sir,' he went on, "'Simmons wants it more than I do. "'He's got a sick wife, "'and my old woman, thank God, is hale and hearty. "'And there is another thing besides, sir. "'He might take it hurt of you, "'sir, and think it was turning away an old servant-like. "'And then, sir, he wouldn't be ready to hear what you had to tell him, "'and might, mayhap, lose a deal of comfort. "'And that I would take worst of all, sir. "'Well, well, Rogers, Simmons shall have the job.' "'Thank ye, sir,' said the old man. His wife, who could not see the thing quite from her husband's point of view, was too honest to say anything, but she was none the less cordial to me. The daughter stood looking from one to the other with attentive face, which took everything but revealed nothing. I rose to go. As I reached the door I remembered the tobacco in my pocket. I had not bought it for myself. I never could smoke. Nor do I conceive that smoking is essential to a clergyman in the country, though I have occasionally envied one of my brethren in London, who will sit down by the fire— and lighting his pipe, at the same time pleased his host and subdued the bad smells of the place. And I never could hit his way of talking to his parishioners either. He could put them at their ease in a moment. I think he must have got the trick out of his pipe. But in reality, I seldom think about how I ought to talk to anybody I am with. That I didn't smoke myself is no reason why I should not help old Rogers to smoke. So I put out the tobacco. You smoke, don't you, Rogers? I said. "'Well, sir, I can't deny it. "'It's not much I spend on Biquet, anyway. "'Is it, dame?' "'No, that it bean't answered his wife. "'You don't think there's any harm in smoking a pipe, sir?' "'Not the least,' I answered with emphasis. "'You see, sir,' he went on, "'not giving me time to prove how far I was from thinking there was any harm in it. "'You see, sir, sailors learn many ways they might be better without. "'I used to take me panagogue with the rest of them, "'but I gave that up quite, "'cause as how as I don't want to now. "'Cause as how,' interrupted his wife, "'you spend the money on tea for me instead, "'you wicked old man to tell stories. "'Well, I takes my share of the tea, old woman, "'and I'm sure it's a better deal for ye. "'But to tell the truth, sir, "'I was a little troubled in my mind about the bakay, "'not knowing whether I got to have it or not. "'For you see, the parson that's gone "'didn't more than half a like it, "'as I could tell by the turn of his hoss-holes "'when he came in at the door and me a-smokin. "'Not as he said anything,' "'for, you see, I was an old man, and I dare say they kept him quiet. "'But I did hear him blow up a young chap in the village "'he came upon promiscuous with a pipe in his mouth. "'He did give him a thundering broadside, to be sure. "'So I was in two minds whether I ought to go on with my pipe or not. "'And how did you settle the question, Rogers?' "'Why, I followed my own old chart, sir. "'Quite right. One mustn't mind too much what other people think. "'Well, that's not exactly what I mean, sir. Well, "'What do you mean, then? I should like to know.' "'Well, sir, I mean that I say to myself, "'Now, old Rogers, what do you think the Lord would say about this here bakay business?' "'And what did you think he would say?' "'Why, sir, I thought he would say, "'Old Rogers, have your bakay. "'Only mind you didn't grumble when you ain't got none.' "'Something in this, I could not at the time have told what, "'touched me more than I can express. "'No doubt it was a simple reality of the relation "'in which the old man stood to his father in heaven "'that made me feel as if the tears would come in spite of me.' And this is the man, I said to myself, whom I thought I should be able to teach. Well, the wisest learnt most, and I may be useful to him after all. As I said nothing, the old man resumed. For you see, sir, it is not always a body feels he has a right to spend his haypence on bakay, and sometimes, too, he ain't got none to spend. In the meantime, I said, here is some that I bought for you as I came along. I hope you will find it good. I am no judge." The old sailor's eyes glistened with gratitude. "'Well, who'd have thought it? You didn't think I was begging for it, sir, surely. You see, I had it for you in my pocket. "'Well, that is good of you, sir.' "'Why, Rogers, that'll last you a month,' exclaimed his wife, looking nearly as pleased as himself. Six weeks at least, wife,' he answered. "'And you don't smoke yourself, sir, and yet you bring a bakay to me. Well, it's just like your master, sir. I went away.' resolved that old Rogers should have no chance of grumbling for want of tobacco, if I could help it. Chapter 4 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald 
Chapter 4. The Coffin On the way back, my thoughts were still occupied with the woman I had seen in the little shop. The old man-of-war's man was probably the nobler being of the two, and if I had had to choose between them, I should no doubt have chosen him. But I had not to choose between them. I had only to think about them, and I thought a great deal more about the one I could not understand than the one I could understand. For old Rogers wanted little help from me, whereas the other was evidently a soul in pain, and therefore belonged to me in peculiar right of my office. While the readiest way in which I could justify to myself the possession of that office was to make it a shepherding of the sheep. So I resolved to find out what I could about her as one having a right to know, that I might see whether I could not help her. From herself it was evident that her secret, if she had one, was not to be easily gained but even the common reports of the village would be some enlightenment to the darkness I was in about her. As I went again through the village, I observed a narrow lane striking off to the left, and resolved to explore in that direction. It led up to one side of the large house of which I have already spoken. As I came near, I smelt what has been to me always a delightful smell, that of fresh deals under the hands of the carpenter. In the scent of those boards of pine is enclosed all the idea the tree could gather of the world of forest where it was reared. It speaks of many wild and bright, but chiefly clean and rather cold things. If I were idling, it would draw me to it across many fields. Turning a corner, I heard the sound of a saw. And this sound drew me yet more, for a carpenter's shop was the delight of my boyhood and after I began to read the history of our Lord with something of that sense of reality with which we read other histories, and which, I am sorry to think, so much of the well-meant instruction we receive in our youth tends to destroy, my feeling about such a workshop grew stronger and stronger, till at last I never could go near enough to see the shavings lying on the floor of one without a spiritual sensation such as I have in entering an old church which sensation, ever since having been admitted on the usual conditions to a Mohammedan mosque, urges me to pull off not only my hat, but my shoes likewise. And the feeling has grown upon me, till now it seems at times as if the only cure in the world for social pride would be to go for five silent minutes into a carpenter's shop. How one can think of himself as above his neighbors, within sight, sound, or smell of one, I fear I am getting almost unable to imagine, and one ought not to get out of sympathy with the wrong. Only as I am growing old now, it does not matter so much, for I dare say my time will not be very long. So I drew near to the shop, feeling as if the Lord might be at work there at one of the benches, and when I reached the door, there was my pale-faced hearer of the Sunday afternoon, sawing a board for a coffin lid. As my shadow fell across and darkened his work, he lifted his head and saw me. I could not altogether understand the expression of his countenance as he stood upright from his labor and touched his old hat with rather a proud than a courteous gesture. And I could not believe that he was glad to see me, although he laid down his saw and advanced to the door. It was the gentleman in him, not the man, that sought to make me welcome hardly caring whether I saw through the ceremony or not. True, there was a smile on his lips, but the smile of a man who cherishes a secret grudge, of one who does not altogether dislike you, but who has a claim upon you, say, for an apology, of which claim he doubts whether you know the existence. So the smile seemed tightened, and stopped just when it got halfway to its width, and was about to become hearty and begin to shine. "'May I come in?' I said. "'Come in, sir,' he answered. "'I am glad I have happened to come upon you by accident,' I said. He smiled as if he did not quite believe in the accident, and considered it a part of the play between us that I should pretend it. I hastened to add, "'I was wandering about the place, making some acquaintance with it and with my friends in it, when I came upon you quite unexpectedly. You know, I saw you in church on Sunday afternoon.' "'I know you saw me, sir,' he answered, with a motion as if to return to his work. 
but to tell the truth, I don't go to church very often. I did not quite know whether to take this as proceeding from an honest fear of being misunderstood, or from a sense of being in general superior to all that sort of thing, but I felt that it would be of no good to pursue the inquiry directly. I looked, therefore, for something to say. Ah, your work is not always a pleasant one, I said, associating the feelings of which I have already spoken with the facts before me, and looking at the coffin, the lower part of which stood nearly finished upon trestles on the floor. Well, there are unpleasant things in all trades, he answered, but it does not matter, he added, with an increase of bitterness in his smile. I didn't mean, I said, that the work was unpleasant, only sad. It must always be painful to make a coffin. A joiner gets used to it, sir, as you do to the funeral service. But for my part, I don't see why it should be considered so unhappy for a man to be buried. This isn't such a good job, after all, this world, sir, you must allow. Neither is that coffin, said I, as if by a sudden inspiration. The man seemed taken aback, as old Rogers might have said. He looked at the coffin, and then looked at me. "'Well, sir,' he said, after a short pause, which no doubt seemed longer both to him and to me than it would have seemed to any third person, "'I don't see anything amiss with the coffin. I don't say it'll last till doomsday, as the grave-digger says to Hamlet, because I don't know so much about doomsday as some people pretend to. But you see, sir, it's not finished yet.' "'Thank you,' I said. "'That's just what I meant.' You thought I was hasty in my judgment of your coffin, whereas I only said of it knowingly what you said of the world thoughtlessly. How do you know that the world is finished any more than your coffin? And how dare you then say that it is a bad job? The same respectfully scornful smile passed over his face, as much as to say, Ah, it's your trade to talk that way, so I must not be too hard upon you. At any rate, sir, he said, Whoever made it has taken long enough about it, a person would think, to finish anything he ever meant to finish. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, I said. That's supposing, he answered, that the Lord did make the world. For my part, I am half of a mind that the Lord didn't make it at all. I am very glad to hear you say so, I answered. Hereupon, I found that we had changed places a little. He looked up at me. The smile of superiority was no longer there, and a puzzling questioning which might indicate either, Who would have expected that from you? Or, What can he mean? Or, both at once, had taken its place. I, for my part, knew that on the scale of the man's judgment I had risen nearer to his own level. As he said nothing, however, and I was in danger of being misunderstood, I proceeded at once. Of course it seems to me better that you should not believe God had done a thing than that you should believe he had not done it well. Ah, I see, sir. Then you will allow there is some room for doubting whether he made the world at all. Yes, for I do not think an honest man, as you seem to be, would be able to doubt without any room whatever. That would be only for a fool. But it is just possible, as we are not perfectly good ourselves, you'll allow that, won't you? That I will, sir, God knows. Well, I say, as we're not quite good ourselves, it's just possible that things may be too good for us to do them the justice of believing in them. But there are things, you must allow, so plainly wrong. So much so, both in the world and in myself, that it would be to me torturing despair to believe that God did not make the world. For then, how would it ever be put right? Therefore, I preferred the theory that he has not done making it yet. But wouldn't you say, sir, that God might have managed it without so many slips in the making as your way would suppose? I should think myself a bad workman if I worked after that fashion. I do not believe that there are any slips. You know you are making a coffin, but are you sure you know what God is making of the world? That I can't tell, of course, nor anybody else. Then you can't say that what looks like a slip is really a slip, either in the design or in the workmanship. You do not know what end he has in view, and you may find some day that those slips were just the straight road to that very end. 
Ah, maybe. But you can't be sure of it, you see. Perhaps not in the way you mean, but sure enough, for all that, to try it upon life, to order my way by it, and so find that it works well. And I find that it explains everything that comes near it. You know that no engineer would be satisfied with his engine on paper, nor with any proof whatever, except seeing how it will go. He made no reply. It is a principle of mine never to push anything over the edge. When I am successful in any argument, my one dread is of humiliating my opponent. Indeed, I cannot bear it. It humiliates me, and if you want him to think about anything, you must leave him room, and not give him such associations with the question that the very idea of it will be painful and irritating to him. Let him have a hand in the convincing of himself. I have been surprised sometimes to see my own arguments come up fresh and green, when I thought the fowls of the air had devoured them up. When a man reasons for victory, and not for the truth in the other soul, he is sure of just one ally, the same that Faust had in fighting Gretchen's brother, that is, the devil. But God and good men are against him. So I never follow up a victory of that kind, for, as I said, the defeat of the intellect is not the object in fighting with the sword of the spirit, but the acceptance of the heart. In this case, therefore, I drew back. May I ask for whom you are making that coffin? For a sister of my own, sir. I'm sorry to hear that. There's no occasion. I can't say I'm sorry, though she was one of the best women I ever knew. Why are you not sorry, then? Life's a good thing in the main, you will allow. Yes, when it's endurable at all. But to have a brute of a husband coming home at any hour of the night or morning, drunk upon the money she had earned by hard work, was enough to take more of the shine out of things than church going on Sundays could put in again, regular as she was, poor woman. I'm as glad as her brute of a husband that she's out of his way at last. How do you know he's glad of it? He's been drunk every night since she died. Then he's the worse for losing her. He may well be, crying like a hypocrite, too, over his own work. A fool he must be. A hypocrite? Perhaps not. A hypocrite is a terrible name to give. Perhaps her death will do him good. He doesn't deserve to be done any good to. I would have made this coffin for him with a world of pleasure. I never found that I deserved anything, not even a coffin. The only claim that I could ever lay to anything was that I was very much in want of it. The old smile returned, as much as to say, That's your little game in the church. But I resolved to try nothing more with him at present, and indeed was sorry that I had started the new question at all, partly because thus I had again given him occasion to feel that he knew better than I did which was not good either for him or for me in our relation to each other. This has been a fine old room once, I said, looking round the workshop. You can see it wasn't a workshop always, sir. Many a grand dinner party has sat down in this room when it was in its glory. Look at the chimney-piece there. I have been looking at it, I said, going nearer. It represents the four quarters of the world, you see. I saw strange figures of men and women, one on a kneeling camel, one on a crawling crocodile, and others differently mounted, with various besides of nature's bizarre productions creeping and flying in stone carving over the huge fireplace, in which, in place of a fire, stood several new and therefore brilliantly red cart-wheels. The sun shone through the upper part of a high window, of which many of the panes were broken, right in upon the cart-wheels which, glowing thus in the chimney under the sombre chimney-piece, added to the grotesque look of the whole assemblage of contrasts. The coffin and the carpenter stood in the twilight, occasioned by the sharp division of light made by a lofty wing of the house that rose flanking the other window. The room was still wainscoted in panels, which, I presume, for the sake of the more light required for handicraft, had been washed all over with white. At the level of labor they were broken in many places. Somehow or other the whole reminded me of Albert Durer's Melancholia. Seeing I was interested in looking about his shop, my new friend, for I could not help feeling that we should be friends before all was over, 
and so began to count him one already, resumed the conversation. He had never taken up the dropped thread of it before. Yes, sir, he said. The owners of the place little thought it would come to this, the deals growing into a coffin there on the spot where the grand dinner was laid for them and their guests. But there is another thing about it that is odder still. My son is the last male. Here he stopped suddenly, and his face grew very red, as suddenly he resumed. I'm not a gentleman, sir, but I will tell the truth. Curse it. I beg your pardon, sir. And here the old smile. I don't think I got that from their side of the house. My son's not the last male descendant. Here followed another pause. As to the imprecation, I knew better than to take any notice of a mere expression of excitement under a sense of some injury with which I was not yet acquainted. If I could get his feelings right in regard to other and more important things, a reform in that matter would soon follow. Whereas to make a mountain of a molehill would be to put that very mountain between him and me. Nor would I ask him any questions, lest I should just happen to ask him the wrong one for this parishioner of mine evidently wanted careful handling if I would do him any good. And it will not do any man good to fling even the Bible in his face. Nay, a roll of banknotes, which would be more evidently a good to most men, would carry insult with it if presented in that manner. You cannot expect people to accept before they have had a chance of seeing what the offered gift really is. After a pause, therefore, the carpenter had once more to recommence, or let the conversation lie. I stood in a waiting attitude, and while I looked at him, I was reminded of someone else whom I knew, with whom, too, I had pleasant associations, though I could not in the least determine who that one might be. "'It's very foolish of me to talk so to a stranger,' he resumed. "'It is very kind and friendly of you,' I said, still careful to make no advances." And you yourself belong to the old family that once lived in this old house? It would be no boast to tell the truth, sir, even if it were a credit to me, which it is not. That family has been nothing but a curse to ours. I noted that he spoke of that family as different from his, and yet implied that he belonged to it. The explanation would come in time. But the man was again silent, planing away at half the lid of his sister's coffin and I could not help thinking that the closed mouth meant to utter nothing more on this occasion. I am sure there must be many a story to tell about this old place, if only there were any one to tell them, I said at last, looking round the room once more. I think I see the remains of paintings on the ceiling. You are sharp-eyed, sir. My father says they were plain enough in his young days. Is your father alive, then? That he is, sir and hardy, too, though he seldom goes out of doors now. Will you go upstairs and see him? He's past ninety, sir. He has plenty of stories to tell about the old place, before it began to fall to pieces like. I won't go today, I said, partly because I wanted to be at home to receive anyone who might call, and partly to secure an excuse for calling again upon the carpenter, sooner than I should otherwise have liked to do. I expect visitors myself, and it is time I were at home. Good morning. Good morning, sir. And away home I went, with a new wonder in my brain. The man did not seem unknown to me. I mean, the state of his mind woke no feeling of perplexity in me. I was certain of understanding it thoroughly when I had learned something of his history, for that such a man must have a history of his own was rendered only the more probable from the fact that he knew something of the history of his forefathers, though indeed there are some men who seem to have no other. It was strange, however, to think of that man working away at a trade in the very house in which such ancestors had eaten and drunk, and married and given in marriage. The house and family had declined together, in outward appearance at least, for it was quite possible both might have risen in the moral and spiritual scale in proportion as they sank in the social one and if any of my readers are at first inclined to think that this could hardly be, seeing that the man was little, if anything, better than an infidel, I would just like to hold one minute's conversation with them on that subject. A man may be on the way to the truth just in virtue of his doubting. 
I will tell you what Lord Bacon says, and of all writers of English I delight in him. So it is in contemplation, if a man will begin with certainties, he shall end in doubts, but if he will be content to begin with doubts, he shall end in certainties. Now I could not tell the kind or character of this man's doubt, but it was evidently real and not affected doubt, and that was much in his favor. And I could see that he was a thinking man, just one of the sort I thought I should get on with in time, because he was honest, notwithstanding that unpleasant smile of his, which did irritate me a little, and partly piqued me into the determination to get the better of the man, if I possibly could, by making friends with him. Chapter 5 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Blanchard. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter 5 Visitors from the Hall. When I came near my own gate, I saw that it was open, and when I came in sight of my own door, I found a carriage standing before it, and a footman ringing the bell. It was an old-fashioned carriage, with two white horses in it, yet witted by age than by nature. They looked as if no coachman could get more than three miles an hour out of them. They were so fat and knuckle-kneed. But my attention could not rest long on the horses and I reached the door just as my housekeeper was pronouncing me absent. There were two ladies in the carriage, one old and one young. Ah, here is Mr. Walton, said the old lady, in a serene voice, with a clear hardness in its tone. And I held out my hand to aid her descent. She had pulled off her glove to get a card out of her card case, and so put the tips of two old fingers, worn very smooth, as if polished, with feeling what things were like upon the palm of my hand. I then offered my hand to her companion, a girl apparently about fourteen, who took a hearty hold of it and jumped down beside her with a smile. As I followed them into the house, I took their card from the housekeeper's hand and read Mrs. Oldcastle and Miss Gladwin. I confess here to my reader that these are not really the names I read on the card. I made these up this minute, but the names of persons of humble position in my story are their real names, and my reason for making the difference will be plain enough. You can never find out my friend Old Rogers. You might find out the people who called on me in their carriage with their ancient white horses. When they were seated in the drawing-room, I said to the old lady, I remember seeing you in church on Sunday morning. It is very kind of you to call so soon. You will always see me in church, she returned, with a stiff bow, and an expansion of deadness on her face, which I interpreted into an assertion of dignity, resulting from the implied possibility that I might have passed her over in my congregation, or might have forgotten her after not passing her over. Except when you have a headache, Granny, said Miss Gladwin, with an arch look, first at her grandmother, and then at me. Granny has bad headaches sometimes. The deadness melted away a little from Mrs. Oldcastle's face, as she turned with half a smile to her grandchild, and said, Yes, pet, but you know that cannot be an interesting fact to Mr. Walton. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Oldcastle, I said. A clergyman ought to know something, and the more the better, of the troubles of his flock. Sympathy is one of the first demands he ought to be able to meet. I know what a headache is. The former expression, or rather non-expression, returned, this time unaccompanied by a bow. I trust, Mr. Walton, I trust I am above my morbid necessity for sympathy. But, as you say, amongst the poor of your flock, it is very desirable that a clergyman should be able to sympathize. It's quite true what Granny says, Mr. Walton, though you mightn't think it. When she has a headache, 
She shuts herself up in her own room and doesn't let anyone come near her. Nobody but Sarah. And how she can prefer her to me, I'm sure I don't know. And here the girl pretended to pout, but with a sparkle in her bright grey eye. The subject is not interesting to me, pet. Pray, Mr. Walton, is it a point of conscience with you to wear the surplice when you preach? Not in the least, I answered. I think I like it rather better on the whole, but that's not why I wear it. Never mind, Granny. Mr. Walton, I think the surplice is lovely. I'm sure it's much like the way we shall be dressed in heaven, though I don't think I shall ever get there. If I must read the good books Granny reads, I don't know that it is necessary to read any good books, but the good book, I said. There, Granny, exclaimed Miss Gladwin triumphantly. I'm so glad... I've got Mr. Walton on my side. Mr. Walton is not so old as I am, my dear, and has much to learn yet. I could not help feeling a little annoyed, which was very foolish, I know, and saying to myself, if it is to make me like you, I had rather not learn any more. But I said nothing aloud, of course. Have you got a headache today, Granny? No, pet, be quiet. I wish to ask Mr. Walton why he wears the surplice. Simply, I replied, because I was told the people had been accustomed to it under my predecessor. But that can be no good reason for doing what is not right, that people have been accustomed to it. But I don't allow that it's not right. I think it's a matter of no consequence whatsoever. If I find that the people don't like it, I will give it up with pleasure. You ought to have principles of your own, Mr. Walton. I hope I have, and one of them is not to make mountains out of molehills. For a molehill is not a mountain. A man ought to have much to do in obeying his conscience and keeping his soul's garments clean, to mind whether he wears black or white when telling his flock that God loves them and that they will never be happy till they believe it. They may believe that too soon. I don't think anyone can believe the truth too soon. A pause followed during which it became evident to me that Miss Gladwin saw fun in the whole affair, and was enjoying it thoroughly. Mrs. Oldcastle's face, on the contrary, was illegible. She resumed in a measured, still voice, which she meant to be meek, I dare say, but which was really authoritative. I'm sorry, Mr. Walton, that your principles are so loose and unsettled. You will see my honesty in saying so, when you find that, objecting to the surplus, as I do, on Protestant grounds, I yet warn you against making any changes because you may discover that your parishioners are against it. You have no idea, Mr. Walton, what inroads radicalism, as they call it, has been making in this neighbourhood. It is quite dreadful. Everybody, down to the poorest, claiming a right to think for himself and set his betters right. There's one worse than any of the rest. But he's no better than an atheist, a carpenter of the name of Weir always talking to his neighbours against the proprietors and the magistrates, and the clergy too, Mr. Walton, and the game laws, and what not. And if you once show them that you are afraid of them, by going a step out of your way for their opinions about anything, there will be no end to it. For the beginning of strife is like the letting out of water, as you know. I should know nothing about it, but that, my daughter's maid, I came to hear of it through her, a decent girl of the name of Rogers, and born of decent parents, but unfortunately attached to the son of one of your church wardens, who has put him into the mill on the river you can almost see from here. Who put him in the mill? His own father, to whom it belongs. Well, it seems to me a very good match for her. Yes, indeed, and for him too, but his foolish father thinks the match below him. As if there was a difference between the position of people in that rank of life. Everyone seems striving to tread on the heels of everyone else, instead of being content with the station to which God has called them. I am content with mine. I had nothing to do with putting myself there. Why should they not be content with theirs? They need to be taught Christian humility and respect for their superiors. That's the virtue most wanted at present. The poor have to look up to the rich. That's right, Granny. And the rich have to look down on the poor. No, my dear, I did not say that. The rich have to be kind to the poor. But, Granny, why did you marry Mr. Oldcastle? 
What does that child mean? Uncle Stoddard says you refused ever so many offers when you were a girl. Uncle Stoddard has no business to be talking about such things to a chit like you, returned the grandmother smiling. However, at the charge, which so far certainly contained no reproach. And Grandpapa was the ugliest and the richest of them all, wasn't he, Granny? And Colonel Markham the handsomest and the poorest? A flush of anger crimsoned the old lady's pale face. It looked dead no longer. Hold your tongue, she said. You are rude. And Miss Gladwin did hold her tongue, but nothing else, for she was laughing all over. The relation between these two was evidently a very odd one. It was clear that Miss Gladwin was a spoiled child, though I could not help thinking her very nicely spoiled. As far as I saw, and that the old lady was persistent in regarding her as a cub, although her claws had grown quite long enough to be dangerous. Certainly, if things went on thus, it was pretty clear which of them would soon have the upper hand, for Granny was vulnerable and Pet was not. It really began to look as if there were none but characters in my parish. I began to think it must be the strangest parish in England, and to wonder that I had never heard of it before. Surely it must have been in some storybook at least, I said to myself. But her granddaughter's tiger-cat play drove the old lady nearer to me. She rose and held out her hand, saying, with some kindness, Take my advice, my dear Mr. Walton, and don't make too much of your poor, or they'll soon be too much for you to manage. Come, pet, it's time to go home to lunch, and for the surplus, take your own way and wear it. I shan't say anything more about it. I will do what I can see to be right in the matter. I answered as gently as I could, for I did not want to quarrel with her, although I thought her both presumptuous and rude. I'm on your side, Mr. Walton, said the girl, with a sweet comical smile, as she squeezed my hand once more. I led them to the carriage, and it was with a feeling of relief that I saw it drive off. The old lady certainly was not pleasant. She had a white smooth face, over which the skin was drawn tight, grey hair, and rather lurid hazel eyes. I felt a repugnance to her that was hardly to be accounted for her by her arrogance to me, or by her superciliousness to the poor, although either would have accounted for much of it, for I confess that I have not yet learnt to bear presumption and rudeness with all the patience and the forgiveness with which I ought by this time to be able to meet them. And as to the poor, I am afraid I was always in some danger of being a partisan of theirs against the rich, and that a clergyman ought never to be. And indeed the poor rich have more need of the care of the clergyman than the others, seeing it is hardly the rich shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, and the poor have all the advantage over them in that respect. Still, I said to myself, there must be some good in the woman. She cannot be altogether so hard as she looks. Else, how should that child dare to take liberties of a kitten with her? She doesn't look to me like one to make game of. However, I shall know a little more about her when I return her call, and I will do my best to keep on good terms with her. I took down a volume of Plato to comfort me after the irritation which my nerves had undergone, and sat down in the easy chair beside the open window of my study and with Plato in my hand, and all that outside my window, I began to feel as if, after all, a man might be happy, even if a lady had refused him. And there I sat, without opening my favourite vellum-bound volume, gazing out on the happy world, whence a gentle wind came in, as if it bid me welcome with a kiss to all it had to give me. And then I thought of the wind that bloweth where it listeth, which is everywhere, and I quite forgot to open my Plato, and thanked God for the life of life, whose story and whose words are in the best of books, and who explains everything to us, and makes us love Socrates and David and all good men ten times more, and who follows no law but the law of love, and no fashion but the will of God. For where did ever one read words less like moralizing and more like simple earnestness of truth than all those of Jesus? And I prayed my God that he 
would make me able to speak good common heavenly sense to my people, and forgive me for feeling so cross and proud towards the unhappy old lady, for I was sure she was not happy, and make me into a rock which swallowed up the waves of wrong in its great caverns, and never threw them back to swell the commotion of the angry sea whence they came. Ah, what it would be actually to annihilate wrong in this way, to be able to say, it shall not be wrong against me, so utterly do I forgive it. How much sooner then would the wrongdoers repent, and get rid of the wrong from his side also. But the painful fact will show itself, not less curious than painful, that it is more difficult to forgive small wrongs than great ones. Perhaps, however, the forgiveness of the great wrongs is not so true as it seems, for do we not think it is a fine thing to forgive such wrongs, and so do it, rather for our own sakes than for the sake of the wrongdoer? It is dreadful not to be good, and to have bad ways inside one. Such thoughts passed through my mind, and once more the great light went up on me with regard to my office, namely, that just because I was parson to the parish, I must not be the person to myself, and I prayed God to keep me from feeling stung and proud. However, any one might behave to me, for all my value lay in being a sacrifice to him and the people. So when Mrs. Pearson knocked at the door, and told me that a lady and gentleman had called, I shut my book, which I had just opened, and kept down as well as I could the rising grumble of the inhospitable Englishman, who is apt to be forgetful to entertain strangers, at least in the power of his heart. And I cannot count in perfect hospitality to be friendly and plentiful towards those whom you have invited to your house. What thank has a man in that? while you are cold and forbidding to those who have not had that claim on your attention that is not to be perfect as our father in heaven is perfect by all means tell people when you are busy about something that must be done that you cannot spare the time for them except they want you upon something of yet more pressing necessity but tell them and do not get rid of them by the use of the instrument commonly called the cold shoulder it is a wicked instrument that and ought to have fallen out of use by this time. I went and received Mr. and Miss Balderstone, and was at least thus far rewarded, that the eerie feeling, as the Scotch would call it, which I had about my parish, as containing none but characters, and therefore not being canny, was entirely removed. At least there was a wholesome leaven in it of honest stupidity. Please, kind reader, do not fancy I am sneering. I declare to you, I think a snare the worst thing God has not made. A curse is nothing in wickedness to it, it seems to me. I do mean that honest stupidity I respect heartily, and do assert my conviction that I do not know how England, at least, would get on without it. But I do not mean the stupidity that sets up for teaching itself to its neighbour, thinking itself wisdom all the time. That I do not respect. Mr. and Miss Balderstone left me a little fatigued, but in no way sore or grumbling. They only sent me back with an additional zest for my Plato, of which I enjoyed a heartly page or two before any one else arrived. The only other visitors I had that day were an old surgeon in the Navy, who since his retirement had practiced for many years in the neighborhood, and was still at the call of any one who did not think him too old-fashioned, for even here the fashions, though decidedly elderly young ladies, by the time they arrived, held their sway none the less imperiously, and Mr. Brownrigg, the church warden, more of Dr. Duncan, by and by. Except Mr. and Miss Balderstone, I had not yet seen any common people. They were all decidedly uncommon, and, as regarded most of them, I could not think I should have any difficulty in preaching to them. For, whatever place a man may give to preaching in the ritual of the church, indeed, it does not probably belong to the ritual at all. It is yet the part of the so-called service with which his personality has most to do. To the influences of the other parts, he has to submit himself, ever turning the openings of his soul towards them. 
that he may not be a mere praying machine. But with the sermon it is otherwise, that he produces, for that he is responsible. And therefore I say it was a great comfort to me to find myself among a people from which my spirit neither shrunk in the act of preaching, nor with regards to which it was likely to feel that it was beating itself against a stone wall. There was some good in preaching to a man like Weir or Old Rogers. Whether there was any good in preaching to a woman like Mrs. Oldcastle, I did not know. The evening I thought I might give to my book, and thus end my first Monday in my parish. But, as I said, Mr. Brownrigg, the church warden, called and stayed a whole weary hour, talking about matters quite uninteresting to any who may hereafter pursue what I am now writing. Really, he was not an interesting man, short, broad, stout, red-faced, with an immense amount of mental inertia, discharging itself in constant lingual activities about little nothings. Indeed, when there was no new nothings to be had, the old nothing would do over again to make a fresh fuss about. But if you attempted to convey a thought into his mind, which involved the moving round half a degree from where he stood, and looked at the matter from a point even so far new, you found him utterly, totally impenetrable, as pachydermatous as any rhinoceros or behemoth. One other corporeal fact I could not help observing was that his cheeks rose at once from the collar of his green coat, his neck being invisible from the hollow between it, and the jaw being filled up to a level. The confirmation was just what he himself delighted to contemplate in his pigs, to which his resemblance was greatly increased by unwearied endeavours to keep himself close-shaved. I could not help feeling anxious about his son and Jane Rogers. He gave a quantity of gossip about various people, evidently anxious that I should regard them as he regarded them. But in all he said concerning them, I could scarcely detect one point of significance as to character or history. I was very glad indeed when the waddling of hands, for it was the perfect imbecility of handshaking, was over, and he was safely out of the gate. He had kept me standing on the steps for full five minutes, and I did not feel safe from him till I was once more in my study with the door shut. I am not going to try my reader's patience with anything of a more detailed account of my introduction to my various parishioners. I shall mention them only as they come up in the course of my story. Before many days had passed, I had found out my poor, who I thought must be somewhere, seeing the Lord had said we should have them with us always. There was a workhouse in the village, but there was not a great many in it, for the poor were kindly enough handled who belonged to the place, and were not too severely compelled to go into the house, though, I believe, in the house they would have been more comfortable than they were in their own houses. I cannot imagine a much greater misfortune for a man, not to say a clergyman, than not to know, or knowing, not to minister to any of the poor. And I did not feel that I knew at least where I was until I found out and conversed with almost the whole of mine. After I had done so, I began to think it better to return Mrs. Oldcastle's visit, though I felt greatly disinclined to encounter that tight-skinned nose again, and that mouth whose smile Chapter Six of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter Six. Old Castle Hall. About noon on a lovely autumn day, I set out for Old Castle Hall. The keenness of the air had melted away with the heat of the sun, yet still the air was fresh and invigorating. Can anyone tell me why it is that when the earth is renewing her youth in the spring, man should feel feeble and low-spirited, and gaze with bowed head, though pleased heart, 
on the crocuses whereas on the contrary in the autumn when nature is dying for the winter he feels strong and hopeful holds his head erect and walks with a vigorous step though the flaunting dahlias discourage him greatly i do not ask for the physical causes those i might be able to find out for myself but i ask where is the rightness and fitness in the thing should not man and nature go together in this world which was made for man not for science but for man perhaps i have some glimmerings of where the answer lies perhaps i see a cherub that sees it and in many of our questions we have to be content with such an approximation to an answer as this and for my part i am content with this with less i am not content whatever that answer may be i walked over the old gothic bridge with a heart strong enough to meet mrs oldcastle without flinching i might have to quarrel with her i could not tell she certainly was neither safe nor wholesome but this i was sure of that i would not quarrel with her without being quite certain that i ought i wish it were never one's duty to quarrel with anybody i do so hate it but not to do it sometimes is to smile in the devil's face and that no one ought to do however i had not to quarrel this time the woods on the other side of the river from my house towards which i was now walking were of the most sombre rich colour sombre and rich like a life that has laid up treasure in heaven locked in a casket of sorrow i came nearer and nearer to them through the village and approached the great iron gate with the antediluvian monsters on the top of its stone pillars and awful monsters they were are still i see the tail of one of them at this very moment but they let me through very quietly notwithstanding their evil looks i thought they were saying to each other across the top of the gate never mind he'll catch it soon enough but as i said i did not catch it that day and i could not have caught it that day it was too lovely a day to catch any hurt even from the most hurtful of all beings under the sun an unwomanly woman i wandered up the long winding road through the woods which i had remarked flanking the meadow on my first walk up the river these woods smelt so sweetly their dead and dying leaves departing in sweet odours that they quite made up for the absence of their flowers and the wind no there was no wind there was only a memory of wind that woke now and then in the bosom of the wood shook down a few leaves like the thoughts that flutter away in sighs and then was still again i am getting old as i told you my friends see there you see my friends already do not despise an old man because he cannot help loving people he never saw or even heard of i say i am getting old is it but or therefore i do not know which but therefore i shall never forget that one autumn day in those grandly fading woods up the slope of the hillside they rose like one great rainbow below of foliage bright yellow red rusty and bright fading green all kinds and shades of browns and purples multitudes of leaves lay on the sides of the path so many that i betook myself to my old childish amusement of walking in them without lifting my feet driving whole armies of them with ocean-like rustling before me i did not do so as i came back i walked in the middle of the way then and i remember stepping over many single leaves in a kind of mechanico merciful way as if they had been living creatures as indeed who can tell but they are only they must be pretty nearly dead when they are on the ground at length the road brought me up to a house it did not look such a large house as i have since found it to be and it certainly was not an interesting house from the outside though its surroundings of green grass and trees would make any whole beautiful indeed the house itself tried to look ugly not quite succeeding only because of the kind foiling of its efforts by the virginia creepers and ivy which as if ashamed of its staring countenance did all they could to spread their hands over it and hide it 
but there was one charming group of old chimneys belonging to some portion behind which indicated a very different namely a very much older face upon the house once a face that had passed away to give place to this once inside i found there were more remains of the olden time than i had expected i was led up one of those grand square oak staircases which look like a portion of the house to be dwelt in and not like a ladder from getting one part of the habitable regions to another on the top was a fine expanse of landing another hall in fact from which i was led towards the back of the house by a narrow passage and shown into a small dark drawing-room of a deep stone mullioned window wainscoted in oak simply carved and panelled several doors around indicated communication with other parts of the house here i found mrs oldcastle reading what i judged to be one of the cheap and gaudy religious books of the present day she rose and received me and having motioned me to a seat began to talk about the parish you would have perceived at once from her tone that she recognized no other bond of connection between us but the parish i hear you have been most kind in visiting the poor mr walton you must take care that they don't take advantage of your kindness though i assure you you will find some of them very grasping indeed and you need not expect that they will give you the least credit for good intentions i have seen nothing yet to make me uneasy on that score but certainly my testimony is of no weight yet mine is i have proved them the poor of this neighbourhood are very deficient in gratitude yes granny i started but there was no interruption such as i had made to indicate my surprise although when i looked half round in the direction whence the voice came the words that followed were all rippled with a sweet laugh of amusement yes granny you are right you remember how old dame hope wouldn't take the money you offered her and dropped such a disdainful courtesy it was so greedy of her wasn't it i am sorry to hear of any disdainful reception of kindness i said yes and she had the coolness within a fortnight to send up to me and ask if i would be kind enough to lend her half a crown for a few weeks and then it was your turn granny you sent her five shillings didn't you oh no i'm wrong that was the other woman indeed i did not send her anything but a rebuke i told her that it would be a very wrong thing in me to contribute to the support of such an evil spirit of unthankfulness as she indulged in when she came to see her conduct in its true light and confess that she had behaved very abominably i would see what i could do for her and meantime she was served out wasn't she with her sick boy at home and nothing to give him said miss gladwin she made her own bed and had to lie on it don't you think a little kindness might have had more effect in bringing her to see that she was wrong granny doesn't believe in kindness except to me dear old granny she spoils me i'm sure i shall be ungrateful some day and then she'll begin to read me long lectures and prick me with all manner of headless pins but i won't stand it i can tell you granny i'm too much spoiled for that mrs oldcastle was silent why i could not tell except it was that she knew she had no chance of quieting the girl in any other way i may mention here lest i should have no opportunity afterwards that i inquired of dame hope as to her version of the story and found that there had been a great misunderstanding as i had suspected she was really in no want at the time and did not feel that it would be quite honourable to take the money when she did not need it some poor people are capable of such reasoning and so she had refused it not without a feeling at the same time that it was more pleasant to refuse than to accept from such a giver some stray sparkle of which feeling discovered by the keen eye of miss gladwin may have given that appearance of disdain to her courtesy to which the girl alluded when however her boy in service was brought home ill she had sent to ask for what she now required on the very ground that it had been offered to her before the misunderstanding had arisen from the total incapacity of mrs oldcastle 
to enter sympathetically into the feelings of one as superior to herself in character as she was inferior in worldly condition but to return to old castle hall i wish to change the subject knowing that blind defence is of no use one must have definite points for defence if one has not a thorough understanding of the character in question and i had neither this is a beautiful old house i said there must be strange places about it mrs oldcastle had not time to reply or at least did not reply before miss gladwin said oh mr walton have you looked out of the window yet you don't know what a lovely place this is if you haven't and as she spoke she emerged from a recess in the room a kind of dark alcove where she had been amusing herself with what i took to be some sort of puzzle but which I found afterwards to be a bit and curb chain of her pony's bridle, which she was polishing up to her own bright mind, because the stable boy had not pleased her in the matter, and she wanted both to get them brilliant, and to shame the lad for the future. I followed her to the window, where I was indeed as much surprised and pleased as she could have wished. There, she said, holding back one of the dingy, heavy curtains with her small, childish hand, and there indeed i saw an astonishment it did not lie in the lovely sweeps of hill and hollow stretching away to the horizon richly wooded and though i saw none of them sprinkled certainly with sweet villages full of human thoughts loves and hopes the astonishment did not lie in this though all this was really much more beautiful to the higher imagination but in the fact that at the first glance I had a vision properly belonging to a rugged or mountainous country For I had approached the house by a gentle slope which certainly was long and winding But had occasioned no feeling in my mind that I had reached any considerable height and I had come up that one beautiful staircase no more and yet now when I looked from this window I found myself on the edge of a precipice not a very deep one certainly yet with all the effect of many a deeper for below the house on this side lay a great hollow with steep sides up which as far as they could reach the trees were climbing the sides were not all so steep as the one on which the house stood but they were all rocky and steep and here and there slopes of green grass and down in the bottom in the centre of the hollow lay a pool of water I knew it only by its slaty shimmer through the fading green of the treetops between me and it There again exclaimed miss Gladwin isn't that beautiful, but you haven't seen the most beautiful thing yet Granny where's ah there she is there's auntie don't you see her down there by the side of the pond that pond is a hundred feet deep if auntie were to fall in she would be drowned before you could jump down and get her out can you swim before i had time to answer she was off again don't you see auntie down there no i don't see her i have been trying very hard but i can't well i dare say you can't nobody i think has got eyes but myself do you see a big stone by the edge of the pond with other stones on the top of it like a big potato with a little one grown out of it no well auntie is under the trees on the opposite side from that stone do you see her yet no then you must come down with me and i will introduce you to her she's much the prettiest thing here much prettier than granny here she looked over her shoulder at granny who instead of being angry as from what i had seen on our former interview i feared she would be only said without even looking up from the little blue bordy book she was again reading you are a saucy child whereupon miss gladwin laughed merrily come along she said and seizing me by the hand led me out of the room down a back staircase across a piece of grass and then down a stair in the face of the rock towards the pond below the stair went in zigzags and although rough was protected by an iron balustrade without which indeed it would have been very dangerous isn't your grandmamma afraid to let you run up and down here miss gladwin i said me she exclaimed apparently in the utmost surprise that would be fun 
for you know if she tried to hinder me but she knows it's no use i taught her that long ago let me see how long oh i don't know i should think it must be ten years at least i ran away and they thought i had drowned myself in the pond and i saw them all the time poking with a long stick in the pond which if i had been drowned there never could have brought me up for it is a hundred feet deep i am sure how i hurt my sides trying to keep from screaming with laughter i fancied i heard one say to the other we must wait till she swells and floats dear me what a peculiar child i said to myself and yet somehow whatever she said even when she was most rude to her grandmother she was never offensive no one could have helped feeling all the time that she was a little lady i thought i would venture a question with her i stood still at a turn of the zigzag and looked down into the hollow still a good way below us where i could now distinguish the form on the opposite side of the pond of a woman seated at the foot of a tree and stooping forward over a book may i ask you a question miss gladwin yes twenty if you like but i won't answer one of them till you give up calling me miss gladwin we can't be friends you know so long as you do that what am i to call you then i never heard you called by any other name than pet and that would hardly do would it oh just fancy if you call me pet before granny that's granny's name for me and nobody dares to use it but granny not even auntie for between you and me auntie is afraid of granny i can't think why i was never afraid of anybody except yes a little afraid of old sarah she used to be my nurse you know and grandmamma and everybody is afraid of her and that's just why i never do one thing she wants me to do it would never do to give in to being afraid of her you know there's auntie you see down there just where i told you before oh yes i see her now what does your aunt call you then why what you must call me my own name of course what is that judy she said it in a tone which seemed to indicate surprise that i should not know her name perhaps read it off her face as one ought to know a flower's name by looking at it but she added instantly glancing up in my face most comically i wish yours was punch why judy it would be such fun you know well it would be odd i must confess what is your aunt's name oh such a funny name much funnier than judy ethelwyn it sounds as if it ought to mean something doesn't it yes it is an anglo-saxon word without doubt what does it mean i'm not sure about that i will try and find out when i go home if you would like to know yes that i should i should like to know everything about auntie ethelwyn isn't it pretty so pretty that i should like to know something more about aunt ethelwyn what is her other name why ethelwyn oldcastle to be sure what else could it be why you know for anything i knew judy it might have been gladwin she might have been your father's sister might she i never thought of that oh i suppose that is because i never think about my father and now i do think of it i wonder why nobody ever mentions him to me or my mother either but i often think auntie must be thinking about my mother something in her eyes when they are sadder than usual seems to remind me of my mother you remember your mother then no i don't think i ever saw her but i've answered plenty of questions haven't i i assure you if you want to get me on to the catechism i don't know a word of it come along i laughed what she said pulling me by the hand you a clergyman and laugh at the catechism i didn't know that i am not laughing at the catechism judy i am only laughing at the idea of putting catechism questions to you you know i didn't mean it she said with some indignation i know now i answered but you haven't let me put the only question i wanted to put what is it how old are you twelve come along and away we went down the rest of the stair
when we reached the bottom a winding path led us through the trees to the side of the pond along which we passed to get to the other side and then all at once the thought struck me why was it that i had never seen this auntie with the lovely name at church was she going to turn out another strange parishioner there she sat intent on her book as we drew near she looked up and rose but did not come forward aunt winnie here's mr walton said judy i lifted my hat and held out my hand before our hands met however a tremendous splash reached my ear from the pond i started round judy had vanished i had my coat half off and was rushing to the pool when miss oldcastle stopped me her face unmoved except by a smile saying it's only one of that frolicsome child's tricks mr walton it is well for you that i was here though nothing would have delighted her more than to have you in the water too but i said bewildered and not half comprehending where is she there returned miss oldcastle pointing to the pool in the middle of which arose a heaving and bubbling presently yielding passage to the laughing face of judy why don't you help me out mr walton you said you could swim no i did not i answered coolly you talked so fast you did not give me time to say so it's very cold she returned come out judy dear said her aunt run home and change your clothes there's a dear judy swam to the opposite side scrambled out and was off like a spaniel through the trees and up the stairs dripping and raining as she went you must be very astonished at the little creature mr walton i find her quite interesting quite a study there never was a child so spoiled and never a child on whom it took less effect to hurt her i suppose such things do happen sometimes she is really a good girl though mamma who has done all the spoiling will not allow me to say she is good here followed a pause for judy disposed of what should i say next and the moment her mind turned from judy i saw a certain stillness not a cloud but a shadow of a cloud come over miss oldcastle's face as if she too found herself uncomfortable and did not know what to say next she tried to get a glance at the book in her hand for i should know something about her at once if i could only see what she was reading she never came to church and i wanted to arrive at some notion of the source of her spiritual life for that she had such a single glance at her face was enough to convince me this i mean made me even anxious to see what the book was but i could only discover that it was an old book in very shabby binding not in the least like the books that young ladies generally have in their hands and now my readers will possibly be thinking it odd that i have never yet said a word about what either judy or miss oldcastle was like if there is one thing i feel more inadequate to than another in taking upon me to relate it is to describe a lady but i will try the girl first judy was rosy gray-eyed auburn-haired sweet-mouthed she had confidence in her chin assertion in her nose defiance in her eyebrows honesty and friendliness all over her face no one evidently could have a warmer friend and to an enemy she would be dangerous no longer than a fit of passion might last there was nothing acrid in her and the reason i presume was that she had never yet hurt her conscience that is a very different thing from saying she had never done wrong you know she was not tall even for her age and just a little too plump for the immediate suggestion of grace yet every motion of the child would have been graceful except for the fact that impulse was always predominant giving a certain jerkiness like the hopping of a bird instead of the gliding of one motion into another just as you might see in the same bird on the wing there is one of the ladies but the other how shall i attempt to describe her the first thing I felt was that she was a lady woman and to feel that is almost to fall in love at first sight and out of this whole the first thing you distinguished will be the grace overall 
she was rather slender rather tall rather dark-haired and quite blue-eyed but i assure you it was not upon that occasion that i found out the color of her eyes i was so taken with her whole that i knew nothing about her parts yet she was blue-eyed indicating northern extraction some centuries back perhaps that blue was the blue of the sea that had sunk through the eyes of some sea rover's wife and settled in those of her child to be born when the voyage was over it had been dyed so deep in grain as spencer would say that it had never been worn from the souls of the race since and so was every now and then shining like heaven out of some of its eyes her features were what is called angular they were delicate and brave after the grace the dignity was the next thing you came to discover and the only thing you would not have liked you would have discovered last for when the shine of the courtesy with which she received me had faded away a certain look of negative haughtiness of withdrawal if not of repulsion took its place a look of consciousness of her own high breeding a pride not of life but of circumstance of life which disappointed me in the midst of so much that was very lovely her voice was sweet and i could have fancied a tinge of sadness in it to which impression her slowness of speech without any drawl of it contributed but i am not doing well as an artist in describing her so fully before my reader has become in the least degree interested in her i was seeing her and no words can make him see her fearing lest some such fancy as had possessed judy should be moving in her mind namely that i was if not exactly going to put her through her catechism yet going in some way or other to act the clergyman i hastened to speak this is a most romantic spot miss oldcastle i said and as surprising as it is romantic i could hardly believe my eyes when i looked out of the window and saw it first your surprise was the more natural that the place itself is not properly natural as you must have discovered this was rather a remarkable speech for a young lady to make i answered i only know that such a chasm is the last thing i should have expected to find in this gently undulating country that it is artificial i was no more prepared to hear than i was to see the place itself it looks pretty but it has not a very poetic origin she returned it is nothing but the quarry out of which the old house at the top of it was built I must venture to differ from you entirely in the aspect such an origin assumes to me i said it seems to me a more poetic origin than any convulsion of nature whatever would have been for look you i said being as a young man too much inclined to the didactic for look you i said and she did look at me from that buried mass of rock has arisen this living house with its histories of ages and generations and here i saw a change pass over her face it grew almost pallid but her large blue eyes were still fixed on mine and it seems to me i went on that such a chasm made by the uplifting of a house therefrom is therefore in itself more poetic than if it were even the mouth of an extinct volcano for grand as the motions and deeds of nature are terrible as is the idea of the fiery heart of the earth breaking out in convulsions yet here is something greater for human will human thought human hands in human labor and effort have all been employed to build this house making not only the house beautiful but the place whence it came beautiful too it stands on the edge of what shelley would have called its antenatal tomb now beautiful enough to be its mother filled from generation to generation her face had grown still paler and her lips moved as if she would speak but no sound came from them i had gone on thinking it best to take no notice of her paleness but now i could not help expressing concern i am afraid you feel ill miss oldcastle not at all she answered more quickly than she had yet spoken 
this place must be damp i said i fear you have taken cold she drew herself up a little haughtily thinking no doubt that after her denial i was improperly pressing the point so i drew back to the subject of our conversation but i can hardly think i said that all this mass of stone would be required to build the house large as it is a house is not solid you know no she answered the original building was more of a castle with walls and battlements i can show you the foundations of them still and the picture too of what the place used to be we are not what we were then many a cottage too has been built out of this old quarry not a stone has been taken from it for the last fifty years though just let me show you one thing, Mr. Walton, and then I must leave you. Do not let me detain you for a moment. I will go at once, I said, though if you will allow me, I should be more at ease if I might see you safe to the top of the stair first. She smiled. Indeed, I am not ill, she answered, but I have duties to attend to. Let me show you this, and then you shall go with me back to Mamma she led the way to the edge of the pond and looked into it i followed and gazed down into its depths till my sight was lost in them i could see no bottom of the rocky shaft there is a strong spring down there she said is it not a dreadful place such a depth yes i answered but it has not the horror of dirty water it is as clear as crystal how does the surplus escape on the opposite side of the hill you came up there is a well with a strong stream from it into the river i almost wonder at your choosing such a place to read in i should hardly like to be so near this pond i said laughing judy has taken all that away nothing in nature and everything out of it is strange to judy poor child but just look down a little way into the water on this side do you see anything nothing I answered look again against the wall of the pond she said I see a kind of arch or opening in the side I answered that is what I wanted you to see now do you see a little barred window there in the face of the rock through the trees I cannot say I do I replied no except you know where it is and even then it is not so easy to find it I find it by certain trees what is it it is the window of a little room in the rock from which a stair leads down through the rock to a sloping passage that is the end of it you see under the water provided no doubt i said in case of siege to procure water most likely but not therefore confined to that purpose there are more dreadful stories than i can bear to think of here she paused abruptly and began anew as if that house had brought death and doom out of the earth with it there was an old burial ground here before the hall was built have you ever been down the stair you speak of i asked only part of the way she answered but judy knows every step of it if it were not that the door at the top is locked she would have dived through that archway now and been in her own room in half the time the child does not know what fear means we now moved away from the pond towards the side of the quarry and the open-air staircase which i thought must be considerably more pleasant than the other i confess i longed to see the gleam of that water at the bottom of the dark sloping passage though miss oldcastle accompanied me to the room where i had left her mother and took her leave with merely a bow of farewell I saw the old lady glance sharply from her to me as if she were jealous of what we might have been talking about Granny are you afraid that mr. Wharton has been saying pretty things to aunt Winnie? I assure you he is not of that sort he doesn't understand that kind of thing But he would have jumped into the pond after me and got his death of cold if auntie would have let him It was cold. I think I see you dripping now mr. Walton and here she was in her dark corner coiled up on a couch and laughing heartily but all as if she had done nothing extraordinary and indeed estimated either by her own notions or practices what she had done was not in the least extraordinary disinclined to stay longer i shook hands with the grandmother 
with a certain invincible sense of slime and with the grandchild with a feeling of mischievous health as if the girl might soon corrupt the clergyman into a partnership in pranks as well as in friendship she followed me out of the room and danced before me down the oak staircase clearing the portion from the first landing at a bound then she turned and waited for me who came very deliberately feeling the unsure contact of soul and wax as soon as i reached her she said in a half whisper reaching up toward me on tiptoe isn't she a beauty who your grandmamma i returned she gave me a little push her face glowing with fun but i did not expect she would take her revenge as she did yes of course she answered quite gravely isn't she a beauty and then seeing that she had put me hors de combat she burst into loud laughter and opening the hall door before me let me go without another word i went home very quietly and as i said stepping with curious care of which of course i did not think at the time over the yellow and brown leaves that lay in the middle of the road Chapter Seven, Part One, of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter Seven, Part One. The Bishop's Basin. I went home very quietly, as I say, thinking about the strange elements that not only combine to make life, but must be combined in our idea of life, before we can form a true theory about it. Nowadays, the vulgar notion of what is lifelike in any annals is to be realized by sternly excluding everything but the commonplace, and the means at least are often attained with this much of the end as well that the appearance life bears to vulgar minds is represented with a wonderful degree of success. But I believe that this is at least quite as unreal a mode of representing life as the other extreme, wherein the unlikely, the romantic, and the uncommon predominate. I doubt whether there is a single history, if one could only get at the whole of it, in which there is not a considerable admixture of the unlikely become fact, including a few strange coincidences, of the uncommon which, although striking at first, has grown common from familiarity with its presence as our own, with even at least some one more or less rosy touch of what we call the romantic. My own conviction is that the poetry is far the deepest in us, and that the prose is only broken-down poetry. And likewise that to this our lives correspond. The poetic region is the true one, and just, therefore, the incredible one to the lower order of mind. For although every mind is capable of the truth, or rather capable of becoming capable of the truth, there may lie ages between its capacity and the truth. As you will hear some people read poetry so that no mortal could tell it was poetry, so do some people read their own lives and those of others. I fell into these reflections from comparing in my own mind my former experiences in visiting my parishioners with those of that day. True, I had never sat down to talk with one of them without finding that that man or that woman had actually a history the most marvellous and important fact to a human being. Nay, I had found something more or less remarkable in every one of their histories, so that I was more than barely interested in each of them. And as I made more acquaintance with them, for I had not been in the position or the disposition either before I came to marshmallows, necessary to the gathering of such experiences, I came to the conclusion not that I had got into an extraordinary parish of characters, but that every parish must be more or less extraordinary from the same cause. 
Why did I not use to see such people about me before? Surely I had undergone a change of some sort. Could it be that the trouble I had been going through of late had opened the eyes of my mind to the understanding, or rather the simple seeing, of my fellow-men? But the people among whom I had been to-day belonged rather to such as might be put into a romantic story. Certainly I could not see much that was romantic in the old lady. And yet those eyes and that tight-skinned face, what might they not be capable of in the working out of a story? And then the place they lived in. Why, it would hardly come into my ideas of a nineteenth-century country parish at all. I was tempted to try to persuade myself that all that had happened, since I rose to look out of the window in the old house, had been but a dream. For how could that wooded dell have come there, after all? It was much too large for a quarry. And that madcap girl, she never flung herself into the pond. It could not be. And what could the book have been that the lady with the sea-blue eyes was reading? Was that a real book at all? No. Yes, of course it was. But what was it? What had that to do with the matter? It might turn out to be a very commonplace book after all. No. For commonplace books are generally new, or at least in fine bindings. And here was a shabby little old book, such as, if it had been commonplace, would not have been likely to be the companion of a young lady at the bottom of a quarry. A savage place as holy and enchanted, as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. I know all this will sound ridiculous, especially that quotation from Kubla Khan coming after the close of the preceding sentence. But it is only so much the more like the jumble of thoughts that made a chaos of my mind as I went home. And then for that terrible pool, and subterranean passage, and all that, what had it all to do with this broad daylight, and these dying autumn leaves? No doubt there had been such places. No doubt there were such places somewhere yet. No doubt this was one of them. But somehow or other it would not come in well. I had no intention of going in for—that is the phrase now—going in for the romantic. I would take the impression off by going to see Weir, the carpenter's old father. Whether my plan was successful or not, I shall leave my reader to judge. I found Weir busy as usual, but not with the coffin this time. He was working at a window-sash. Just like life, I thought, tritely perhaps. The other day he was closing up in the outer darkness, and now he is letting in the light. "'It's a long time since you was here last, sir,' he said, but without a smile. Did he mean a reproach? If so, I was more glad of that reproach than I would have been of the warmest welcome, even from old Rogers. The fact was that, having a good deal to attend to besides, and willing at the same time to let the man feel that he was in no danger of being bored by my visits, I had not made use even of my reserve in the shape of a visit to his father. Well, I answered, I wanted to know something about all my people, before I paid a second visit to any of them. All right, sir. Don't suppose I meant to complain, only to let you know you was welcome, sir. I've just come from my first visit to Old Castle Hall. And to tell the truth, for I don't like pretenses, my visit to-day was not so much to you as to your father, whom perhaps I ought to have called upon before, only I was afraid of seeming to intrude upon you, seeing we don't exactly think the same way about some things, I added, with a smile I know which was none the less genuine that I remember it yet. And what makes me remember it yet? It is the smile that lighted up his face in response to mine, for it was more than I looked for and his answer helped to fix the smile in my memory. You made me think, sir, that perhaps after all we were much of the same way of thinking, only perhaps you was a long way ahead of me. Now the man was not right in saying that we were much of the same way of thinking, 
for our opinions could hardly do more than come within sight of each other. But what he meant was right enough, for I was certain from the first that the man had a regard for the downright honest way of things, and I hoped that I too had such a regard. How much of selfishness and of pride in one's own judgment might be mixed up with it, both in his case and mine, I had been too often taken in, by myself, I mean, to be at all careful to discriminate, provided there was a proportion of real honesty along with it, which I felt sure would ultimately eliminate the other. For in the moral nest it is not as with the sparrow and the cuckoo. The right, the original inhabitant, is the stronger, and however unlikely at any given point in the history it may be, the sparrow will grow strong enough to heave the intruding cuckoo overboard. So I was pleased that the man should do me the honor of thinking I was right as far as he could see, which is the greatest honor one man can do another. For it is setting him on his own steed, as the eastern tyrants used to do, and I was delighted to think that the road lay open for further and more real communion between us in time to come. Well, I answered, I think we shall understand each other perfectly before long. But now I must see your father, if it is convenient and agreeable. My father will be delighted to see you, I know, sir. He can't get so far as the church on Sundays, but you'll find him much more to your mind than me. He's been putting ever so many questions to me about the new parson, wanting me to try whether I couldn't get more out of you than the old parson. That's the way we talk about you, you see, sir. You'll understand. And I've never told him that I'd been to church since you came. I suppose from a bit of pride, because I had so long refused to go. But I don't doubt some of the neighbors have told him, for he never speaks about it now. And I know he's been looking out for you. And I fancy he's begun to wonder that the parson was going to see everybody but him. It will be a pleasure to the old man, sir, for he don't see a great many to talk to. And he's fond of a bit of gossip, is the old man, sir. So saying, Weir led the way through the shop into a lobby behind, and thence up what must have been a back stair of the old house, into a large room over the workshop. There were bits of old carving about the walls of the room yet, but as in the shop below, all had been whitewashed. At one end stood a bed with chintz curtains, and a warm-looking counterpane of rich faded embroidery. There was a bit of carpet by the bedside, and another bit in front of the fire. And there the old man sat, on one side, in a high-backed, not very easy-looking chair. With a great effort he managed to rise as I approached him, notwithstanding my entreaties that he would not move. He looked much older when on his feet for he was bent nearly double, in which posture the marvel was how he could walk at all, for he did totter a few steps to meet me, without even the aid of a stick, and, holding out a thin, shaking hand, welcomed me, with an air of breeding rarely to be met with in his station in society. But the chief part of this polish sprung from the inbred kindliness of his nature, which was manifest in the expression of his noble old countenance. Age is such a different thing in different natures. One man seems to grow more and more selfish as he grows older, and in another the slow fire of time seems only to consume with fine imperceptible gradations the yet lingering selfishness in him, letting the light of the kingdom, which the Lord says is within, shine out more and more as the husk grows thin and is ready to fall off, that the man, like the seed sown, may pierce the earth of this world, and rise into the pure air and wind and dew of the second life. The face of a loving old man is always to me like a morning moon, reflecting the yet unrisen sun of the other world, yet fading before its approaching light, until, when it does rise, it pales and withers away from our gaze, absorbed in the source of its own beauty. This old man, you may see, took my fancy wonderfully. For even at this distance of time, when I am old myself, the recollection of his beautiful old face makes me feel as if I could write poetry about him. "'I'm blithe to see you, sir,' said he. "'Sit ye down, sir.' 
and turning he pointed to his own easy-chair, and I then saw his profile. It was delicate as that of Dante, which in form it marvellously resembled. But all the sternness which Dante's evil times had generated in his prophetic face was in this old man's, replaced by a sweetness of hope that was lovely to behold. "'No, Mr. Weir,' I said, "'I cannot take your chair. The Bible tells us to rise up before the aged, not to turn them out of their seats.' "'It would do me good to see you sitting in my cheer, sir. The pains that my son Tom there takes to keep it up as long as the old man may want it. It's a good thing I bred him to the joiner's trade, sir. Sit ye down, sir. The chair'll hold ye, though I warrant it won't last that long after I be gone home. Sit ye down, sir.' Thus entreated, I hesitated no longer, but took the old man's seat. His son brought another chair for him, and he sat down opposite the fire and close to me. Thomas then went back to his work, leaving us alone. "'You've had some speech with my son Tom,' said the old man, the moment he was gone, leaning a little towards me. "'It's main kind of you, sir, to take up kindly with poor folks like us.' "'You don't say it's kind of a person to do what he likes best.' I answered. Besides, it's my duty to know all my people. Oh, yes, sir, I know that. But there's a thousand ways of doing the same thing. I has seen folks, parsons and others, that made a great show of being friendly to the poor, you know, sir. And all the time you could see, or if you couldn't see, you could tell without seeing, that they didn't much regard them in their hearts. But it was a sort of accomplishment to be able to talk to the poor, like, after their own fashion. But the minute an old man sees you, sir, he believes that you mean it, sir, whatever it is, for an old man somehow comes to know things like a child. They call it a second childhood, don't they, sir? And there are some things worth growing a child again to get a hold of again. I only hope what you say may be true, about me, I mean. Take my word for it, sir. You have no idea how that boy of mine, Tom, there, did hate all the clergy till you come. Not that he's any way favorable to them yet. Only he'll say nothing again you, sir. He's got an unfortunate gift of seeing all the faults first, sir. And when a man is that way given, the faults always hides the other side so that there's nothing but faults to be seen. But I find Thomas quite open to reason. That's because you understand him, sir, and know how to give him head. He told me of the talk you had with him. You don't bait him. You don't say, you must come along with me. But you turns and goes along with him. He's not a bad fellow at all, is Tom. But he will have the reason for everything. Now, I never did want the reason for everything. I was content to be told many things. But Tom, you see, he was born with a sore bit in him somewheres. I don't rightly know wheres, and I don't think he rightly knows what's the matter with him himself. I dare say you have a guess, though, by this time, Mr. Weir, I said. And I think I have a guess, too. Well, sir, if he'd only give in, I think he would be far happier. But he can't see his way clear. You must give him time, you know. The fact is, he doesn't feel at home yet. And how can he, so long as he doesn't know his own father? I'm not sure that I rightly understand you, said the old man, looking bewildered and curious. I mean, I answered, that till a man knows that he is one of God's family, living in God's house, with God upstairs, as it were, while he is at his work or his play, in a nursery below stairs, he can't feel comfortable, for a man could not be made that should stand alone like some of the beasts. A man must feel a head over him, because he's not enough to satisfy himself, you know. Thomas just wants faith. That is, he wants to feel that there is a loving Father over him, who is doing things all well and right, if we could only understand them, though it really does not look like it sometimes. Ah, sir, I might have understood you well enough if my poor old head hadn't been started on a wrong track, 
for i fancied for the moment that you were just putting your finger upon the sore place in tom's mind there is no use in keeping family misfortunes from a friend like you sir that boy has known his father all his life but i was nearly half his age before i knew mine strange i said involuntarily almost yes sir strange you may well say a strange story it is the lord help my mother i beg your pardon sir i'm no catholic but that prayer will come of itself sometimes as if it could be of any use now god forgive me don't you be afraid mr weir as if god was ready to take offence at what comes naturally as you say an ejaculation of love is not likely to offend him who is so grand that he is always meek and lowly of heart and whose love is such that ours is a mere faint light a little glooming light much like a shade as one of our own poets says beside it thank you mr walton that's a real comfortable word sir and i am heart sure it's true sir god be praised for evermore he is good sir as i have known in my poor time sir i don't believe there ever was one that just lifted his eyes and looked upwards instead of looking down to the ground that didn't get some comfort to go on with as it were the ready money of comfort as it were though it might be none to put in the bank sir that's true enough i said then your father and mother and here i hesitated were never married sir said the old man promptly as if he would relieve me from an embarrassing position i couldn't help it and i'm no less the child of my father in heaven for it for if he hadn't made me i couldn't have been their son you know sir so that he had more to do with the makin o me than they had though mayhap if he had his way all out i might have been the son o somebody else but now that things be so i wouldn't have liked that at all sir and being once born so i would not have e'er another couple of parents in all england sir though i ne'er knew one of them and i do love my mother and i'm so sorry for my father that i love him too sir and if i could only get my boy tom to think as i do i would die like a psalm tune on an organ sir but it seems to me strange i said that your son should think so much of what is so far gone by surely he would not want another father than you now he is used to his position in life and there can be nothing cast up to him about his birth or descent that's all very true sir and no doubt it would be as you say but there has been other things to keep his mind upon the old affair indeed sir we have had the same misfortune all over again among the young people and i mustn't say anything more about it only my boy tom has a sore heart i knew at once to what he alluded for i could not have been about in my parish all this time without learning that the strange handsome woman in the little shop was the daughter of thomas weir and that she was neither wife nor widow and it now occurred to me for the first time that it was a likeness to her little boy that had affected me so pleasantly when i first saw thomas his grandfather the likeness to his great-grandfather which i saw plainly enough was what made the other fact clear to me and at the same moment i began to be haunted with a flickering sense of a third likeness which i could not in the least fix or identify perhaps i said he may find some good come out of that too well who knows sir i think i said that if we do evil that good may come the good we looked for will never come thereby. But once evil is done, we may humbly look to him who bringeth good out of evil, and wait. Is your granddaughter Catherine in bad health? She looks so delicate. She always had an uncommon look. But what she looks like now, I don't know. I hear no complaints, but she has never crossed this door since we got her set up in that shop. She never comes near her father or her sister though she lets them leastways her sister go and see her. I'm afraid Tom has been rather unmerciful with her, and if ever he put a bad name upon her in her hearing, 
I know from what that lass used to be as a young one, that she wouldn't be likely to forget it, and as little likely to get over it herself, or pass it over to another, even her own father. I don't believe they do more nor nod to one another when they meet in the village. It's well even if they do that much. It's my belief that there's some people made so hard that they never can forgive anything. How did she get into the trouble? Who is the father of her child? Nay, that no one knows for certain. Though there be suspicions, and one of them no doubt correct, but I believe fire wouldn't drive his name out of her mouth. I know my lass. When she says a thing, she'll stick to it. I asked no more questions, but after a short pause the old man went on. I shan't soon forget the night I first heard about my father and mother. That was a night. The wind was roaring like a mad beast about the house. Not this house, sir, but the great house over the way. You don't mean Old Castle Hall, I said. Deed I do, sir, returned the old man. This house here belonged to the same family at one time though when I was born it was another branch of the family, second cousins or something, that lived in it. But even then it was something on to the downhill road, I believe. But, I said, fearing my question might have turned the old man aside from a story worth hearing, never mind all that now, if you please. I am anxious to hear all about that night. Do go on. You were saying the wind was blowing about the old house. Yes, sir. It was roaring, roaring as if it was mad with rage, and every now and then it would come down the chimney like out of a gun, and blow the smoke and almost the fire into the middle of the housekeeper's room. For the housekeeper had been giving me my supper. I called her auntie then, and didn't know a bit that she wasn't my aunt, really. I was at that time a kind of under-gamekeeper upon the place, and slept over the stable. But I fared of the best for I was a favorite with the old woman, I suppose because I had given her plenty of trouble in my time. That's always the way, sir. Well, as I was a-saying, when the wind stopped for a moment, down came the rain with a noise that sounded like a regiment of cavalry on the turnpike road the other side of the hill. And then up the wind got again, and swept the rain away, and took it all in its own hand again and went on roaring worse than ever. "'You'll be wet before you get across the yard, Samuel,' said Auntie, looking very prim in her long white apron, as she sat on the other side of the little round table before the fire, sipping a drop of hot rum and water, which she always had before she went to bed. "'You'll be wet to the skin, Samuel,' she said. "'Never mind,' says I. "'I'm not salt, nor yet sugar.' "'And I'll be going, Auntie.' for you'll be wanting your bed. Sit ye still, said she. I don't want my bed yet. And there she sat, sipping at her rum and water, and there I sat, on the other side, drinking the last of a pint of October. She had gotten me from the cellar, for I had been out in the wind all day. It was just such a night as this, said she, and then stopped again. But I'm weary. Chapter Seven, Part Two, of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood, by George MacDonald. Chapter Seven, Part Two. Not in the least, I answered. Quite the contrary. Pray tell it out your own way. You won't tire me, I assure you. So the old man went on. It was just such a night as this. She began again. Leastways it was snow and not rain that was coming down, as if the Almighty was a-going to spend all his winter stock at once. What happened such a night, Auntie? I said. Ah, my lad! said she, ye may well ask what happened. None has a better right. 
You happened. That's all. Oh, that's all, is it, Auntie? I said and laughed. Nay, nay, Samuel, said she, quite solemn. What is there to laugh at, then? I assure you, you was anything but welcome. And why wasn't I welcome? I said. I couldn't help it, you know. I'm very sorry to hear I intruded, I said, still making a game of it, for I always did like a joke. Well, she said, you certainly wasn't wanted. But I don't blame you, Samuel, and I hope you won't blame me. What do you mean, Auntie? I mean this, that it's my fault, if so be that fault it is, that you're sitting there now, and not lying in less bulk by a good deal at the bottom of the bishop's basin. That's what they call a deep pond at the foot of the old house, sir, though why or wherefore I'm sure I don't know. "'Most extraordinary, Auntie,' I said, feeling very queer, as if I had no business to be there. "'Never you mind, my dear,' says she. "'There you are, and you can take care of yourself now, as well as anybody.' "'But who wanted to drown me?' "'Are you sure you can forgive him if I tell you?' "'Sure enough, suppose he was sitting where you be now,' I answered. It was, I make no doubt, though I can't prove it, I am morally certain it was your own father. I felt the skin go creeping together upon my head, and I couldn't speak. Yes, it was, child, and it's time you knew all about it. Why, you don't know who your own father was. No more I do, I said, and I never cared to ask somehow. I thought it was all right, I suppose but I wonder now that I never did. Indeed you did many a time, when you was a mere boy, like. But I suppose, as you never was answered, you give it up for a bad job, and forgot all about it, like a wise man. You always was a wise child, Samuel. So the old lady always said, sir, and I was willing to believe she was right, if I could. "'But now,' said she, "'it's time you knew all about it, poor Miss Wallace. "'I'm no aunt of yours, my boy, though I love you nearly as well, I think, as if I was. "'For dearly did I love your mother. "'She was a beauty, and better than she was beautiful, whatever folks may say. "'The only wrong thing I'm certain that she ever did was to trust your father too much.' But I must see and give you the story right through from beginning to end. Miss Wallace, as I came to know from her lips, was the daughter of a country attorney, who had a good practice, and was likely to leave her well off. Her mother died when she was a little girl. It's not easy getting on without a mother, my boy. So she wasn't taught much of the best sort, I reckon. When her father died early, and she was left alone. The only thing she could do was to take a governess's place, and she came to us. She never got on well with the children, for they were young and self-willed and rude, and would not learn to do as they were bid. I never knew one of them shut the door when they went out of this room, and, from having had all her own way at home, with plenty of servants and money to spend, it was a sore change to her. But she was a sweet creature, that she was. She did look sorely tried when Master Freddy would get on the back of her chair, and Miss Gusta would lie down on the rug and never stir for all she could say to them, but only laugh at her, to be sure. And then Auntie would take a sip at her rum and water, and sit considering old times like a static, and I sat as if my head was one great ear and I never spoke a word, and Auntie began again. The way I came to know so much about her was this. Nobody, you see, took any notice or care of her. For the children were kept away with her in the old house, and my lady wasn't one to take trouble about anybody till once she stood in her way, and then she would just shove her aside or crush her like a spider, and had done with her. 
They have always been a proud and fierce race, the old castle, sir, said Weir, taking up the speech in his own person, and there's been a deal of breeding in and in amongst them, and that has kept the worst of them. The men took to the women of their own sort somehow, you see. The lady up at the old hall now is a crowfoot. I'll just tell you one thing the gardener told me about her years ago, sir. She had a fancy for hyacinths in her room in the spring, and she had some particular fine ones, and a lady of her acquaintance begged for some of them. And what do you think she did? She couldn't refuse them, and she couldn't bear any one to have them as good as she. And so she sent the hyacinth roots, but she boiled them first. The gardener told me himself, sir. And so, when the poor thing, said Auntie, was taken with a dreadful cold, which was no wonder if you saw the state of the window in the room she had to sleep in, and which I got old Jones to set to rights and paid him for it out of my own pocket, else he wouldn't have done it at all, for the family wasn't too much in the way or the means either of paying their debts. Well, there she was, and nobody minding her, and of course it fell to me to look after her. It would have made your heart bleed to see the poor thing flung all of a heap on her bed, blue with cold and coughing. "'My dear,' I said, and she burst out crying, and from that moment there was confidence between us. I made her as warm and as comfortable as I could, but I had to nurse her for a fortnight before she was able to do anything again. She didn't shirk her work, though, poor thing. It was a heart-sore to me to see the poor young thing, with her sweet eyes and her pale face, talking away to those children that were more like wild cats than human beings. She might as well have talked to wild cats, I'm sure. But I don't think she was ever so miserable again as she must have been before her illness. For she used often to come and see me of an evening, and she would sit there, where you are sitting now, for an hour at a time, without speaking her thin white hands lying folded in her lap, and her eyes fixed on the fire. I used to wonder what she could be thinking about, and I had made up my mind as she was not long for this world, when all at once it was announced that Miss Oldcastle, who had been to school for some time, was coming home, and then we began to see a great deal of company, and for month after month the house was more or less filled with visitors so that my time was constantly taken up, and I saw much less of poor Miss Wallace than I had seen before. But when we did meet on some of the back stairs, or when she came to my room for a few minutes before going to bed, we were just as good friends as ever, and I used to say, I wish this scurry was over, my dear, that we might have our old times again. And she would smile and say something sweet but I was surprised to see that her health began to come back, at least so it seemed to me, for her eyes grew brighter, and a flush came upon her pale face, and though the children were as tiresome as ever, she didn't seem to mind it so much. But indeed she had not very much to do with them out of school hours now, for when the spring came on they would be out and about the place with their sister or one of their brothers and indeed out of doors it would have been impossible for Miss Wallace to do anything with them, for they behaved so badly to nobody as to Miss Wallace, and indeed they were clever children, and could be engaging enough when they pleased. But then I had a blow, Samuel. It was a lovely spring night just after the sun was down, and I wanted a drop of milk fresh from the cow for something that I was making for dinner the next day. So I went through the kitchen garden and through the belt of young larches to go to the shippin'. But when I got among the trees, who should I see at the other end of the path that went along but Miss Wallace walking arm in arm with Captain Crowfoot, who was just come home from India, where he had been with Lord Clive. The captain was a man about two or three and thirty, a relation of the family, and the son of Sir Giles Crowfoot who lived then in this old house, sir, and had but one son, my father, you see, sir. 
and it did give me a turn, said my aunt, to see her walking with him, for I felt as sure as judgment that no good could come of it, for the captain had not the best of characters, that is, when people talked about him in chimney corners and such like, though he was a great favorite with everybody that knew nothing about him. He was a fine, manly, handsome fellow, with a smile that, as people said, no woman could resist, though I'm sure it would have given me no trouble to resist it, whatever they may mean by that, for I saw that that same smile was the falsest thing of all the false things about him. All the time he was smiling, you would have thought he was looking at himself in a glass. He was said to have gathered a power of money in India somehow or other, but I don't know, only I don't think he would have been the favorite he was with my lady if he hadn't. And reports were about, too, of the ways and means by which he had made the money. Some said by robbing the poor heathen creatures, and some said it was only that his brother officers didn't approve of his speculating as he did in horses and other things. I don't know whether officers are so particular. At all events, this was a fact for it was one of his own servants that told me, not thinking any harm or any shame of it. He had quarrelled with a young ensign in the regiment. On which side the wrong was I don't know. But he first thrashed him most unmercifully, and then called him out, as they say. And when the poor fellow appeared, he could scarcely see out of his eyes, and certainly couldn't take anything like an aim. And he shot him dead, did Captain Crowfoot. Think about hearing that about one's own father, sir. But I never said a word, for I hadn't a word to say. Think of that, Samuel, said my aunt. Else you won't believe what I am going to tell you. And you won't even then, I dare say. But I must tell you, nevertheless, and notwithstanding, well, I felt as if the earth was sinking away from under the feet of me and I stood and stared at them, and they came on, never seeing me, and actually went close past me and never saw me. At least, if he saw me, he took no notice, for I don't suppose that the angel with the flaming sword would have put him out. But for her, I know she didn't see me, for her face was down, burning and smiling at once. I'm an old man now, sir and I never saw my mother. But I can't tell you the story without feeling as if my heart would break for the poor young lady. I went back to my room, said my aunt, with my empty jug in my hand, and I sat down as if I had had a stroke, and I never moved till it was pitch dark and my fire out. It was a marvel to me afterwards that nobody came near me for everybody was calling after me at that time. And it was days before I caught a glimpse of Miss Wallace again, at least to speak to her. At last, one night, she came to my room, and without a moment of parley I said to her, "'Oh, my dear, what was that wretch saying to you?' "'What wretch?' says she, quite sharp-like. "'Why, Captain Crowfoot,' says I. To be sure. What have you to say against Captain Crowfoot? says she, quite scornful like. So I tumbled out all I had against him in one breath. She turned awful pale, and she shook from head to foot. But she was able for all that to say, Indian servants are known liars, Mrs. Prendergast, says she, and I don't believe one word of it all but I'll ask him the next time I see him. "'Do so, my dear,' I said, not fearing for myself, for I knew he would not make any fuss that might bring the thing out into the air, and hoping that it might lead to a quarrel between them. And the next time I met her, Samuel, it was in the gallery that takes to the west turret. She passed me with a nod just, and a blush instead of a smile on her sweet face. And I didn't blame her, Samuel, but I knew that that villain had gotten a hold of her. And so I could only cry, and that I did. Things went on like this for some months, 
The captain came and went, stopping a week at a time. Then he stopped for a whole month, and this was in the first of the summer. And then he said he was ordered abroad again, and went away. But he didn't go abroad. He came again in the autumn for the shooting, and began to make up to Miss Oldcastle, who had grown a fine young woman by that time. And then Miss Wallace began to pine. The captain went away again. Before long I was certain that if ever young creature was in consumption, she was, but she never said a word to me. However the poor thing got on with her work, I can't think, but she grew weaker and weaker. I took the best care of her she would let me, and contrived that she should have her meals in her own room. But something was between her and me that she never spoke a word about herself, and never alluded to the captain. By and by came the news that the captain and Miss Oldcastle were to be married in the spring, and Miss Wallace took to her bed after that, and my lady said she had never been of much use and wanted to send her away. But Miss Oldcastle, who was far superior to any of the rest in her disposition, spoke up for her. She had been to ask me about her, and I told her the poor thing must go to a hospital if she was sent away, for she had ne'er a home to go to. And then she went to see the governess, poor thing, and spoke very kindly to her, but never a word would Miss Wallace answer. She only stared at her with great, big, wild-like eyes, and Miss Oldcastle thought she was out of her mind, and spoke of an asylum. But I said she hadn't long to live, and if she would get my lady her mother to consent to take no notice, I would take all the care and trouble of her. And she promised, and the poor thing was left alone. I began to think myself her mind must be going, for not a word would she speak, even to me, though every moment I could spare I was up with her in her room. Only I was forced to be careful not to be out of the way when my lady wanted me, for that would have tied me more. At length, one day, as I was settling her pillow for her, she all at once threw her arms about my neck and burst into a terrible fit of crying. She sobbed and panted for breath so dreadfully that I put my arms round her and lifted her up to give her relief. And when I laid her down again, I whispered in her ear, I know now, my dear. I'll do all I can for you. She caught hold of my hand, and held it to her lips, and then to her bosom, and cried again, but more quietly, and all was right between us once more. It was well for her, poor thing, that she could go to her bed, and I said to myself, Nobody need know about it, and nobody ever shall, if I can help it. To tell the truth, my hope was that she would die before there was any need for further concealment. But people in that condition seldom die, they say, till all is over, and so she lived on and on, though plainly getting weaker and weaker. At the captain's next visit the wedding day was fixed, and after that a circumstance came about that made me uneasy. A Hindu servant, the captain called him his nigger always, had been constantly in attendance upon him. I never could abide the snake look of the fellow nor the noiseless way he went about the house. But this time the captain had a Hindu woman with him as well. He said that his man had fallen in with her in London, that he had known her before, that she had come home as nurse with an English family, and it would be very nice for his wife to take her back with her to India. If she could only give her house room, and make her useful till after the wedding. This was easily arranged, and he went away to return in three weeks, when the wedding was to take place. Meantime poor Emily grew fast worse, and how she held out with that terrible cough of hers I never could understand, and spitting blood, too, every other hour or so, though not very much. And now, to my great trouble, with the preparations for the wedding, I could see yet less of her than before. And when Miss Oldcastle sent the Hindu to ask me if she might not sit in the room with the poor girl, I did not know how to object. 
though I did not at all like her being there. I felt a great mistrust of the woman somehow or other. I never did like blacks, and I never shall. So she went, and sat by her, and waited on her very kindly, at least poor Emily said so. I called her Emily because she had begged me that she might feel as if her mother were with her, and she was a child again. I had tried before to find out from her when greater care would be necessary, but she couldn't tell me anything. I doubted even if she understood me. I longed to have the wedding over that I might get rid of the black woman, and have time to take her place and get everything prepared. The captain arrived, and his man with him, and twice I came upon the two blacks in close conversation. Well, the wedding day came. The people went to church, and while they were there a terrible storm of wind and snow came on such that the horses would hardly face it. The captain was going to take his bride home to his father, Sir Giles's. But short as the distance was, before the time came, the storm got so dreadful that no one could think of leaving the house that night. The wind blew for all the world just as it blows this night, only it was snow in its mouth and not rain. Carriage and horses and all would have been blown off the road for certain. It did blow, to be sure. After dinner was over, and the ladies were gone to the drawing-room, and the gentlemen had been sitting over their wine for some time, the butler, William Weir, an honest man, whose wife lived at the lodge, came to my room looking scared. "'Locks, William,' says I, said my aunt, sir. "'Whatever is the matter with you?' "'Well, Mrs. Prendergast, says he, and said no more. "'Locks, William, says I. Speak out. Well, says he, Mrs. Prendergast, it's a strange wedding it is. There's the ladies all alone in the withdrawing-room, and there's the gentlemen calling for more wine, and cursing and swearing that it's awful to hear. It's my belief that swords will be drawn before long. Tut, says I, William, it will come the sooner if you don't give them what they want. Go and get it as fast as you can. "'I don't almost like going down them stairs alone in such a night, ma'am,' says he. "'Would you mind coming with me?' "'Dear me, William,' says I, "'a pretty story to tell your wife.' She was my own half-sister, and younger than me. "'A pretty story to tell your wife that you wanted an old body like me to go and take care of you in your own cellar,' says I. "'But I'll go with you, if you like, for to tell the truth it's a terrible night.' And so down we went, and brought up six bottles more of the best port. And I really didn't wonder, when I was down there, and heard the dull roar of the wind against the rock below, that William didn't much like to go alone. When he went back with the wine, the captain said, "'William, what kept you so long? Mr. Centolivre says that you were afraid to go down into the cellar.' Now wasn't that odd? For was it a real fact? Before William could reply, Sir Giles said, A man might well be afraid to go anywhere alone in a night like this. Whereupon the captain cried, with an oath, that he would go down the underground stair, and into every vault on the way, for the wager of a guinea. And there the matter, according to William, dropped, for the fresh wine was put on the table. But after they had drunk most of it, the captain, according to William, drinking less than usual, it was brought up again, he couldn't tell by which of them, and in five minutes after they were all at my door, demanding the key of the room at the top of the stair. I was just going up to see poor Emily when I heard the noise of their unsteady feet coming along the passage to my door, and I gave the captain the key at once, wishing with all my heart he might get a good fright for his pains. He took a jug with him, too, to bring some water up from the well, as a proof he had been down. The rest of the gentlemen went with him into the little cellar-room, but they wouldn't stop there till he came up again, they said it was so cold. They all came into my room, where they talked as gentlemen wouldn't do if the wine hadn't got the uppermost 
It was some time before the captain returned. It's a good way down and back. When he came in at last, he looked as if he had got the fright I wished him. He had such a scared look. The candle in his lantern was out, and there was no water in the jug. "'There's your guinea, Centilibra, says he, throwing it on the table. "'You needn't ask me any questions, for I won't answer one of them.' "'Captain,' says I, as he turned to leave the room, and the other gentleman rose to follow him, "'I'll just hang up the key again.' "'By all means,' says he. "'Where is it, then?' says I. He started, and made as if he searched his pockets all over for it. "'I must have dropped it,' says he. "'But it's of no consequence. You can send William to look for it in the morning. It can't be lost, you know.' "'Very well, Captain,' said I. But I didn't like being without the key, because, of course, he hadn't locked the door, and that part of the house has a bad name, and no wonder. It wasn't exactly pleasant to have the door left open. All this time I couldn't get to see how Emily was. As often as I looked from my window I saw her light in the old west turret out there, Samuel. You know the room where the bed is still. The rain and the wind will be blowing right through it to-night. That's the bed you was born upon, Samuel. It's all gone now, sir, turret and all, like a good deal more about the old place. But there's a story about that place afterwards. Only I mustn't try to tell you two things at once. Now I had told the Indian woman that if anything happened, if she was worse or wanted to see me, she must put the candle on the right side of the window, and I should always be looking out, and would come directly, whoever might wait. For I was expecting you some time soon, and nobody knew anything about when you might come. But there the blind continued drawn down as before, so I thought all was going on right. And what would the storm keeping Sir Giles and many more that would have gone home that night? There was no end of work, and some contrivance necessary, I can tell you, to get them all bedded for the night, for we were nothing too well provided with blankets and linen in the house. There was always more room than money in it. So it was past twelve o'clock before I had a minute to myself, and that was only after they had all gone to bed the bride and bridegroom in the crimson chamber, of course. Well, at last I crept quietly into Emily's room. I ought to have told you that I had not let her know anything about the wedding being that day, and had enjoined the heathen woman not to say a word. For I thought she might as well die without hearing about it. But I believe the vile wretch did tell her. When I opened the room door, there was no light there. I spoke, but no one answered. I had my own candle in my hand, but it had been blown out as I came up the stair. I turned and ran along the corridor to reach the main stair, which was the nearest way to my room, when all at once I heard such a shriek from the crimson chamber as I never heard in my life. It made me all creep like worms, and in a moment doors and doors were opened and lights came out, everybody looking terrified and what with drink and horror and sleep some of the gentlemen were awful to look upon. And the door of the crimson chamber opened, too, and the captain appeared in his dressing-gown, bawling out to know what was the matter. Though I am certain to this day the cry did come from that room, and that he knew more about it than any one else did. As soon as I got a light, however, which I did from Sir Giles's candle, I left them to settle it amongst them and ran back to the west turret. When I entered the room there was my dear girl, lying white and motionless. There could be no doubt a baby had been born, but no baby was to be seen. I rushed to the bed, but though she was still warm, your poor mother was quite dead. There was no use in thinking about helping her. But what could have become of the child? As if by a light in my mind I saw it all. I rushed down to my room, got my lantern, and without waiting to be afraid ran to the underground stairs where I actually found the door standing open. I had not gone down more than three turnings, when I thought I heard a cry, and I sped 
faster still, and just about halfway down there lay a bundle in a blanket. And however you got over the state I found you in, Samuel, I can't think. But I caught you up as you was, and ran to my own room with you, and I locked the door, and there being a kettle on the fire and some conveniences in the place, I did the best for you I could, for the breath wasn't out of you, though it well might have been. And then I laid you before the fire, and by that time you had begun to cry a little, to my great pleasure, and then I got a blanket off my bed and wrapped you up in it. And the storm being abated by this time, made the best of my way with you through the snow to the lodge, where William's wife lived. It was not so far off then as it is now, but in the midst of my trouble the silly body did make me laugh when he opened the door to me and saw the bundle in my arms. "'Mrs. Prendergast,' says he, "'I didn't expect it of you. Hold your tongue,' I said. "'You would never have talked such nonsense if you had had the grace to have any of your own,' says I. And with that I into the bedroom and shut the door, and left him out there in his shirt. My sister and I soon got everything arranged, for there was no time to lose. And before morning I had all made tidy and your poor mother lying as sweet a corpse as ever angel saw, and no one could say a word against her. And it's my belief that that villain made her believe somehow or other that she was as good as married to him. She was buried down there in the churchyard, close by the vestry door. Said my aunt, sir, and all our family had been buried there ever since, my son's wife among them, sir. "'But what was that cry in the house?' I asked. "'And what became of the black woman?' "'The woman was never seen again in our quarter. "'And what the cry was my aunt never would say. "'She seemed to know, though, "'notwithstanding, as she said, "'that Captain and Mrs. Crowfoot denied all knowledge of it. "'But the lady looked dreadful,' she said, "'and never was well again, "'and died at the birth of her first child.' That was the present Mrs. Ocastle's father, sir. But why should the woman have left you on the stair instead of drowning you in the well at the bottom? My aunt evidently thought there was some mystery as the other, for she had no doubt about the woman's intention. But all she would ever say concerning it was, The key was never found, Samuel. You see, I had to get a new one made. And she pointed to where it hung on the wall. "'But that doesn't look new now,' she would say. "'The lock was very hard to fit again. "'And so you see, sir, I was brought up as her nephew, "'though people were surprised, no doubt, "'that William Weir's wife should have a child, "'and nobody knows she was expecting. "'Well, with all the reports of the captain's money, "'none of it showed in this old place, "'which from that day began, as it were, to crumble away.' There's been little repair done upon it since then. If it hadn't been a well-built place to begin with, it wouldn't be standing now, sir. But it's a very different place, I can tell you. Why, all behind was a garden with terraces and fruit trees and gay flowers, to no end. I remember it as well as yesterday, nay, a great deal better, for the matter of that. For I don't remember yesterday at all, sir. I have tried a little to tell the story as he told it, but I am aware that I have succeeded very badly, for I am not like my friend in London, who I verily believe could give you an exact representation of any dialect he ever heard. I wish I had been able to give a little more of the form of the old man's speech. All I have been able to do is to show a difference from my own way of telling a story. But in the main I think I have reported it correctly. I believe if the old man was correct in representing his aunt's account, the story is very little altered between us. But why should I tell such a story at all? I am willing to allow at once that I have very likely given it more room than it deserves in these poor annals of mine. But the reason why I tell it at all is simply this, that as it came from the old man's lips it interested me greatly. It certainly did not produce the effect I had hoped to gain from an interview with him, namely, 
a reduction to the common and present. For all this ancient tale tended to keep up the sense of distance between my day's experience at the hall and the work I had to do amongst my cottagers and tradespeople. Indeed, it came very strangely upon that experience. But surely you did not believe such an extravagant tale. The old man was in his dotage to begin with. Had the old man been in his dotage, which he was not, my answer would have been a more triumphant one. For when was dotage consistently and imaginatively inventive? But why should I not believe the story? There are people who can never believe anything that is not, I do not say merely in accordance with their own character, but in accordance with the particular mood they may happen to be in at the time it is presented to them. They know nothing of human nature beyond their own immediate preference at the moment for port or sherry, for vice or virtue. To tell me there could not be a man so lost to shame, if to rectitude, as Captain Crowfoot, is simply to talk nonsense. Nay, gentle reader, if you, and let me suppose I address a lady, if you will give yourself up for thirty years to doing just whatever your lowest self, and not your best self, may like, I will warrant you capable by the end of that time of child-murder at least. I do not think the descent to Avernus is always easy, but it is always possible. Many and many such a story was fact in old times, and human nature being the same still, though under different restraints, equally horrible things are constantly in progress towards the windows of the newspapers. But the whole tale has such a melodramatic air. That argument simply amounts to this, that because such subjects are capable of being employed with great dramatic effect, and of being at the same time very badly represented, therefore they cannot take place in real life. But ask any physician of your acquaintance whether a story is unlikely simply because it involves terrible things such as do not occur every day. The fact is, that such things, occurring monthly or yearly only, are more easily hidden away out of sight. Indeed, we can have no sense of security for ourselves, except in the knowledge that we are striving up and away, and therefore cannot be sinking nearer to the region of such awful possibilities. Yet, as I said before, I am afraid I have given it too large a space in my narrative. Only it so forcibly reminded me at the time of the expression I could not understand upon Miss Oldcastle's face, and since then has been so often recalled by circumstances and events, that I felt impelled to record it in full. And now I have done with it. I left the old man with thanks for the kind reception he had given me, and walked home, revolving many things with which I shall not detain the attention of my reader. Indeed, my thoughts were confused and troubled, and would ill bear analysis or record. I shut myself up in my study, and tried to read a sermon of Jeremy Taylor. But it would not do. I fell fast asleep over it at last, and woke refreshed. End of chapter 7, part 2Chapter 8 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter 8 What I Preached. During the suffering which accompanied the disappointment at which I have already hinted, I did not think it inconsistent with the manly spirit in which I was resolved to endure it, to seek consolation from such a source as the New Testament, if mayhap consolation, for such a trouble was to be found there. Whereupon, a little to my surprise, I discovered that I could not read the epistles at all, for I did not then care an atom for the theological discussions in which I had been interested before. 
and for the sake of which I had read these epistles. Now that I was in trouble, what to me was that philosophical theology staring me in the face from out the sacred page? Ah, reader, do not misunderstand me. All reading of the book is not reading of the word, and many that are first shall be last, and the last first. I know now that it was Jesus Christ, and not theology, that filled the hearts of the men that wrote these epistles. Jesus Christ, the living, loving God-man, whom I found, not in the epistles, but in the Gospels. The Gospels contain what the apostles preached, the epistles what they wrote after the preaching. And until we understand the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ our brother King, until we understand Him, until we have His Spirit, promised so freely to them that ask it, all the epistles, the words of men who were full of Him, and wrote out of that fullness, who loved him so utterly, that by that very love they were lifted into the air of pure reason and right, and would die for him, and did die for him, without two thoughts about it, in the very simplicity of no choice. The letters, I say, of such men are to us a sealed book. Until we love the Lord, so as to do what he tells us, we have no right to have an opinion about what one of those men meant for all they wrote is about things beyond us. The simplest woman who tries not to judge her neighbor, or not to be anxious for the morrow, will better know what is best to know than the best-read bishop without that one simple outgoing of his highest nature in the effort to do the will of him who thus spoke. But I have, as is too common with me, been led away by my feelings from the path to the object before me. What I wanted to say was this, that, although I could make nothing of the epistles, could see no possibility of consolation from my distress springing from them. I found it altogether different when I tried the gospel once more. Indeed, it then took such a hold of me as it had never taken before, only that it is simply saying nothing. I found out that I had known nothing at all about it, that I had only a certain surface knowledge, which tended rather to ignorance, because it fostered the delusion that I did know know that man christ jesus ah lord i would go through fire and water to sit the last at thy table in thy kingdom but dare i say now i know thee but thou art the gospel for thou art the way the truth and the life and i have found thee the gospel for i found as i read that thy very presence in my thoughts not as the theologians show thee but as thou showest thyself to them who report thee to us smooth the troubled waters of my spirit so that even while the storm lasted i was able to walk upon them to go to thee and when those waters became clear i most rejoiced in their clearness because they mirrored thy form because thou wert there to my vision the one ideal the perfect man the god perfected as king of men by working out his godhead in the work of man revealing that god and man are one that to serve God a man must be partaker of the divine nature, that for a man's work to be done thoroughly, God must come and do it first himself, that is to help men. He must be what he is, man in God, God in man, visibly before their eyes, or to the hearing of their ears, so much I saw. And therefore, when I was once more in a position to help my fellows, what could I want to give them? but that which was the very bread and water of life to me, the Saviour himself. And how was I to do this? By trying to represent the man in all the simplicity of his life, of his sayings and doings, of his refusals to say or do. I took the story from the beginning, and told them about the baby, trying to make the fathers and mothers, and all whose love for children supplied the lack of fatherhood and motherhood, feel that it was a real baby boy and I followed the life on and on, trying to show them how he felt, as far as one might dare to touch such sacred things, when he did so-and-so, or said so-and-so, and what his relation to his father and mother and brothers and sisters was, and to the different kinds of people who came about him, and I tried to show them what his sayings meant, as far as I understood them myself, and where I could not understand them, I just told them so and said I hoped for more light by and by to enable me to understand them, telling them that that hope was a sharp goad to my resolution, 
and driving me on to do my duty, because I knew that only as I did my duty would light come up in my heart, making me wise to understand the precious words of my Lord. And I told them that if they would try to do their duty, they would find more understanding from that than from any explanation I could give them. And so I went on from Sunday to Sunday, and the number of people that slept grew less and less, until at last it was reduced to the church warden, Mr. Brownrigg, and an old washerwoman, who, poor thing, stood so much all the week, that sitting down with her was like going to bed, and she never could do it, as she told me, without going to sleep. I therefore called upon her every Monday morning, and had five minutes' chat with her, as she stood at her wash-tub, wishing to make up to her for her drowsiness, and thinking that if I could once get her interested in anything, she might be able to keep awake a little while at the beginning of the sermon, for she gave me no chance of interesting her on Sundays, going fast asleep the moment I stood up to preach. I never got so far as that, however, and the only fact that showed me that I had made any impression upon her, beyond the pleasure she always manifested when I appeared on the Monday, was that, whereas all my linen had been very badly washed at first, a decided improvement took place after a while, beginning with my surplice and bands, and gradually extending itself to my shirts and handkerchiefs, till at last even Miss Pearson was unable to find any fault with the poor, old, sleepy woman's work. For Mr. Brownrigg, I am not sure that the sense of any one sentence I ever uttered, down to the day of his death, entered into his brain. I dare not say his mind or heart. With regard to him, and millions besides, I am more than happy to obey my Lord's command, and not judge. But it was not long either before my congregation began to improve, whatever might be the cause. I could not help hoping that it was really because they liked to hear the gospel, that is, the good news about Christ himself and I always made use of the knowledge I had of my individual hearers, to say what I thought would do them good. Not that I ever preached at anybody. I only sought to explain the principles of things in which I knew action of some sort was demanded from them. For I remembered how our Lord's sermon against covetousness, and the parable of the rich man with the little barn, had for its occasion the request of a man that our Lord would interfere to make his brother share with him, which he declining to do, yet gave both brothers a lesson such as, if they wished to do what was right, would help them to see clearly what was the right thing to do in this and every such matter. Clear the mind's eye by washing away the covetousness, and the whole nature be full of light, and the right walk would speedily follow. Before long, likewise, I was as sure of seeing the pale face of Thomas Weir perched, like that of a man beheaded for treason, upon the apex of the gablet of the old tomb, as I was of hearing the wonderful playing of that husky old organ, of which I have spoken once before. I continued to pay him a visit every now and then, and I assure you, never was the attempt to be thoroughly honest towards a man better understood, or more appreciated, than my attempt was by the atheistical carpenter. The man was no more an atheist than David was when he saw the wicked spreading green bay tree, and it was troubled at the sight. He only wanted to see a God in whom he could trust. And if I succeeded at all in making him hope that there might be such a God, it is to me one of the most precious seals of my ministry. But it was now getting very near Christmas, and there was one person whom I had never yet seen at church. That was Catherine Weir. I thought at first it could hardly be that she shrunk from being seen. For how then could she have taken to keeping a shop, where she must be at the back of every one? I had several times gone and bought tobacco of her since that first occasion, and I had told my housekeeper to buy whatever she could from her, instead of going to the larger shop in the place, at which Mrs. Pearson had grumbled a good deal, saying how could the things be so good out of a pokey little shop like that. But I told her I did not care if the things were not quite as good, for it would be of a mere consequence to Catherine to have the custom than it would be to me to have the one lump of sugar I put in my tea of a morning one shade or even two shades whiter. So I had contrived to keep up a kind of connection with her, although I saw that any attempt at conversation was so distasteful to her that it must do harm until something should I have brought about a change in her feelings, though what feeling wanted changing. I could not at first tell. I came to the conclusion that she had been wronged grievously, 
and that this was wrong operating on a nature similar to her father's, had drawn all her mind to brood over it. The world itself, the whole order of her life, everything about her, would seem then to have wronged her, and to speak to her of religion would only arouse her scorn, and make her feel as if God himself, if there were a God, had wronged her too. Evidently, likewise, she had that peculiarity of strong, undeveloped natures, of being unable, once possessed by one set of thoughts, to get rid of it again, or to see something except in the shadows of those thoughts. I had no doubt, however, at last, that she was ashamed of her position in the eyes of society, although a hitherto indomitable pride had upheld her to face it so far as was necessary to secure her independence, both of which, pride and shame, prevented her from appearing where it was unnecessary, and especially in church. I could do nothing more than wait for a favorable opportunity. I could invent no way of reaching her yet, for I had soon found that kindness to her boy was regarded rather in the light of an insult to her. I should have been greatly puzzled in account for his being such a sweet little fellow, had I not known that he was a great deal with his aunt and grandfather. A more attentive and devout worshipper was not in the congregation than that little boy. Before going on to speak of another of the most remarkable of my parishioners, whom I have just once mentioned, I believe, already, I should like to say that on three several occasions before Christmas I had seen Judy look grave. She was always quite well behaved in church, though restless, as one might expect. But on these occasions she was not only attentive, but grave, as if she felt something or other. I will not mention what subjects I was upon at those times, because the mention of them would not, in the minds of my readers, at all harmonize with the only notion of Judy they can yet possibly have. For Mrs. Oldcastle, I never saw her change countenance or even expression at anything. I mean, in church. Chapter 9, Part 1 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter 9, Part 1 The Organist. On the afternoon of my second Sunday at Marshmallows, I was standing in the churchyard, casting a long shadow in the light of the declining sun. I was reading the inscription upon an old headstone, for I thought everybody was gone, when I heard a door open, and shut again before I could turn. I saw at once that it must have been a little door in the tower, almost concealed from where I stood by a deep buttress. I had never seen the door open and I had never inquired anything about it, supposing it led merely into the tower. After a moment it opened again, and, to my surprise, out came, stooping his tall form to get his gray head clear of the low archway, a man whom no one could pass without looking after him. Tall and strongly built, he had the carriage of a military man without an atom of that sternness which one generally finds in the faces of those accustomed to command. He had a large face, with large regular features, and large clear gray eyes, all of which united to express an exceeding placidity or repose. It shone with intelligence, a mild intelligence, no way suggestive of profundity, although of geniality. Indeed, there was a little too much expression. The face seemed to express all that lay beneath it. I was not satisfied with the countenance, and yet it looked quite good. It was somehow a too well-ordered face. It was quite Greek in its outline, and marvelously well kept and smooth, considering that the beard, to which razors were utterly strange, and which descended halfway down his breast, would have been as white as snow except for a slight yellowish tinge. His eyebrows were still very dark, only just touched with the frost of winter. His hair, too, as I saw when he lifted his hat, was still wonderfully dark for the condition of his beard. It flashed into my mind that this must be the organist who played so remarkably. 
Somehow I had not happened yet to inquire about him. But there was a stateliness in this man amounting almost to consciousness of dignity, and I was a little bewildered. His clothes were all of black, very neat and clean, but old-fashioned and threadbare. They bore signs of use, but more signs of time and careful keeping. I would have spoken to him, but something in the manner in which he bowed to me as he passed prevented me, and I let him go unaccosted. The sexton, coming out directly after, and proceeding to lock the door, I was struck by the action. "'What is he locking the door for?' I said to myself. But I said nothing to him, because I had not answered the question myself yet. "'Who is that gentleman?' I asked. "'Who came out just now?' "'That is Mr. Stoddart, sir,' he answered. I thought I had heard the name in the neighborhood before. "'Is it he who plays the organ?' I asked. "'That he do, sir. He's played our organ for the last ten year, ever since he come to live at the hall.' "'What hall?' "'Why, the hall, to be sure. Old Castle Hall, you know.' And then it dawned on my recollection that I had heard Judy mention her Uncle Stoddart. But how could he be her uncle? "'Is he a relation of the family?' I asked. "'He's a brother-in-law, I believe, of the old lady, sir. But however he come to live there, I don't know. It's no such binding connection, you know, sir. He's been in the military line, I believe, sir, in the Inges or somewheres.' I do not think I shall have any more strange parishioners to present to my readers. At least I do not remember any more just at this moment. And this one, as the reader will see, I positively could not keep out. A military man from India, a brother-in-law of Mrs. Oldcastle, choosing to live with her, an entrancing performer upon an old, asthmatic, dry-throated church-organ, taking no trouble to make the clergyman's acquaintance, and passing him in the churchyard with a courteous bow, although his face was full of kindliness, if not of kindness. I could not help thinking all this strange. And yet, will the reader cease to accord me credit when I assert it, although I had quite intended to inquire after him when I left the vicarage to go to the hall, and had even thought of him when sitting with Mrs. Oldcastle, I never thought of him again after going with Judy, and left the house without having made a single inquiry after him. Nor did I think of him again till just as I was passing under the outstretched neck of one of those serpivolents on the gate, and what made me think of him then I cannot in the least imagine. But I resolved at once that I would call upon him the following week lest he should think that the fact of his having omitted to call upon me had been the occasion of such an apparently pointed omission on my part. For I had long ago determined to be no further guided by the rules of society than as they might aid in bringing about true neighborliness, and, if possible, friendliness and friendship. Wherever they might interfere with these, I would disregard them, as far, on the other hand, as the disregard of them might tend to bring about the results I desired. When carrying out this resolution, I rang the doorbell at the hall, and inquired whether Mr. Stoddart was at home. The butler stared, and, as I simply continued gazing in return, and waiting, he answered at length with some hesitation, as if he were picking and choosing his words. "'Mr. Stoddart never calls upon any one, sir.' "'I am not complaining of Mr. Stoddart,' I answered, wishing to put the man at his ease. "'But nobody calls upon Mr. Stoddart,' he returned. "'That's very unkind of somebody, surely,' I said. "'But he doesn't want anybody to call upon him, sir.' "'Ah, that's another matter. I didn't know that. Of course, nobody has a right to intrude upon anybody. However, as I happen to have come without knowing his dislike to being visited, perhaps you will take him my card, and say that, if it is not disagreeable to him, I should like exceedingly to thank him in person for his sermon on the organ last Sunday. He had played an exquisite voluntary in the morning. "'Give my message exactly, if you please,' I said, as I followed the man into the hall. 
"'I will try, sir,' he answered. "'But won't you come upstairs to mistress's room, sir, while I take this to Mr. Stoddart?' "'No, I thank you,' I answered. "'I came to call upon Mr. Stoddart only, and I will wait the result of your mission here in the hall.' The man withdrew, and I sat down on a bench, and amused myself with looking at the portraits about me. I learned afterwards that they had hung, till some thirty years before, in a long gallery connecting the main part of the house with that portion to which the turret, referred to so often in old Weir's story, was attached. One particularly pleased me. It was the portrait of a young woman, very lovely, but with an expression both sad and scared, I think, would be the readiest word to communicate what I mean. It was indubitably, indeed remarkably, like Miss Oldcastle, and I learned afterwards that it was the portrait of Mrs. Oldcastle's grandmother, that very Mrs. Crowfoot mentioned in Weir's story. It had been taken about six months after her marriage, and about as many before her death. The butler returned with the request that I would follow him. He led me up the grand staircase, through a passage at right angles to that which led to the old lady's room, up a narrow circular staircase at the end of the passage, across a landing, then up a straight steep narrow stair upon which two people could not pass without turning sideways, and then squeezing. At the top of this I found myself in a small cylindrical lobby, papered in blocks of stone. There was no door to be seen. It was lighted by a conical skylight. My conductor gave a push against the wall. Certain blocks yielded, and others came forward. In fact, a door revolved on central pivots, and we were admitted to a chamber crowded with books from floor to ceiling, arranged with wonderful neatness and solidity. From the center of the ceiling, whence hung a globular lamp, radiated what I took to be a number of strong beams supporting a floor above. For our ancestors put the ceiling above the beams, instead of below them, as we do, and gained in space if they lost in quietness. But I soon found out my mistake. Those radiating beams were in reality bookshelves, for on each side of those I passed under I could see the gilded backs of books, standing closely ranged together. I had never seen the connivance before, nor I presume was it to be seen anywhere else. "'How does Mr. Stoddart reach those books?' I asked my conductor. "'I don't exactly know, sir,' whispered the butler. "'His own man could tell you, I dare say, but he has a holiday to-day, and I do not think he would explain it either, for he says his master allows no interference with his contrivances. I believe, however, he does not use a ladder. There was no one in the room, and I saw no entrance but that by which we had entered. The next moment, however, a nest of shells revolved in front of me, and there Mr. Stoddart stood with outstretched hand. "'You have found me at last, Mr. Walton, and I am glad to see you,' he said. He led me into an inner room much larger than the one I had passed through. "'I am glad,' I replied, "'that I did not know, till the butler told me, your unwillingness to be intruded upon, for I fear, had I known it, I should have been yet longer a stranger to you.' "'You are no stranger to me. I have heard you read prayers, and I have heard you preach, and I have heard you play.' So you are no stranger to me, either." "'Well, before we say another word,' said Mr. Stoddart, "'I must just say one word about this report of my unsociable disposition. I encourage it. But I am very glad to see you, notwithstanding. Do sit down.' I obeyed, and waited for the rest of his word. I was so bored with visits after I came, visits which were to me utterly uninteresting, that I was only too glad when the unusual nature of some of my pursuits gave rise to the rumor that I was mad. The more people say I am mad, the better pleased I am, so long as they are satisfied with my own mode of shutting myself up, 
and do not attempt to carry out any fancies of their own in regard to my personal freedom. Upon this followed some desultory conversation, during which I took some observations of the room. Like the outer room, it was full of books from floor to ceiling, but the ceiling was divided into compartments, harmoniously colored. "'What a number of books you have!' I observed. "'Not a great many,' he answered. "'But I think there is hardly one of them with which I have not some kind of personal acquaintance. I think I could almost find you any one you wanted in the dark, or in the twilight at least, which would allow me to distinguish whether the top edge was gilt, red, marbled, or uncut. I have bound a couple of hundred or so of them myself. I don't think you could tell the work from a tradesman's. I'll give you a guinea for the poor box, if you pick out three of my binding consecutively." I accepted the challenge, for although I could not bind a book, I considered myself to have a keen eye for the outside finish. After looking over the backs of a great many, I took one down, examined a little further, and presented it. "'You are right. Now try again.' Again I was successful, although I doubted. "'And now for the last,' he said. Once more I was right. "'There is your guinea,' said he, a little mortified. "'No,' I answered, "'I do not feel at liberty to take it, because, to tell the truth, the last was a mere guess, nothing more.' Mr. Stoddart looked relieved. "'You are more honest than most of your profession.' he said. But I am far more pleased to offer you the guinea upon the smallest doubt of your having won it. I have no claim upon it. What? Couldn't you swallow a small scruple like that for the sake of the poor, even? Well, I don't believe you could. Oblige me by taking this guinea for some one or other of your poor people. But I am glad you weren't sure of that last book. I am indeed." I took the guinea, and put it in my purse. But, he resumed, you won't do, Mr. Walton. You're not fit for your profession. You won't tell a lie for God's sake. You won't dodge about a little to keep all right between Jove and his weary parishioners. You won't cheat a little for the sake of the poor. You wouldn't even bamboozle a little at a bazaar. I should not like to boast of my principles, I answered, for the moment one does so they become as the apples of Sodom, but assuredly I would not favor a fiction to keep a world out of hell. The hell that a lie would keep any man out of is doubtless the very best place for him to go to. It is truth, yes, the truth that saves the world. You are right. I dare say you are more sure about it than I am, though. Let us agree where we can, I said. First of all, and that will make us able to disagree where we must without quarreling. Good, he said. Would you like to see my workshop? Very much indeed, I answered heartily. Do you take any pleasure in applied mechanics? I used to do so as a boy, but of course I have little time now for anything of the sort. Ah! of course. He pushed a compartment of books. It yielded, and we entered a small closet. In another moment I found myself leaving the floor, and in yet a moment we were on the floor of an upper room. "'What a nice way of getting upstairs,' I said. "'There is no other way of getting to this room,' answered Mr. Stoddart. "'I built it myself, and there was no room for stairs. This is my shop.' In my library I only read my favorite books. Here I read anything I want to read, write anything I want to write, bind my books, invent machines, and amuse myself generally. Take a chair. I obeyed, and began to look about me. The room had many books in detached bookcases. There were various benches against the walls between, one a bookbinder's, another a carpenter's, a third had a turning lathe, a fourth had an iron vice fixed on it, and was evidently used for working in metal, 
Besides these, for it was a large room, there were several tables with chemical apparatus upon them, Florence flasks, retorts, sand baths, and such like, while in a corner stood a furnace. "'What an accumulation of ways and means you have about you,' I said. "'And all apparently to different ends.' "'All to the same end, if my object were understood. "'I presume I must ask no questions as to that object?' "'It would take time to explain. "'I have theories of education. "'I think a man has to educate himself into harmony. "'Therefore, he must open every possible window "'by which the influences of all may come in upon him. "'I do not think any man complete without a perfect development of his mechanical faculties, for instance, and I encourage them to develop themselves into such windows. I do not object to your theory, provided you do not put it forward as a perfect scheme of human life. If you did, I should have some questions to ask you about it, lest I should misunderstand you. He smiled what I took for a self-satisfied smile. There was nothing offensive in it but it left me without anything to reply to. No embarrassment followed, however, for a rustling motion in the room the same instant attracted my attention, and I saw, to my surprise, and I must confess a little to my confusion, Miss Oldcastle. She was seated in a corner, reading from a quarto, lying upon her knees. "'Oh! You didn't know my niece was here!' To tell the truth, I forgot her when I brought you up, else I would have introduced you." "'That is not necessary, uncle,' said Miss Oldcastle, closing her book. I was by her instantly. She slipped the quarto from her knee, and took my offered hand. "'Are you fond of old books?' I said, not having anything better to say. "'Some old books,' she answered. "'May I ask what book you were reading?' "'I will answer you, under protest,' she said with a smile. "'I withdraw the question at once,' I returned. "'I will answer it notwithstanding. "'It is a volume of Jacob Beam. "'Do you understand him?' "'Yes. "'Don't you?' "'Well, I have made but little attempt,' I answered. "'Indeed, it was only as I passed through London last "'that I bought his works, "'and I am sorry to find that one of the plates "'is missing from my copy.' Which plate is it? It is not very easy, I understand, to procure a perfect copy. One of my uncle's copies has no two volumes bound alike. Each must have belonged to a different set. I can't tell you what the plate is, but there are only three of those very curious unfolding ones in my third volume, and there should be four. I do not think so. Indeed, I am sure you are wrong. I am glad to hear it, though to be glad that the world does not possess what I thought I only was deprived of, is selfishness, covered over as one may with the fiction of a perfect copy. I don't know, she returned, without any response to what I said. I should always like things perfect myself. Doubtless, I answered, and thought it better to try another direction. How was Mrs. Oldcastle? I asked, feeling in its turn the reproach of hypocrisy. For though I could have suffered, I hope, in my person and goods and reputation, to make that woman other than she was, I could not say that I cared one atom whether she was in health or not. Possibly I should have preferred the latter member of the alternative. For the suffering of the lower nature is as a fire that drives the higher nature upwards. So I felt rather hypocritical when I asked Miss Oldcastle after her. "'Quite well, thank you,' she answered, in a tone of indifference, which implied either that she saw through me, or shared in my indifference. I could not tell which. "'And how is Miss Judy?' I inquired. "'A little savage, as usual. Not the worse for her wetting, I hope. Oh, dear, no! There never was health to equal that child's. It belongs to her savage nature.' I wish some of us were more of savages, then, I returned, for I saw signs of exhaustion in her eyes which moved my sympathy. You don't mean me, Mr. Walton, I hope, for if you do, I assure you, your interest is quite thrown away. 
Uncle will tell you I am as strong as an elephant. But here came a slight elevation of her person, and a shadow at the same moment passed over her face. I saw that she felt she ought not to have allowed herself to become the subject of conversation. Meantime her uncle was busy at one of his benches filing away at a piece of brass fixed in the vice. He had thick gloves on, and, indeed, it had puzzled me before to think how he could have so many kinds of work, and yet keep his hands so smooth and white as they were. I could not help thinking the results could hardly be of the most useful description if they were all accomplished without some loss of whiteness and smoothness in the process. Even the feet that keep the garments clean must be washed themselves in the end. When I glanced away from Miss Oldcastle in the embarrassment produced by the repulsion of her last manner, I saw Judy in the room. At the same moment Miss Oldcastle rose. "'What is the matter, Judy?' she said. Chapter 9, Part 2 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald Chapter 9, Part 2 Miss Oldcastle left the room, and Judy turned to me. "'How do you do, Mr. Walton?' she said. "'Quite well, thank you, Judy,' I answered. "'Your uncle admits you to his workshop, then?' "'Yes, indeed. He would feel rather dull sometimes without me, wouldn't you, Uncle Stoddart?' <laughs> "'Just as the horses in the field would feel dull without the gadfly, Judy,' said Mr. Stoddart, laughing. Judy, however, did not choose to receive the laugh as a scolium explanatory of the remark, and was gone in a moment, leaving Mr. Stoddart and myself alone. I must say he looked a little troubled at the precipitate retreat of the damsel, but he recovered himself with a smile, and said to me, "'I wonder what speech I shall make next to drive you away, Mr. Walton.' "'I am not so easily got rid of, Mr. Stoddart,' I answered. And as for taking offence, I don't like it, and therefore I never take it. But tell me what you are doing now. I have been working for some time at an attempt after a perpetual motion, but I must confess, more from a metaphysical or logical point of view than a mechanical one. Here he took a drawing from a shelf explanatory of his plan. You see, he said, here is a top made of platinum, the heaviest of metals, except iridium, which it would be impossible to procure enough of, and which would be difficult to work into the proper shape. It is surrounded, you will observe, by an air-tight receiver communicating by this tube with a powerful air-pump. The plate upon which the point of the top rests and revolves is a diamond and I ought to have mentioned that the peg of the top is a diamond likewise. This is, of course, for the sake of reducing the friction. By this apparatus communicating with the top through the receiver, I set the top in motion, after exhausting the air as far as possible. Still there is the difficulty of the friction of the diamond point upon the diamond plate, which must ultimately occasion repose. To obviate this, I have constructed here underneath a small steam-engine which shall cause the diamond plate to revolve at precisely the same rate of speed as the top itself. This, of course, will prevent all friction. Not that with the unavoidable remnant of air, however, I ventured to suggest. That is just my weak point, he answered. But that will be so very small. Yes, but enough to deprive the top of perpetual motion. But suppose I could get over that difficulty. Would the contrivance have a right 
to the name of a perpetual motion? For you observe that the steam-engine below would not be the cause of the motion. That comes from above, here, and is withdrawn, finally withdrawn. I understand perfectly, I answered. At least I think I do. But I return the question to you. Is a motion which, although not caused, is enabled by another motion, worthy of the name of a perpetual motion? Seeing the perpetuity of motion has not to do merely with time, but with the indwelling of self-generated power, renewing itself constantly with the process of exhaustion. He threw down his vial on the bench. "'I fear you are right,' he said. "'But you will allow it would have made a very pretty machine.' "'Pretty I will allow,' I answered, "'as distinguished from beautiful, "'for I can never dissociate beauty from use.' "'You say that, with all the poetic things you say in your sermons, "'for I am a sharp listener, and none the less such that you do not see me. "'I have a loophole for seeing you, and I flatter myself, therefore, "'I am the only person in the congregation on a level with you in respect of balancing advantages. "'I cannot contradict you, and you cannot address me.' "'Do you mean, then, that whatever is poetical is useless?' I asked. "'Do you assert that whatever is useful is beautiful?' he retorted. "'A full reply to your question would need a ream of paper and a quarter of quills,' I answered. "'But I think I may venture so far as to say that whatever subserves a noble end must in itself be beautiful.' Then a gallows must be beautiful, because it subserves the noble end of ridding the world of malefactors?" he returned promptly. I had to think for a moment before I could reply. "'I do not see anything noble in the end,' I answered. "'If the machine got rid of malefaction, it would indeed have a noble end, but if it only compels it to move on, as a constable does from this world into another, I do not, I say, see anything so noble in that end. The gallows cannot be beautiful." "'Ah! I see you don't approve of capital punishments.' "'I do not say that. An inevitable necessity is something very different from a noble end. To cure the diseased mind is the noblest of ends. To make the sinner forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, the loftiest of designs, but to punish him for being wrong, however necessary it may be for others, cannot, if dissociated from the object of bringing good out of evil, be called in any sense a noble end. I think now, however, it would be but fair in you to give me some answer to my question. Do you think the poetic useless? I think it is very like my machine. It may exercise the faculties without subserving any immediate progress. It is so difficult to get out of the region of the poetic that I cannot think it other than useful. It is so widespread. The useless could hardly be so nearly universal. But I should like to ask you another question. What is the immediate effect of anything poetic upon your mind? Pleasure he answered. And is pleasure good or bad? Sometimes the one, sometimes the other. In itself? I should say so. I should not. Are you not, then, by your very profession, more or less an enemy of pleasure? On the contrary, I believe that pleasure is good, and does good, and urges to good. Care is the evil thing. Strange doctrine for a clergyman. Now do not misunderstand me, Mr. Stoddart. That might not hurt you, but it would distress me. Pleasure obtained by wrong is poison and horror, but it is not the pleasure that hurts, it is the wrong that is in it that hurts. The pleasure hurts only as it leads to more wrong. I almost think myself that if you could make everybody happy, half the evil would vanish from the earth. 
But you believe in God? I hope in God I do. How can you then think that he would not destroy evil at such a cheap and pleasant rate? Because he wants to destroy all the evil, not the half of it, and destroy it so that it shall not grow again, which it would be sure to do very soon if it had no antidote but happiness. As soon as men got used to happiness they would begin to sin again, and so lose it all. But care is distrust. I wonder now if ever there was a man who did his duty, and took no thought. I wish I could get the testimony of such a man. Has anybody actually tried the plan? But here I saw that I was not taking Mr. Stoddart with me, as the old phrase was, the reason I supposed to be that he had never been troubled with much care. But there remained the question whether he trusted in God or the bank. I went back to the original question. But I should be very sorry you should think that to give pleasure was my object in saying poetic things in the pulpit. If I do so, it is because true things come to me in their natural garments of poetic forms. What you call the poetic is only the outer beauty that belongs to all inner or spiritual beauty, just as a lovely face, mind I say lovely, not pretty, not handsome, is the outward and visible presence of a lovely mind. Therefore, saying I cannot dissociate beauty from use, I am free to say as many poetic things, though mind I don't claim them. You attribute them to me, as shall be of the highest use, namely, to embody and reveal the true. But a machine has material use for its end. The most grotesque machine I ever saw that did something— I felt to be in its own kind beautiful, as God called many fierce and grotesque things good when he made the world, good for their good end. But your machine does nothing more than raise the metaphysical doubt and question whether it can with propriety be called a perpetual motion or not. To this Mr. Stoddart making no reply, I take the opportunity of the break in our conversation to say to my readers, that I know there was no satisfactory following out of an argument on either side in the passage of words I have just given. Even the closest reasoner finds it next to impossible to attend to all the suggestions in his own mind, not one of which he is willing to lose to attend at the same time to everything his antagonist says or suggests, that he may do him justice, and to keep an even course towards his goal each having the opposite goal in view. In fact, an argument, however simply conducted and honorable, must just resemble a game at football, the unfortunate question being the ball, and the numerous and sometimes conflicting thoughts which arise in each mind forming the two parties whose energies are spent in a succession of kicks. In fact, I don't like argument, and I don't care for the victory. If I had my way, I would never argue at all. I would spend my energy in setting forth what I believe, as like itself as I could represent it, and so leave it to work its own way, which, if it be the right way, it must work in the right mind. For wisdom is justified of her children. While no one who loves the truth can be other than anxious, that if he has spoken the evil thing it may return to him void, that is a defeat he may well pray for. To succeed in the wrong is the most dreadful punishment to a man who, in the main, is honest. But I beg to assure my reader I could write a long treatise on the matter between Mr. Stoddart and myself. Therefore, if he is not yet interested in such questions, let him be thankful to me for considering such a treatise out of place here. I will only say in brief that I believe with all my heart that the true is the beautiful, and that nothing evil can be other than ugly. If it seems not so, it is in virtue of some good mingled with the evil, and not in the smallest degree in virtue of the evil. I thought it was time for me to take my leave, but I could not bear to run away with the last word, as it were, 
So I said, "'You put plenty of poetry yourself into that voluntary you played last Sunday. I am so much obliged to you for it.' "'Oh, that fugue! You liked it, did you?' "'More than I can tell you. I am very glad.' Do you know those two lines of Milton in which he describes such a performance on the organ? No. Can you repeat them? His volant touch, instinct through all proportions, low and high, fled and pursued transverse the resonant fugue. That is wonderfully fine. Thank you. That is better than my fugue by a good deal. You have cancelled the obligation. Do you think doing a good turn again is cancelling an obligation? I don't think an obligation can ever be returned in the sense of being got rid of. But I am being hypercritical. Not at all. Shall I tell you what I was thinking of while playing that fugue? I should like very much to hear. I had been thinking while you were preaching of the many fancies men had worshipped for the truth. Now following this, now following that, never believing they were on the point of laying hold upon her, and going down to the grave empty-handed as they came. And empty-hearted, too? I asked. But he went on without heeding me. And I saw a vision of multitudes following, following where nothing was to be seen with arms outstretched in all directions, some clasping vacancy to their bosoms, some reaching on tiptoe over the heads of their neighbors, and some with hanging heads, and hands clasped behind their backs, retiring hopeless from the chase. Strange, I said, for I felt so full of hope while you played, that I never doubted it was hope you meant to express. So I do not doubt I did, for the multitude was full of hope, vain hope, to lay hold upon the truth. And you, being full of the main expression, and in sympathy with it, did not heed the undertones of disappointment, or the sighs of those who turned their backs on the chase. Just so it is in life. I am no musician, I returned, to give you a musical counter to your picture. But I see a grave man tilling the ground in peace, and the form of truth standing behind him, and folding her wings closer and closer over and around him, as he works on at his day's labor. "'Very pretty,' said Mr. Stoddart, and said no more. "'Suppose,' I went on, "'that a person knows that he has not laid hold on the truth.' Is that sufficient ground for his making any further assertion than that he has not found it? No, but if he has tried hard, and has not found anything that he can say is true, he cannot help thinking that most likely there is no such thing. Suppose, I said, that nobody has found the truth, is that sufficient ground for saying that nobody ever will find it? or that there is no such thing as truth to be found? Are the ages so nearly done that no chance yet remains? Surely if God has made us to desire the truth, He has got some truth to cast into the gulf of that desire. Shall God create hunger, and no food? But possibly a man may be looking the wrong way for it. You may be using the microscope when you ought to open both eyes and lift up your head. Or a man may be finding some truth which is feeding his soul when he does not think he is finding any. You know the fairy queen. Think how long the Red Cross Knight travelled with the Lady Truth, Una, you know, without learning to believe in her. And how much longer still without ever seeing her face. For my part, may God give me strength to follow till I die. Only I will venture to say this that it is not by any agony of the intellect that I expect to discover her. Mr. Stoddart sat drumming silently with his fingers, a half-smile on his face, and his eyes raised at an angle of forty-five degrees. I felt that the enthusiasm with which I had spoken was thrown away upon him. 
but I was not going to be ashamed, therefore. I would put some faith in his best nature. "'But does not,' he said gently, lowering his eyes upon mine after a moment's pause, "'does not your choice of a profession imply that you have not to give chase to a fleeting phantom? Do you not profess to have and hold, and therefore teach the truth?' I profess only to have caught glimpses of her white garments, those, I mean, of the abstract truth of which you speak. But I have seen that which is eternally beyond her, the ideal in the real, the living truth, not the truth that I can think, but the truth that thinks itself, that thinks me, that God is thought, yea, that God is, the truth being true to itself, and to God, and to man. Christ Jesus, my Lord, who knows, and feels, and does the truth. I have seen him, and I am both content and unsatisfied, for in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Thomas a Kempis says, He to whom the eternal word speaks is set free from a press of opinions. I rose and held out my hand to Mr. Stoddart. He rose likewise, and took it kindly, conducted me to the room below, and, ringing the bell, committed me to the care of the butler. As I approached the gate, I met Jane Rogers coming back from the village. I stopped and spoke to her. Her eyes were very red. "'Nothing amiss at home, Jane,' I said. "'No, sir, thank you,' answered Jane, and burst out crying. "'What is the matter, then? Is your—' "'Nothing's the matter with nobody, sir.' "'Something is the matter with you. "'Yes, sir, but I'm quite well. "'I don't want to pry into your affairs, "'but if you think I can be of any use to you, "'mind you come to me.' "'Thank you kindly, sir,' said Jane, "'and dropping a curtsy, walked on with her basket. "'I went to her parents' cottage.' As I came near the mill, the young miller was standing in the door with his eyes fixed on the ground, while the mill went on hopping behind him. But when he caught sight of me, he turned and went in as if he had not seen me. "'Has he been behaving ill to Jane?' thought I. As he evidently wished to avoid me, I passed the mill without looking in at the door, as I was in the habit of doing, and went on to the cottage where I lifted the latch and walked in. Both the old people were there, and both looked troubled, though they welcomed me none the less kindly. "'I met Jane,' I said, and she looked unhappy, so I came on to hear what was the matter. "'You oughtn't to be troubled with our small affairs,' said Mrs. Rogers. "'If the parson wants to know, why the parson must be told,' said old Rogers smiling cheerily, as if he at least would be relieved by telling me. "'I don't want to know,' I said, "'if you don't want to tell me. But can I be of any use?' "'I don't think you can, sir. Leastways, I'm afraid not,' said the old woman. "'I am sorry to say, sir, that Master Brownrigg and his son has come to words about our Jane. "'And it's not agreeable to have folks's daughter quarrelled over in that way.' said old Rogers. "'What'll be the upshot on it, I don't know, but it looks bad now, for the father he tells the son that if ever he hear of him saying one word to our Jane, out of the mill he goes, as sure as his name's Dick. Now it's rather a good chance, I think, to see what the young fellow's made of, sir, so I tells my old woman here, and so I told Jane, but neither on em seems to see the comfort of it somehow.' "'But the New Testament do say a man shall leave father and mother, and cleave to his wife.' "'But she ain't his wife yet,' said Mrs. Rogers to her husband, whose drift was not yet evident. "'No more she can be, except he leaves his father for her. "'And what'll become of them, then, without the mill?' "'You and me never had no mill, old woman,' said Rogers. "'Yet here we be, very nearly ripe now, ain't us, wife?' "'Meddler like old Rogers, I doubt, rotten before we're ripe,' replied his wife, 
quoting a more humorous than refined proverb. "'Nay, nay, old woman, don't ye say so. The Lord won't let us rot before we're ripe, anyhow. That I be sure on.' "'But anyhow, it's all very well to talk. Thou knows how to talk, Rogers. But how will it be when the children comes, and no mill?' "'To grind em in, old woman?' Mrs. Rogers turned to me, who was listening with real interest and much amusement. "'I wish you would speak a word to old Rogers, sir. He never will speak as he's spoken to. He's always over-merry or over-serious. He either takes me up short with a sermon, or he laughs me out of countenance that I don't know where to look.' Now I was pretty sure that Rogers's conduct was simple consistency, and that the difficulty arose from his always acting upon one or two of the plainest principles of truth and right. Whereas his wife, good woman, for the bad old leaven of the Pharisees could not rise much in her somehow, was always reminding him of certain precepts of behavior to the oblivion of principles. A bird in the hand, etc., Mary in haste, etc., when want comes in at the door, love flies out at the window, were amongst her favorite sayings, although not one of them was supported by her own experience. For instance, she had married in haste herself, and never, I believe, had once thought of repenting it, although she had had far more than the requisite leisure for doing so, and many was the time that want had come in at her door, and the first thing it always did was to clip the wings of love and make him less flighty, and more tender and serviceable. So I could not even pretend to read her husband a lecture. "'He's a curious man, old Rogers,' I said. "'But as far as I can see, he's in the right, in the main. Isn't he now?' "'Oh, yes, I dare say. I think he's always right about the rights of the thing, you know. But a body may go too far that way. It won't do to starve, sir.' strange confusion, or, ought I not rather to say, ordinary and commonplace confusion of ideas. "'I don't think,' I said, "'any one can go too far in the right way.' "'That's just what I want my old woman to see, and I can't get it into her, sir. If a thing's right, it's right, and if a thing's wrong, why wrong it is. The helm must be either to starboard or port, sir.' "'But why talk of starving?' I said. "'Can't Dick work? Who could think of starting that nonsense?' "'Why, my old woman here, she wants him to give it up and wait for better times. The fact is, she don't want to lose the girl.' "'But she hasn't got her at home now. She can have her when she wants her, though leastways after a bit of warning, whereas if she was married and the consequences of follerin' At her heels, like a man of war with her convoy, she would find she was chartered for another port, she would. Well, you see, sir, Rogers and me's not so young as we once was, and we're likely to be growing older every day, and if there's a difficulty in the way of Jane's marriage, why, I take it as a godsend. How would you have liked such a godsend, Mrs. Rogers, when you were going to be married to your sailor here? What would you have done? Why, whatever he liked, to be sure. But then, you see, Dick's not my Rogers. But your daughter thinks about him much in the same way as you did about this dear old man here when he was young. Young people may be in the wrong. I see nothing in Dick Brownrigg. But young people may be right sometimes, and old people may be wrong sometimes. I can't be wrong about Rogers. No, but you may be wrong about Dick. Don't you trouble yourself about my old woman, sir. She allus was awkward in stays, but she never missed them yet. When she said her say, round she comes in the wind like a bird, sir. There's a good old man to stick up for your old wife. Still, I say, they may as well wait a bit. It would be a pity to anger the old gentleman. What does the young man say to it? Why, he says like a man he can work for her, as well's the mill, and he's ready if she is. I am very glad to hear such a good account of him. I shall look in and have a little chat with him. I always liked the look of him. 
"'Good morning, Mrs. Rogers.' "'I'll see you across the stream, sir,' said the old man, following me out of the house. "'You see, sir,' he resumed as soon as we were outside, "'I'm always afeard of taking things out of the Lord's hands. It's the right way, surely, that when a man loves a woman, and has told her so, he should act like a man and do as is right. And isn't that the Lord's way? And can't he give them what's good for them?' Mayhap they won't love each other the less in the end if Dick has a little bit of the hard work that many a man that the Lord loved none the less has had before him. I wouldn't like to anger the old gentleman, as my wife says, but if I was Dick, I know what I would do. But don't you think hard on for my wife, sir, for I believe there's a bit of pride in it. She's afeard of being supposed to catch at Richard Brownrigg, because he's above us, you know, sir and I can't altogether blame her, only we ain't got to do with the look of things, but with the things themselves. I understand you quite, and I'm very much of your mind. You can trust me to have a little chat with him, can't you? That I can, sir. Here we had come to the boundary of his garden, the busy stream that ran away, as if it was scared at the labor it had been compelled to go through, and was now making the best of its speed back to its mother ocean, to tell sad tales of a world where every little brook must do some work ere it gets back to its rest. I bade him good day, jumped across it, and went into the mill, where Richard was tying the mouth of a sack, as gloomily as the brothers of Joseph must have tied their sacks after his silver cup had been found. "'Why did you turn away from me as I passed half an hour ago, Richard?' I said cheerily. I beg your pardon, sir, I didn't think you saw me. But supposing I hadn't? But I won't tease you. I know all about it. Can I do anything for you? No, sir. You can't move my father. It's no use talking to him. He never hears a word anybody says. He never hears a word you say, a Sunday, sir. He won't even believe the Mark Lane Express about the price of corn. It's no use talking to him, sir. You wouldn't mind if I were to try? No, sir, you can't make matters worse, no more than you can make them any better, sir. I don't say I shall talk to him, but I may try it if I find a fitting opportunity. He's always worse, more obstinate, that is, when he's in a good temper. So you may choose your opportunity wrong. But it's all the same. It can make no difference. What are you going to do, then? I would let him do his worst, but Jane doesn't like to go against her mother. I'm sure I can't think how she should side with my father against both of us. He never laid her under any such obligation, I'm sure. There may be more ways than one of accounting for that. You must mind, however, and not be too hard upon your father. You're quite right in holding fast to the girl, but mind that vexation does not make you unjust. I wish my mother were alive. She was the only one that ever could manage him. How she contrived to do it nobody could think. But manage him she did, somehow or other. There's not a husk of use in talking to him. I dare say he prides himself on not being moved by talk. But has he ever had a chance of knowing Jane, of seeing what kind of a girl she is? He's seen her over and over. But seeing isn't always believing. It certainly isn't with him. If he could only know her. But don't you be too hard upon him. And don't do anything in a hurry. Give him a little time, you know. Mrs. Rogers won't interfere between you and Jane, I am pretty sure. But don't push matters till we see. Good-bye. Good-bye, and thank you kindly, sir. Ain't I to see Jane in the meantime? If I were you, I would make no difference. See her as often as you used, which I suppose was as often as you could. I don't think, I say, that her mother will interfere. Her father is all on your side. I called on Mr. Brownrigg, but as his son had forewarned me, I could make nothing of him. He didn't see when the mill was his property, and Dick was his son, why he shouldn't have his way with them. And he was going to have his way with them. His son might marry any lady in the land, 
and he wasn't going to throw himself away that way. I will not weary my readers with the conversation we had together. All my missiles of argument were lost, as it were, in a bank of mud, the weight and resistance of which they only increased. My experience in the attempt, however, did a little to reconcile me to his going to sleep in church, for I saw that it would make little difference whether he was asleep or awake. He, and not Mr. Stoddart, in his organ sentry-box, was the only person whom it was absolutely impossible to preach to. You might preach at him. But to him? No. End of Chapter Ten of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter Ten My Christmas Party. As Christmas Day drew nearer and nearer, my heart glowed with the more gladness, and the question came more and more pressingly. Could I not do something to make it more really a holiday of the church for my parishioners, that most of them would have a little more enjoyment on it than they had all the year through? I had ground to hope, but I wanted to connect this gladness, in their minds, I mean, for who could dissever them, in fact, with its source, the love of God, that love manifested unto men in the birth of the human babe, the son of man. But I would not interfere with the Christmas day at home. I resolved to invite as many of my parishioners as would come to spend Christmas Eve at the vicarage. I therefore had a notice to that purport affixed to the church door, and resolved to send out no personal invitation whatever, so that I might not give offence by accidental omission. The only person thrown into perplexity by this mode of proceeding was Mrs. Pearson. How many am I to provide for, sir? she said, with an injured air. For as many as you ever saw in church at one time, I said and if there should be too much, why so much the better. It can go to make Christmas Day the merrier at some of the poorer houses. She looked discomposed, for she was not of an easy temper, but she never acted from her temper. She only looked or spoke from it. I shall want help, she said at length. As much as you like, Mrs. Pearson, I can trust you entirely. Her face brightened, and the end showed that I had not trusted her amiss. I was a little anxious about the result of the invitation, partly as indicating the amount of confidence my people placed in me. But although no one said a word to me about it beforehand, except old Rogers, as soon as the hour arrived, the people began to come, and the first I welcomed was Mr. Brownrigg. I had had all the rooms on the ground floor prepared for their reception. Tables of provision were set out in every one of them. My visitors had tea or coffee, with plenty of bread and butter, when they arrived and the more solid supplies were reserved for a later part of the evening. I soon found myself with enough to do, but before long I had a very efficient staff, for after having had occasion, once or twice, to mention something of my plans for the evening, I found my labors gradually diminish, and yet everything seemed to go right, the fact being that good Mr. Boulderstone, in one part, had cast himself into the middle of the flood, and stood there immovable, both in face and person, turning its waters into the right channel, namely, towards the barn, which I had fitted up for their reception in a body, while in another quarter, namely, in the barn, Dr. Duncan was doing his best, and that was simply something first-rate, to entertain the people till all should be ready. From a kind of instinct these gentlemen had taken upon them to be my staff, almost without knowing it, and very grateful I was. I found, too, that they soon gathered some of the young and more active spirits about them, whom they employed in various ways for the good of the community. When I came in and saw the goodly assemblage, for I had been busy receiving them in the house, I could not help rejoicing that my predecessor had been so fond of farming that he had rented land in the neighborhood of the vicarage and built this large barn, in which I could make a hall to entertain my friends. The night was frosty, the stars shining brightly overhead, so that, especially for country people, 
there was little danger in the short passage to be made to it from the house but if necessary i resolved to have a covered way built before next time for how can a man be the person of a parish if he never entertains his parishioners and really though it was lighted only with candles round the walls and i had not been able to do much for the decoration of the place i thought it looked very well and my heart was glad that christmas eve just as if the babe had been coming again to us that same night and is he not always coming to us afresh in every childlike feeling that awakes in the hearts of his people i walked about amongst them greeting them and greeted everywhere in turn with a kind of smiles and hearty shakes of the head as often as i paused in my communications for a moment it was amusing to watch mr boulderstone's honest though awkward endeavours to be at ease with his inferiors but dr duncan was just a sight worth seeing very tall and very stately he was talking now to this old man now to that young woman and every face glistened towards which he turned there was no condescension about him he was as polite and courteous to one as to another and the smile that every now and then lighted up his old face was genuine and sympathetic no one could have known by his behaviour that he was not at court and i thought surely even the contact with such a man will do something to refine the taste of my people i felt more certain than ever that a free mingling of all the classes would do more than anything else towards binding us all into a wise patriotic nation it would tend to keep down that foolish emulation which makes one class ape another from afar like ben jonson's fugoso still lighting short of suit would refine the roughness of the rude and enable the polished to see with what safety his just share in public matters might be committed into the hands of the honest workman if we could once leave it to each other to give what honour is due knowing that honour demanded is as worthless as insult undeserved is hurtless what is one to do to honour himself that is and can be no honour when one has learned to seek the honour that cometh from god only he will take the withholding of the honour that comes from men very quietly indeed the only thing that disappointed me was that there was no one there to represent oldcastle hall but how could i have everything a success at once and catherine weir was likewise absent after we had spent a while in pleasant talk and when i thought nearly all were with us i got up on a chair at the end of the barn and said kind friends i am very grateful to you for honouring my invitation as you have done permit me to hope that this meeting will be the first of many and that from it may grow the yearly custom in this parish of gathering in love and friendship upon christmas eve when god comes to man man looks round for his neighbour when man departed from god in the garden of eden the only man in the world ceased to be the friend of the only woman in the world and instead of seeking to bear her burden became her accuser to god in whom he saw only the judge unable to perceive that the infinite love of the father had come to punish him in tenderness and grace but when god in jesus comes back to men brothers and sisters spread forth their arms to embrace each other and so to embrace him this is when he is born again in our souls for dear friends what we all need is just to become little children like him to cease to be careful about many things and trust in him seeking only that he should rule and that we should be made good like him what else is meant by seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you instead of doing so we seek the things god has promised to look after for us and refuse to seek the thing he wants us to seek a thing that cannot be given us except we seek it we profess to think jesus the grandest and most glorious of men and yet hardly care to be like him and so when we are offered his spirit that is his very nature within us for the asking we will hardly take the trouble to ask for it but to-night at least let all unkind thoughts all hard judgments of one another all selfish desires after our own way be put from us that we may welcome the babe into our very bosoms that when he comes amongst us for he is not like a child still meek and lowly of heart he may not be troubled to find that we are quarrelsome and selfish and unjust i came down from the chair and mr brownrigg being the nearest of my guests and wide awake for he had been standing and had indeed been listening to every word according to his ability i shook hands with him and positively there was some meaning in the grasp with which he returned mine i am not going to record all the proceedings of the evening but i think it may be interesting to my readers to know something of how we spent it 
First of all, we sang a hymn about the Nativity, and then I read an extract from a book of travels, describing the interior of an eastern cottage, probably much resembling the inn in which our Lord was born, the stable being scarcely divided from the rest of the house. For I felt that to open the inner eyes even of the brain, enabling people to see, in some measure, the reality of the old lovely story, to help them to have what the Scotch philosophers call a true conception of the external conditions and circumstances of the events, might help to open the yet deeper spiritual eyes which alone can see the meaning and truth dwelling in and giving shape to the outward facts. And the extract was listened to with all the attention I could wish, except at first from some youngsters at the farther end of the barn, who became, however, perfectly still as I proceeded. After this followed the conversation, in which I talked a good deal to Jane Rogers, paying her particular attention indeed, with the hope of a chance of bringing old Mr. Brownrigg and her together in some way. "'How is your mistress, Jane?' I said. "'Quite well, sir, thank you. I only wish she was here. I wish she were here. Perhaps she will come next year.' "'I think she will. I am almost sure she would have liked to come to-night, for I heard her say—' "'I beg your pardon, Jane, for interrupting you. "'But I'd rather not be told anything you may have happened to overhear,' I said, in a low voice. "'Oh, sir,' returned Jane, blushing a dark crimson, "'it wasn't anything particular. "'Still, if it was anything on which a wrong conjecture might be built, "'I wanted to soften it to her. "'It is better that one should not be told it. "'Thank you for your kind intention, though. "'And now, Jane,' I said, "'will you do me a favor? Well, "'That I will, sir, if I can.' Sing that Christmas carol I heard you sing last night to your mother. I didn't know anyone was listening, sir. I know you did not. I came to the door with your father, and we stood and listened. She looked very frightened, but I would not have asked her had I not known that she could sing like a bird. I am afraid I shall make a fool of myself, she said. We should all be willing to run that risk for the sake of others, I answered. I will try then, sir. So she sang and her clear voice soon silenced the speech all around. Babe Jesus lay on Mary's lap, the sun shone in his hair, and so it was she saw mayhap the crown already there. For she sang, Sleep on, my little king, bed Herod dares not come. Before thee, sleeping, holy thing, wild winds would soon be dumb. I kiss thy hands, I kiss thy feet, my king so long desired. Thy hand shall never be soiled, my sweet, thy feet shall never be tired. For thou art the king of men, my son, thy crown I see it plain, and men shall worship thee, every one, and cry, Glory, Amen. Babe Jesus opened his eyes so wide, and Mary looked her Lord, and Mary stinted her among and sighed, Babe Jesus and said never a word. When Jane had done singing, I asked her where she had learned the carol, and she answered, My mistress gave it to me. There was a picture to it of the baby on his mother's knee. I never saw it, I said. Where did you get that tune? I thought it would go with the tune I knew, and I tried it, and it did. But I was not fit to sing to you, sir. You must have quite a gift of song, Jane, I said. My father and mother can both sing. Mr. Brownrigg was seated on the other side of me and had apparently listened with some interest. His face was ten degrees less stupid than it usually was. I fancied I saw even a glimmer of some satisfaction in it. I turned to Old Rogers. Sing us a song, Old Rogers, I said. I'm no canary at that, sir, and besides, my singing days be over. I'd advise you to ask Dr. Duncan there. He can sing. I rose and said to the assembly, My friends, if I did not think God was pleased to see us enjoying ourselves, I should have no heart for it myself. I'm going to ask our dear friend Dr. Duncan to give us a song. If you please, Dr. Duncan. I am very nearly too old, said the doctor, but I will try. His voice was certainly a little feeble, but the song was not much the worse for it, and a more suitable one for all the company he could hardly have pitched upon. There is a plow that has no share, but a coulter that parteth keen and fair. But the furrows they rise to a terrible size, or ever the plow hath touched them there. Gainst horses and plow, in wrath they shake. The horses are fierce, but the plow will break. And the seed that is dropped in these furrows of fear will lift to the sun, 
neither blade nor ear down it drops plumb where no spring times come and here there needeth no harrowing gear wheat nor poppy nor any leaf will cover this naked ground of grief but a harvest day will come at last when the watery winter all is past the waves so gray will be shorn away by the angels sickles keen and fast and the buried harvest of the sea stored in the barns of eternity genuine applause followed the good doctor's song i turned to miss boulderstone from whom i had borrowed a piano and asked her to play a country dance for us but first i said not getting up on a chair this time some people think it is not proper for a clergyman to dance i mean to assert my freedom from any such law if our lord chose to represent in his parable of the prodigal son the joy in heaven over a repentant sinner by the figure of music and dancing i will hearken to him rather than to men be they as good as they may for i long thought that the way to make indifferent things bad was for good people not to do them and so saying i stepped up to jane rogers and asked her to dance with me she blushed so dreadfully that for a moment i was almost sorry i had asked her but she put her hand in mine at once and if she was a little clumsy she yet danced very naturally and i had the satisfaction of feeling that i had an honest girl near me who i knew was friendly to me in her heart but to see the faces of the people while i had been talking old rogers had been drinking in every word to him it was milk and strong meat in one but now his face shone with a father's gratification besides and richard's face was glowing too even old brownrigg looked with a curious interest upon us i thought meantime dr duncan was dancing with one of his own patients old mrs trotter to whose wants he ministered far more from his table than his surgery i have known that man hearing of a case of want from his servant send the fowl he was about to dine upon untouched to those whose necessity was greater than his and mr boulderstone had taken out old mrs rogers and young brownrigg had taken mary weir thomas weir did not dance at all but looked on kindly why don't you dance old rogers i said as i placed his daughter in a seat beside him did your honor ever see an elephant go up the futtock shrouds no i never did i thought you must sir to ask me why i don't dance you won't take my fun ill sir i'm an old man o war's man you know sir i should have thought rogers that you would have known better by this time than make such an apology to me god bless you sir an old man safe with you or a young lass either sir he added turning with a smile to his daughter i turned and addressed mr boulderstone i am greatly obliged to you mr boulderstone for the help you have given me this evening i have seen you talking to everybody just as if you had to entertain them all i hope i haven't spoken too much upon me but the fact is somehow or other i don't know how i got into the spirit of it you got into the spirit of it because you wanted to help me and i thank you heartily well i thought it wasn't a time to mind one's p's and q's exactly and really it's wonderful how one gets on without them i hate formality myself the dear fellow was the most formal man i had ever met why don't you dance mr brownrigg who'd care to dance with me sir i don't care to dance with an old woman and a young woman won't care to dance with me i'll find you a partner if you will put yourself in my hands i don't mind trusting myself to you sir so i led him to jane rogers she stood up in respectful awe before the master of her destiny there were signs of calcitration in the churchwarden when he perceived whither i was leading him but when he saw the girl stand trembling before him whether it was that he was flattered by the signs of his own power accepting them as homage or that his hard heart actually softened a little i cannot tell but after just a perceptible hesitation he said come along my lass and let's have a hop together she obeyed very sweetly don't be too shy i whispered to her as she passed me and the church warden danced very heartily with the lady's maid i then asked him to take her into the house and give her something to eat in return for her song he yielded somewhat awkwardly and what passed between them i do not know but when they returned she seemed less frightened at him than when she heard me make the proposal and when the company was parting i heard him to take leave of her with the words give us a kiss my girl and let bygones be bygones which kiss i heard with delight for had i not been a peacemaker in this matter and had i not then a right to feel blessed but the understanding was brought about simply by making the people meet 
compelling them, as it were, to know something of each other really. Hitherto this girl had been a mere name, or phantom at best, to her lover's father, and it was easy for him as to treat her as such, that is, as a mere fancy of his son's. The idea of her had passed through his mind, but with what vividness any idea, notion, or conception could be present to him, my readers must judge from my description of him, so that obstinacy was a ridiculously easy accomplishment to him, for he never had any notion of the matter to which he was opposed, only of that which he favoured. It is very easy indeed for such people to stick to their point. But I took care that we should have dancing in moderation. It would not do for people either to get weary with recreation, or excited with what was not worthy of producing such an effect. Indeed, we had only six country dances during the evening. That was all. And between the dances I read two or three of Wordsworth's ballads to them, and they listened even with more interest than I had been able to hope for. The fact was that the happy and free-hearted mood they were in enabled the judgment. I wish one knew always by what musical spell to produce the right mood for receiving and reflecting a matter as it really is. Every true poem carries this spell with it in its own music, which it sends out before it as a herberger to prepare a harbor or lodging for it. But then it needs a quiet mood first of all, to let this music be listened to. For I thought with myself, if I could get them to like poetry and beautiful things in words, it would not only do them good, but help them to see what is in the Bible, and therefore to love it more. For I never could believe that a man who did not find God in other places, as well as in the Bible, ever found him there at all. And I always thought that to find God in other books enabled us to see clearly that he was more in the Bible than in any other book, or all other books put together. After supper we had a little more singing, and to my satisfaction nothing came to my eyes or ears during the whole evening that was undignified or ill-bred. Of course I knew that many of them must have two behaviors, and that now they were on their good behavior, but I thought that oftener such were put on their good behavior, giving them the opportunity of finding out how nice it was, the better. It might make them ashamed of the other at last. There were many little bits of conversation I overheard, which I should like to give my readers, but I cannot dwell longer upon this part of my annals. Especially I should have enjoyed recording one piece of talk, in which old rogers was evidently trying to move a more directly religious feeling in the mind of dr duncan i thought i could see that the difficulty with the noble old gentleman was one of expression but after all the foremost man was a seer of the kingdom and the other with all his refinement and education and goodness too was but a child in it before we parted i gave to each of my guests a sheet of christmas carols gathered from the older portions of our literature for most of the modern hymns are to my mind neither milk nor meat, mere wretched imitations. There were a few curious words and idioms in these, but I thought it better to leave them as they were, for they might set them inquiring, and give me an opportunity of interesting them further, some time or another, in the history of a word. For, in their ups and downs of fortune, words fare much like human beings. And here is my sheet of carols. And hymn of heavenly love. O blessed well of love! O flower of grace, O glorious morning star, O lamp of light, Most lively image of thy Father's face, Eternal King of glory, Lord of might, Meek Lamb of God, Before all worlds be height. How can we thee requite For all this good, Or what can prize that, Thy most precious blood? Yet naught thou ask'st In lieu of all this love, But love of us, For guerdon of thy pain. I me, What can us less, than that behove. Had he required life of us again? Had it been wrong to ask his own with Cain? He gave us life, he it restored, lost. Then life were least, that us so little cost. But he our life hath left unto us free, free that was thrill, and blessed that was banned. Need naught demands, but that we loveth being. And he himself hath loved us aforehand, and bound thereto with an eternal band. Him first to love that us so dearingly bought, And next our brethren to his image wrought. Him first to love great right and reasonous, Who first to us our life and being gave, And after when we fared had amiss, Us wretches from the second death did save, And last the food of life, which now we have. Even he himself, in his dear sacrament, To feed our hungry souls, 
unto us lent then next to love our brethren that were made of that self mould and that self maker's hand that we into the same again shall fade for they shall have like heritage of land however here on higher steps we stand which also were with self same price redeemed that we however of us light esteemed then rouse thyself o earth out of thy soil in which thou wallowest like to filthy swine and doest thy mind in dirty pleasures moil unmindful of that dearest lord of thine lift up to him thy heavy clouded eyne that thou this sovereign bounty mayest behold and read through love his mercies manifold begin from first where he encradled was in simple cratch wrapped in a wad of hay between the toyful ox and humble ass and in what rags and in how base array the glory of our heavenly riches lay when him the silly shepherds came to see whom greatest princes sought on lowest knee from whence read on the story of his life his humble carriage his unfaulty ways his cankered foes his fights his toil his strife his pains his poverty his sharp essays through which he passed his miserable days offending none and doing good to all yet being maliced both by great and small with all thy heart with all thy soul and mind thou must him love and his behests embrace all other loves with which the world doth blind weak fancies and stir up affections base thou must renounce and utterly displace and give thyself unto him full and free that full and freely gave himself to thee then shall thy ravished soul inspired be with heavenly thoughts fair above humane skill in thy bright radiant eyes shall plainly see the idea of his pure glory present still before thy face that all thy spirit shall fill with sweet enragement of celestial love kindled through sight of those fair things above spencer new prince new pomp behold a silly tender babe in freezing winter night in homely manger trembling lies alas a piteous sight the inns are full no man will yield this little pilgrim bed but forced he is with silly beasts in crib to shroud his head despise him not for lying there first what he is inquire an orient pearl is often found in depth of dirty mire weigh not his crib his wooden dish nor beasts that by him feed weigh not his mother's poor attire nor joseph's simple weed the stable is a prince's court the crib his chair of state the beasts are parcel of his pomp the wooden dish his plate the persons in that poor attire his royal liveries wear the prince himself is come from heaven this pomp is praised there with joy approach o christian wit do homage to thy king and highly praise this humble pomp which he from heaven doth bring southwell a dialogue between three shepherds one where is this blessed babe that hath made all the world so full of joy and expectation that glorious boy that crowns each nation with a triumphant wreath of blessedness two where should he be but in the throng and among his angel ministers that sing and take wing just as many echo to his voice and rejoice when wing and tongue and all may so procure their happiness three but he that hath other waiters now a poor cow an ox and mule stand out behold and wonder that a stable should unfold him that can thunder chorus oh what a gracious god have we how good how great even as our misery jeremy taylor a song of praise from the birth of christ away dark thoughts awake my joy awake my glory sing sing songs to celebrate the birth of jacob's god and king o happy night that brought forth light which makes the blind to see the day spring from on high came down to cheer and visit thee the wakeful shepherds near their flocks were watchful for the morn but better news from heaven was brought your saviour christ is born in bethlehem town the infant lies within a place obscure o little bethlehem poor in walls but rich in furniture since heaven is now come down to earth hither the angels fly hark how the heavenly choir doth sing glory to god on high 
the news is spread the church is glad simeon overcome with joy sings with the infant in his arms now let thy servant die wise men from far behold the star which was their faithful guide until it pointed forth the babe in him they glorified to heaven and earth rejoice and sing shall we our christ deny he's born for us and we for him glory to god on high Chapter 11, Part 1 of the Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter 11, Part 1. Sermon on God and Mammon Chapter 11 Sermon on God and Mammon Part 1 I never asked questions about the private affairs of any of my parishioners, except of themselves individually, upon occasion of their asking me for advice, and some consequent necessity for knowing more than they told me. Hence I believe they became more willing that I should know. But I heard a good many things from others notwithstanding, for I could not be constantly closing the lips of the communicative as I had done those of Jane Rogers. And amongst other things I learned that Miss Oldcastle went most Sundays to the neighboring town of Addishead to church. Now I had often heard of the ability of the rector, and although I had never met him, was prepared to find him a cultivated, if not an original man. Still, if I must be honest, which I hope I must, I confess that I heard the news with a pang, in analyzing which I discovered the chief component to be jealousy. It was no use asking myself why I should be jealous there the ugly thing was so i went and told god i was ashamed and begged him to deliver me from the evil because his was the kingdom and the power and the glory and he took my part against myself for he waits to be gracious perhaps the reader may however suspect a deeper cause for this feeling to which I would rather not give the true name again, than a merely professional one. But there was one stray sheep of my flock that appeared in church for the first time on the morning of Christmas Day, Catherine Weir. She did not sit beside her father, but in the most shadowy corner of the church, near the organ loft, however. She could have seen her father if she had looked up, but she kept her eyes down the whole time, and never even lifted them to me. The spot on one cheek was much brighter than that on the other, and made her look very ill. I prayed to our God to grant me the honor of speaking a true word to them all, which honor I thought I was right in asking, because the Lord reproached the Pharisees for not seeking the honor that cometh from God. Perhaps I may have put a wrong interpretation on the passage. It is, however, a joy to think that he will not give you a stone, even if you should take it for a loaf, and ask for it as such. Nor is he, like the scribes, lying in wait to catch poor erring men in their words or their prayers, however mistaken they may be. I took my text from the Sermon on the Mount. And as the magazine for which these annals were first written was intended chiefly for Sunday reading, I wrote my sermon just as if I were preaching it to my unseen readers, as I spoke it to my present parishioners. And here it is now. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter, and part of the twenty-fourth and twenty-fifth verses. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. 
Therefore I say to you, Take no thought for your life. When the child whose birth we celebrate with glad hearts this day grew up to be a man, he said this. Did he mean it? He never said what he did not mean. Did he mean it wholly? He meant it far beyond what the words could convey. He meant it altogether and entirely. When people do not understand what the Lord says, when it seems to them that his advice is impracticable, instead of searching deeper for a meaning which will be evidently true and wise, they comfort themselves by thinking he could not have meant it altogether, and so leave it. Or they think that if he did mean it, he could not expect them to carry it out, and in fact that they could not do it perfectly if they were to try they take refuge from the duty of trying to do it at all. Or, oftener, they do not think about it at all as anything in the least concerns them. The Son of our Father in Heaven may have become a child, may have led the one life which belongs to every man to lead, may have suffered because we are sinners, may have died for our sakes doing the will of the Father in Heaven, and yet we have nothing to do with the words he spoke out of the midst of his true perfect knowledge, feeling, and action. Is it not strange that it should be so? Let it not be so with us this day. Let us seek to find out what our Lord means, that we may do it, trying and failing and trying again, verily to be victorious at last, what matter when, so long as we are trying and so coming nearer to our end? Mammon, you know, means riches. Now riches are meant to be the slave, not even the servant of man, and not to be the master. If a man serve his own servant, or, in a word, anyone who has no just claim to be his master, he is a slave. But here... He serves his own slave. On the other hand, to serve God, the source of our being, our own glorious Father, is freedom. In fact, is the only way to get rid of all bondage. So you see plainly enough that a man cannot serve God and mammon. For how can a slave of his own slave be the servant of the God of freedom? of him who can have no one to serve him but a free man. His service is freedom. Do not, I pray you, make any confusion between service and slavery. To serve is the highest, noblest calling in creation. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, yea, with himself. But how can a man serve riches? Why, when he says to riches, Ye are my good, when he feels he cannot be happy without them, when he puts forth the energies of his nature to get them, when he schemes and dreams and lies awake about them, when he will not give to his neighbor for fear of becoming poor himself, when he wants to have more and to know he has more, than he can need. When he wants to leave money behind him, not for the sake of his children or relatives, but for the name of the wealth. When he leaves his money, not to those who need it, even of his own relations, but to those who are rich like himself, making them yet more of slaves to the overgrown monster they worship for his size. When he honors those who have money because they have money, irrespective of their character, or when he honors in a rich man that he would not honor in a poor man, then is he the slave of mammon. Still more is he mammon's slave when his devotion to his God makes him oppressive to those over whom his wealth gives him power, or when he becomes unjust in order to add to his stores. How will it be with such a man when on a sudden he finds that the world has vanished and he is alone with God. There lies the body in which he used to live, 
whose poor necessities first made money of value to him but with which itself and its fictitious value are both left behind he cannot now even try to bribe god with a check the angels will not bow down to him because his property as set forth in his will takes five or six figures to express its amount it makes no difference to them that he has lost it though for they never respected him and the poor souls of hades who envied him the wealth they had lost before rise up as one man to welcome him uh, not for love of him no worshipper of mammon loves another but rejoicing in the mischief that has befallen him and saying art thou also become one of us and lazarus in abraham's bosom how ever sorry he may be for him however grateful he may feel to him for the broken victuals and the penny cannot with one drop of water of paradise cool that man's parched tongue alas poor devies poor server of mammon whose vile god can pretend to deliver him no longer or rather for the blockish god never pretended anything it was the man's own doing alas for the poor mammon worshipper he can no longer deceive himself in his riches and so even in hell he is something nobler than he was on earth for he worships his riches no longer he cannot he curses them terrible things to say on christmas day but if christmas day teaches us anything it teaches us to worship god and not mammon to worship spirit and not matter to worship love and not power do i now hear any of my friends saying in their hearts let the rich take that it does not apply to us we are poor enough ah my friends i have known a light-hearted liberal rich man lose his riches and be liberal and light-hearted still i knew a rich lady once in giving a large gift of money to a poor man say apologetically i hope it is no disgrace in me to be rich as it is none in you to be poor it is not the being rich that is wrong but the serving of riches instead of making them serve your neighbor and yourself your neighbor for this life yourself for the everlasting habitations god knows it is hard for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven but the rich man does sometimes enter in for god hath made it possible and the greater the victory when it is the rich man that overcometh the world it is easier for the poor man to enter into the kingdom yet many of the poor have failed to enter in and the greater is the disgrace of their defeat for the poor have more done for them as far as outward things go in the way of salvation than the rich and have a beatitude all to themselves besides for in the making of this world as a school of salvation the poor as the necessary majority have been more regarded than the rich do not think my poor friend that god will let you off he lets nobody off you too must pay the uttermost farthing he loves you too well to let you serve mammon a whit more than your rich neighbor serve mammon do you say how can i serve mammon i have no mammon to serve would you like to have riches a moment sooner than god gives them would you serve mammon if you had him who can tell do you answer leave those questions till i am tried but is there no bitterness in the tone of that response does it not mean it will be a long time before i have a chance of trying that but i am not driven to such questions for the chance of convicting some of you of mammon worship let us look to the text read it again ye cannot serve god and mammon therefore i say unto you take no thought for your life why are you to take no thought 
because you cannot serve God and mammon. Is taking thought then serving of mammon? Clearly. Where are you now, poor man? Brooding over the frost? Will it harden the ground so that the god of the sparrows cannot find food for his sons? Where are you now, poor woman? Sleepless over the empty cupboard and tomorrow's dinner? It is because we have no bread, do you answer? Have you forgotten the five loaves among the five thousand and the fragments that were left? Or do you know nothing of your Father in heaven, who clothes the lilies and feeds the birds? O oh, ye of little faith! O oh, ye poor spirited mammon worshippers, who worship him not even because he has given you anything, but in hope that he may some future day benignantly regard you. But I may be too hard upon you. I know well that our father sees a great difference between the man who is anxious about his children's dinner, or even about his own, and a man who is only anxious to add another ten thousand to his much goods laid up for many years. But you ought to find it easy to trust in God for such matters as your daily bread, whereas no man can by any possibility trust in God for ten thousand pounds. The former need is a God-ordained necessity. The latter desire is a man-devised appetite at best, possibly swinish greed. Tell me, do you long to be rich? Then you worship mammon. Tell me, do you think you would feel safer if you had money in the bank? Then you are mammon worshippers, for you would trust the barn of the rich man rather than the God who makes the corn to grow. Do you say, What shall we eat, and what shall we drink, and wherewithal shall we be clothed? Are ye thus of doubtful mind? Then you are mammon worshippers. But how is the work of the world to be done if we take no thought? We are nowhere told not to take thought. We must take thought. The question is, what are we to take or not to take thought about? By some who do not know God, little work would be done if they were not driven by anxiety of some kind. But you, friends, are you content to go with the nations of the earth, or do you seek a better way, the way that the Father of nations would have you walk in? What then are we to take thought about? Why about our work? What are we not to take thought about? Why about our life? The one is our business, the other is God's. But you turn it the other way. You take no thought of earnestness about the doing of your duty, but you take thought of care lest God should not fulfill his part in the goings-on of the world. A man's business is just to do his duty. God takes upon himself the feeding and the clothing. Will the work of the world be neglected if a man thinks of his work, his duty, God's will to be done instead of what he is to eat, what he is to drink, and wherewithal he is to be clothed? And remember all the needs of the world come back to these three. You will allow, I think, that the work of the world will be only so much the better done, that the very means of procuring the raiment or the food will be the more thoroughly used. What then is the only region on which the doubt can settle? Why God? He alone remains to be doubted. Shall it be so with you? Shall the Son of Man, the baby born now and forever with us, find no faith in you? Ah, oh, my poor friend, who canst not trust in God. I was going to say you deserve, but what do I know of you to condemn and judge you? I was going to say you deserve to be treated like the child who frets and complains because his mother holds him on her knees and feeds him mouthful by mouthful with her own loving hand. I meant you deserve to have your own way for a while, 
to be set down and told to help yourself and see what it will come to, to have your mother open the cupboard door for you and leave you alone to your pleasures. Alas, poor child, when the sweets begin to pall and the twilight begins to come duskily into the chamber and you look about all at once and see no mother, how will your cupboard comfort you then? Ask it for a smile, for a stroke of the gentle hand, for a word of love. All the full-fed mammon can give you is what your mother would have given you without the consequent loathing. With the light of her countenance upon it all, and the arm of her love around you. And this is what God does sometimes, I think, with the mammon worshippers amongst the poor. He says to them, Take your mammon and see what he is worth. Ah, oh, friends, the children of God can never be happy serving other than him. The prodigal might fill his belly with riotous living or with the husks that swine ate. It was all one so long as he was not with his father. His soul was wretched. So would you be if you had wealth, for I fear you would only be worse mammon worshippers than now, and might well have to thank God for the misery of any swine trough that could bring you to your senses. But we do see people die of starvation sometimes. Yes, but if you did your work in God's name and left the rest to him, that would not trouble you. You would say, if it be God's will that I should starve, I can starve as well as another. And your mind would be at ease. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee, because he trusteth in thee. Of that I am sure. It may be good for you to go hungry and barefoot, but it must be utter death to have no faith in God. It is not, however, in God's way of things that the man who does his work shall not live by it. We do not know why here and there a man may be left to die of hunger, but I do believe that they who wait upon the Lord shall not lack any good. But it may be good to deprive a man of till he knows and acknowledges whence it comes. It may be still better to give him when he has learned that every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. I should like to know a man who just minded his duty and troubled himself about nothing, who did his own work and did not interfere with God's. How nobly he would work, working not for reward, but because it was the will of God. How happily he would receive his food and clothing, receiving them as gifts of God. What peace would be his! What a sober gaiety! How hearty and infectious his laughter! What a friend he would be! How sweet his sympathy! And his mind would be so clear he would understand everything. His eye being single, his whole body would be full of light. No fear of his ever doing a mean thing. He would die in a ditch, rather. It is this fear of want that makes men do mean things. They are afraid to part with their precious Lord and mammon. He gives no safety against such fear. One of the richest men in England is haunted with the dread of the workhouse. This man, whom I should like to know, would be sure that God would have him liberal, and he would be what God would have him. Riches are not in the least necessary to that. Witness our Lord's admiration of the poor widow with her great farthing. But I think I hear my troubled friend who does not love money, and yet cannot trust in God out and out, though she fain would. I think I hear her say, I believe I could trust him for myself, or at least I should be ready to dare the worst for his sake. But, but my children, it is the thought of my children that is too much for me. Ah, woman, she whom the Savior praised so pleasedly was 
one who trusted him for her daughter. What an honor she had. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. Do you think you love your children better than he who made them? Is not your love what it is because he put it into your heart first? Have not you often been cross with them, sometimes unjust to them? Whence came the returning love that rose from unknown depths in your being and swept away the anger and the injustice? You did not create that love. Probably you were not good enough to sin for it by prayer, but it came. God sent it. He makes you love your children. Be sorry when you have been cross with them, ashamed when you have been unjust to them, and yet you won't trust him to give them food and clothes? Depend upon it. If he ever refuses to give them food and clothes and you knew all about it, the why and the wherefore, you would not dare to give them food or clothes either. He loves them a thousand times better than you do, be sure of that, and feels for their sufferings too, when he cannot give them just what he would like to give them, cannot for their good, I mean. But as your mistrust will go further, I can go further to meet it. You will say, Ah, yes, in your feeling, I mean, not in words, you will say, Ah, yes, food and clothing of a sort, enough to keep life in and too much cold out. But I want my children to have plenty of good food and nice clothes. Faithless mother, consider the birds of the air. They have so much that at least they can sing. Consider the lilies. They were red lilies, those... Would you not trust him who delights in glorious colors more at least than you, or he would never have created them and made us to delight in them? I do not say that your children shall be clothed in scarlet and fine linen, but if not, it is not because God despises scarlet and fine linen, or does not love your children. He loves them, I say, too much to give them everything all at once but he would make them such that they may have everything without being the worse and with being the better for it. And if you cannot trust him yet, it begins to be a shame, I think. It has been well said that no man ever sank under the burden of the day. It is when tomorrow's burden is added to the burden of today that the weight is more than a man can bear. Never load yourselves so, my friends. If you find yourselves so loaded, at least remember this. It is your own doing, not God's. He begs you to leave the future to him and mind the present. What more or what else could he do to take the burden off you? Nothing else would do it. Money in the bank wouldn't do it. He cannot do tomorrow's business for you beforehand to save you from fear about it. That would derange everything. What else is there but to tell you to trust in him, irrespective of the fact that nothing else but such trust can put your heart at peace, from the very nature of our relation to him, as well as the fact that we need these things. We think that we can come nearer to God than the lower animals do, by our foresight. But there is another side to it. We are like to him with whom there is no past or future, with whom a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, when we live with large, bright, spiritual eyes, doing our work in the great present, leaving both past and future to him to whom they are ever present, and fearing nothing, because he is in our future as much as he is in our past, as much as and far more than we can feel him to be in our present. Partakers thus of the divine nature, resting in that perfect all in all in whom our nature is eternal too, we walk without fear, full of hope and courage and strength to do his will, 
waiting for the endless good which he is always giving as fast as he can get us able to take it in would this not be to be more of god's than satan promised to eve to live carelessly divine duty doing fearless loving self-forgetting lives is not that more than to know both good and evil lives in which the good like aaron's rod has swallowed up the evil and turned it into good for pain and hunger are evils but if faith in god swallows them up do they not so turn into good i say they do and i am glad to believe that i am not alone in my parish in this conviction i have never been too hungry but i have had trouble which i would gladly have exchanged for hunger and cold and weariness some of you have known hunger and cold and weariness do you not join with me to say it is well and better than well whatever helps us to know the love of him who is our god but there has been just one man who has acted thus and it is his spirit in our hearts that makes us desire to know or to be another such who would do the will of god for god and let god do god's will for him for his will is all and this man is the baby whose birth we celebrate this day was this a condition to choose that of a baby by one who thought it part of man's high calling to take care of the morrow did he not thus cast the whole matter at once upon the hands and heart of his father sufficient unto the baby's day is the need thereof he toils not neither does he spin and yet if he fed and clothed and loved and rejoiced in do you remind me that sometimes even his mother forgets him a mother most likely to whose self-indulgence or weakness the child owes his birth as hers ah uh, but he is not therefore forgotten however like things it may look to our half-seen eyes by his father in heaven one of the highest benefits we can reap from understanding the way of god within ourselves is that we become able thus to trust him for others with whom we do not understand his ways but let us look at what will be more easily shown how namely he did the will of his father and took no thought for the morrow after he became a man remember how he forsook his trade when the time came for him to preach preaching was not a profession then there were no monasteries or vicarages or stipends then yet witness for the father the garment woven throughout the ministering of women the purse in common hard-working men and rich ladies were ready to help him and did help him with all that he needed did he then ever want yes once at least for a little while only he was a hungered in the wilderness make bread said satan no said our lord he could starve but he would not eat bread that his father did not give him even though he could make it himself he had come hither to be tried but when the victory was secure lo the angels brought him food from his father which was better to feed himself or to be fed by his father judge yourselves anxious people he sought the kingdom of god and his righteousness and the bread was added unto him and this gives me occasion to remark that the same truth holds with regard to any portion of the future as well as the morrow it is a principle not a command or an encouragement or a promise merely in respect of it there is no difference between next day and next year next hour and next century you will see at once the absurdity of taking no thought for the morrow and not taking thought for next year but do you see likewise that it is equally reasonable to trust god for the next moment and equally unreasonable not to trust him the lord was hungry and needed food now 
though he could still go without for a while. He left it to his father, and so he told his disciples to do when they were called to answer before judges and rulers. Take no thought, it shall be given you what ye shall say. You have a disagreeable duty to do at twelve o'clock. Do not blacken nine and ten and eleven and all between with the color of twelve. Do the work of each and reap your reward in peace. So when the dreaded moment in the future becomes the present, you shall meet it walking in the light, and the light will overcome its darkness. How often do men who have made up their minds what to say and do under certain expected circumstances forget the words and reverse the actions? The best preparation is the present well seen to, the last duty done. For this will keep the eye so clear and the body so full of light that the right action will be perceived at once, the right words will rush from the heart to the lips, and the man full of the Spirit of God because he cares for nothing but the will of God will trample on the evil thing in love and be sent, it may be, in a chariot of fire to the presence of his father or stand unmoved amid the cruel mockings of the men he loves. Do you feel inclined to say in your hearts, It was easy for him to take no thought, for he had the matter in his own hands. But observe, there is nothing very noble in a man's taking no thought, except it be from faith. If there were no God to take thought for us, we should have no right to blame anyone for taking thought. You may fancy the Lord had his own power to fall back upon, but that would have been to him just the one dreadful thing, that his father should forget him. No power in himself could make up for that. He feared nothing for himself, and never once employed his divine power to save him from his human fate. Let God do that for him if he saw fit. He did not come into the world to take care of himself. That would not be in any way divine. To fall back on himself, God failing him, how could that make it easy for him to avoid care? The very idea would be torture. That would be to declare heaven void and the world without a God. He would not even pray to his father for what he knew he should have if he did not ask it. He would just wait his will. But see how the fact of his own power adds tenfold significance to the fact that he trusted in God. We see that this power could not serve his need, his need not being to be fed and clothed, but to be one with the Father and to be fed by his hand, clothed by his care. This was what the Lord wanted, and we need, alas, too often without wanting it. He never once, I repeat, used his power for himself. That was not his business. He did not care about it. His life was of no value to him, but as the Father cared for it. God would mind all that was necessary for him, and he would mind the work his Father had given him to do. And, my friends, this is just the one secret of a blessed life. The one thing every man comes into this world to learn, with what authority it comes to us from the lips of him who knew all about it, and ever did as he said. Now you see that he took no thought for the morrow, and in the name of the Holy Child Jesus I call upon you this Christmas day to cast care to the winds and to trust in God, to receive the message of peace and good will to men, to yield yourselves to the Spirit of God that you may be taught what he wants you to know to remember that the one gift promised without reserve to those who ask it, the one gift worth having, the gift which makes all other gifts a thousandfold in value, is the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the child Jesus, who will take of the things of Jesus and show them to you, make you understand them, that is, so that you shall see them to be true, and love him with all your hearts and soul, and your neighbor as yourselves. And here, having finished my sermon, 
I will give my reader some lines with which he may not be acquainted, from a writer of the Elizabethan time. I had meant to introduce them into my sermon, but I was so carried away with my subject that I forgot them, for I always preach extempore, which phrase I beg my reader will not misinterpret as meaning on the spur of the moment uh, of without the due preparation of much thought. O man, thou image of thy maker's good, what canst thou fear when breathes into thy blood his spirit that built thee? What dull sense makes thee suspect in need that providence who made the morning and who placed the light guide to thy labors, who called up the night and bid her fall upon thee like sweet showers in hollow murmurs to lock up thy powers, who gave thee knowledge, who so trusted thee to let thee grow so near himself the tree? Must he then be distrusted? Shall his frame discourse with him why thus and thus I am? He made the angels thine, thy fellows all, nay, even thy servants when devotions call. Oh, canst thou be so stupid then, so dim, to seek a saving influence and lose him? Can stars protect thee? Or can poverty, which is the light to heaven, put out his eye? He is my star. In him all truth I find, all influence, all fate. And when my mind is furnished with his fullness, my poor story shall outlive all their age and all their glory. The hand of danger cannot fall amiss when I know what and whose power it is nor want the curse of man shall make me groan. A holy hermit is a mind alone. Affliction, when I know it, is but this, a deep alloy whereby man tougher is. To bear the hammer and deeper still will rise more image of his will. Sickness and humorous cloud twixt us and light, and death at longest but another night. Footnote Many in those days believed in astrology. Chapter 11, Part 2 of the Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter 11, Part 2. The Sermon on God and Mammon. I had more than ordinary attention during my discourse. At one point in which I saw the down-bent head of Catherine Weir sink yet lower upon her hands. After a moment, however, she sat more erect than before, though she never lifted her eyes to meet mine. I need not assure my reader that she was not present to my mind when I spoke the words that so far had moved her. Indeed, had I thought of her, I could not have spoken them. As I came out of the church, my people crowded about me with outstretched hands and good wishes. One woman, the aged wife of a more aged laborer, who could not get near me, called from the outskirts of the little crowd, "'May the Lord come and see ye every day, sir, and may ye never know the hunger and cold as me and Tompkins has come through.' Amen to the first of your blessings, Mrs. Tompkins, and a hearty thanks to you. But I daren't say amen to the other part of it, after what I've been preaching, you know. But there'll be no harm if I say it for ye, sir? No, for God will give me what is good, even if your kind heart should pray against it. 
ah sir ye don't know what it is to be hungry and cold neither shall you any more if i can help it god bless ye sir but we're pretty tidy just in the meantime i walked home as usual on sunday mornings by the road it was a lovely day the sun shone so warm that you could not help thinking of what he would be able to do before long draw primroses and buttercups out of the earth by force of sweet persuasive influences but in the shadows lay fine webs of laces of ice so delicately lovely that one could not but be glad of the cold and made the water able to please itself by taking such graceful forms and I wondered over again for the hundredth time what could be the principle which in the widest, most lawless, fantastically chaotic, apparently capricious work of nature always kept it beautiful. The beauty of holiness must be at the heart of it somehow, I thought, because our God is so free from stain, so loving, so unselfish, so good, so altogether what he wants us to be so holy therefore all his works declare him in beauty his fingers can touch nothing but to mould it into loveliness and even the play of his elements is in grace and tenderness of form and then i thought how the sun at the farthest point from us had begun to come backwards towards us looked upon us with a hopeful smile was like the Lord when he visited his people as a little one of themselves, to grow upon the earth till it should blossom as the rose in the light of his presence. Ah, Lord, I said in my heart, draw near unto thy people. It is springtime with thy world, but yet we have cold winds and bitter hail and pinched voices forbidding them that follow thee and follow not with us draw nearer sun of righteousness and make the trees burgeon and the flowers blossom and the voices grow mellow and glad so that all shall join in praising thee and find thereby that harmony is better than unison let it be summer o lord if it ever may be summer in this court of the gentiles but thou hast told us that thy kingdom cometh within us and so the joy must come within us too draw nigh then lord to those to whom thou wilt draw nigh and others beholding their welfare will seek to share therein too and seeing their good works will glorify their father in heaven so i walked home hoping in my saviour and wondering to think how pleasant i had found it to be his poor servant to this people already the doubts which had filled my mind on that first evening of gloom doubts as to whether i had any right to the priest's office had utterly vanished slain by the effort to perform the priest's duty i never thought about the matter now and how can doubt ever be fully met by action try your theory try your hypothesis or if it is not worth trying give it up pull it down and i hope that if ever a cloud should come over me again however dark and dismal it might be i might be able notwithstanding to rejoice that the sun was shining on others though not on me and to say with all my heart to my father in heaven thy will be done when i reached my own study i sat down by a blazing fire and poured myself out a glass of wine for i had to go out again to see some of my poor friends and wanted some luncheon first it is a great thing to have the greetings of the universe presented in fire and wood let me if i may be ever welcomed to my room in winter by a glowing hearth in summer by a vase of flowers if i may not let me then think how nice they would be and bury myself in my work 
I do not think that the road to contentment lies in despising what we have not got. Let us acknowledge all good, all delight that the world holds, and be content without it. But this we can never be except by possessing the one thing, without which I do not merely say no man ought to be content, but no man can be content, the spirit of the Father. If any young people read my little chronicle, will they not be inclined to say, The vicar has already given us in this chapter hardly anything but a long sermon, and it is too bad of him to go on preaching in his study after we saw him safe out of the pulpit. Ah, well, just one word and I drop the preaching for a while. My word is this. I may speak long-windedly, and even inconsiderately as regards my young readers. What I say may fail utterly to convey what I mean. I may be actually stupid sometimes, and not have a suspicion of it. But what I mean is true, and if you do not know it to be true yet, some of you at least suspect it to be true, and some of you hope it is true. And when you all see it as I mean it, and as you can take it, you will rejoice with a gladness you know nothing about now. There, I have done for a little while. I won't pledge myself for more, I assure you, for to speak about such things is the greatest delight of my age, as it was of my early manhood, next to that of loving God and my neighbor. For as these are the two commandments of my life, so they are in themselves the pleasures of my life. And there I am at it again. I beg your pardon now, for I have already inadvertently broken my promise. I had allowed myself a half hour before the fire, with my glass of wine and piece of bread, and I soon fell into a dreamy state called reverie, which I fear not a few mistake for thinking, because it is the nearest approach they ever make to it. But in this reverie I kept staring about my bookshelves. I am an old man now, and you do not know my name, and if you should ever find it out, I shall very soon hide it under some daisies. I hope and so escape, and therefore I am going to be egotistic in the most unpardonable manner. I am going to tell you one of my faults, for it continues, I fear, to be one of my faults still, as it certainly was at the period of which I am now writing. Ah, I am very fond of books. Do not mistake me. I do not mean that I love reading. I hope I do. That is no fault. A, a virtue rather than a fault. But as the old meaning of the word fond was foolish, I use that word. I am foolishly fond of the bodies of books as distinguished from their souls, or thought element, I do not say I love their bodies as divided from their souls. I do not say I should let a book stand upon my shelves for which I felt no respect, except indeed it happened to be useful to me in some inferior way. But I delight in seeing books about me, books even of which there seems to be no prospect that I shall have time to read a single chapter before I lay this old head down for the last time. And nay, more, I confess that if they are nicely bound, so as to glow and shine in such a firelight as that by which I was then sitting, I like them ever so much the better. Nay, more yet, and this comes very near to showing myself worse than I thought I was, when I begin to tell you my fault. There are books upon my shelves which certainly at least would not occupy the place of honor they do occupy, had not some previous owner dressed them far beyond their worth, 
making modern apples of Sodom of them. Yet there I let them stay, because they are pleasant to the eye, although certainly not things to be desired to make one wise. I could say a great deal more about the matter, pro and con, but it would be worse than a sermon, I fear. For I suspect that by the time books, which ought to be loved for the truth that is in them, of one sort or another, come to be loved as articles of furniture, the mind has gone through a process more than analogous to that which the miser's mind goes through, namely, that of passing from the respect of money because of what it can do, to the love of money because it is money. I have not yet reached the furniture stage, and I do not think I ever shall. I would rather burn them all. Meantime, I think one safeguard is to encourage one's friends to borrow one's books, not to offer individual books, which is much the same thing as offering advice. That will probably take some of the shine off them and put a few thumb marks in them, which both are very wholesome towards the arresting of the furniture declension. For my part, thumb marks I find very obnoxious, far more so than the spoiling of the binding. I know that some of my readers who have had sad experience of uh, the sort will be saying in themselves, hmm, he might have mentioned a sure antidote resulting from this measure than either rubbed Russia or dirty glove marks even that of utter disappearance and irreparable loss. <sighs> but no, that has seldom happened to me, because I trust my pocketbook and never my memory with the names of those to whom the individual books are committed. There, then, is a little bit of practical advice in both directions for young book lovers. Again, I am reminded that I am getting old, <laughs> What digressions? Gazing about on my treasures, the thought suddenly struck me that I had never done as I had promised Judy, and never found out what her aunt's name meant in Anglo-Saxon. I would do so now. I got down my dictionary and soon discovered that Ethelwyn meant home joy or inheritance. What a lovely meaning, I said to myself. And then I went off into another reverie, with the composition of which I shall not trouble my reader, and with the mention of which I had perhaps uh, no right to occupy the fragment of this time spent in reading it, seeing I did not intend to tell him how it was made up. I will tell him something else instead. Several families had asked me to take my Christmas dinner with them, but not liking to be thus limited, I had answered each that I would not, if they would excuse me, but would look in some time or other in the course of the evening. When my half-hour was out, I got up and filled my pockets with little presents for my poor people, and set out to find them in their own homes. I was variously received, but unvaryingly with kindness, and my little presents were accepted, at least in most instances, with a gratitude which made me ashamed of them, and of myself, too, for a few moments. Mrs. Tompkins looked as if she had never seen so much tea together before, though there was only a couple of pounds of it, and her husband received a pair of warm trousers, none the less cordially that they were not quite new the fact being that I found I did not myself need such warm clothing this winter as I had needed the last. I did not dare offer Catherine Weir anything, but I gave her little boy a box of watercolors in remembrance of the first time I saw him, though I said nothing about that. His mother did not thank me. She told little Gerard to do so, however, and that was something— 
and indeed the boy's sweetness would have been enough for both. Gerard, an unusual name in England, especially not to be looked for in the class to which she belonged. When I reached old Roger's cottage, whither I carried a few yards of ribbon, bought by myself, I assure my lady friends, with the special object that the color should be bright enough for her taste, and pure enough of its kind for mine, as an offering to the good dame, and a small hymn-book in which were some hymns of my own making for the good man. Uh, but do forgive me, friends, for actually describing my paltry presence. I can dare to assure you it comes from a talking old man's love of detail, and from no admiration of such small givings as those. You see, I trust you, and I want to stand well with you. I never could be indifferent to what people thought of me, though I have had to fight hard to act as freely as if I were indifferent, especially when upon occasion I found myself approved of. It is more difficult to walk straight then than when men are all against you. As I have already broken a sentence which will not be past setting for a while yet, I may as well go on to say here, lest any one should remark that a clergyman ought not to show off his virtues, nor yet teach his people bad habits by making them look out for presents, that my income not only seemed to me disproportioned to the amount of labor necessary in the parish, but certainly was larger than I required to spend upon myself and the miserly passion for books I contrived to keep a good deal in check, for I had no fancy for gliding devil words for the sake of a few books, after all. So there was no great virtue, was there, in easing my heart by giving a few of the good things people give their children to my poor friends, whose kind reception to them gave me as much pleasure as the gifts gave them. They valued the kindness in the gift, and to look out for kindness will not make people greedy. When I reached the cottage, I found not merely Jane there with her father and mother, which was natural on Christmas Day, seeing there seemed to be no company at the hall, but my little Judy as well, sitting in the old woman's armchair. Not that she used it much, but it was called hers, and looking as much at home as she did in the pond. "'Why, Judy!' I exclaimed. "'You here?' "'Yes. Why not, Mr. Walton?' She returned, holding out her hand without rising, for the chair was such a large one, and she was set so far back in it that the easier way was not to rise, which, seeing she was not greatly overburdened with reverence, was not, I presume, a cause of much annoyance to the little damsel. I know no reason why I shouldn't see a sandwich islander here, yet I might express surprise if I did find one, might I not? Judy pretended to pout and muttered something about comparing her to a cannibal, but Jane took up the explanation. Mistress had to go off to London with her mother today, sir, quite unexpected. On some banking business, I fancy, from what I... I beg your pardon, sir. Uh, they're gone anyhow, whatever the reason may be. And so I came to see my father and mother, and, and Miss Judy would come with me. She's very welcome, said Mrs. Rogers. How could I stay up there with nobody but Jacob and that old wolf, Sarah? I wouldn't be left alone with her for the world. She'd have me in the bishop's pool before you came back, Janey, dear. Uh, that wouldn't matter much to you, would it, Judy? I said. She's a white wolf, that old Sarah, I know, was all her answer. But what will the old lady say when she finds you brought the young lady here? asked Mrs. Rogers. I didn't bring her mother. She would come. Besides, she'll never know it, said Judy. I did not see that it was my part to read Judy a lecture here, though perhaps I might have done so if I had had more influence over her than I had. 
I wanted to gain some influence over her, and knew that the way to render my desire impossible of fulfillment would be to find fault with what in her was a very small affair, whatever it might be in one who had been properly brought up. Besides, a clergyman is not a moral policeman. So I took no notice of the impropriety. Had they actually to go away on the morning of Christmas Day? I said. They went away anyhow, whether they had to do it or not, sir, answered Jane. Aunt Ethelwyn didn't want to go till tomorrow, said Judy. She said something about coming to church this morning, but Granny said they must go at once. It was very cross of old Granny. Think what a Christmas day to me without Auntie and with Sarah. But I don't mean to go home till it's quite dark. I mean to stop here with dear old Rogers. That I do. The latch was gently lifted, and in came young Brownrigg. So I thought it was time to leave my best Christmas wishes and take myself away. Old Rogers came with me to the mill stream as usual. It amazes me, sir, he said. A gentleman of your age and bringing up to know all that you told us this morning. It'd be no wonder now for a man like me uh, come to be the stock of corn fully ripe leastways yellow and white enough outside if there bean't much more than milk inside it yet it'd be no mystery for a man like me who'd been brought up hard and dossed about well nigh all over the world why there's scarce a wave on the atlantic but knows old rogers he made a parenthesis with a laugh and began anew <laughs> it'd be a shame of a man like me not to know all as you said this morning sir leastways i don't mean able to say it right off as you do but, sir but uh, to know it after the almighty had been at such pains to beat it into my hard head just to trust in him and fear nothing and nobody captain boatswain devil sunk rock or breakers ahead but just to mind him and stand by halyard brace or wheel or hang on by the leeward earring uh, for that matter for you see what does it signify whether i go to the bottom or not so long as i didn't skulk or rather and here the old man took off his hat and looked up so long as the great captain has his way and things is done to his mind but however a man like you go into the college and readin books and warm a nights and never by your own confession this blessed morning sir know what it is to be downright uh, hungry however you come to know all those things is just past my comprehension except by a double portion of the spirit sir and that's the way i account for it sir although i knew enough about a ship to understand the old man i am not sure that i have properly represented his sea phrase but that is of small consequence so long as i give his meaning and a meaning can occasionally be even better conveyed by less accurate words. I will try to tell you how I come to know about these things as I do, I returned. How my knowledge may stand the test of further and severer trials remains to be seen. But if I should fail any time, old friend, and neither trust in God nor do my duty, what I have said to you remains true all the same that it do sir whoever may come short and more than that failure does not necessarily prove any one to be a hypocrite of no faith he may still be a man of little faith surely surely sir i remember once that my faith 
broke down. Just for a moment, sir. And then the Lord gave me my way, lest I should blaspheme him in thy wicked heart. Uh, how was that, Rogers? A scream came from the quarter-deck, and then the cry, Child, overboard! Uh, there was but one child, the uh, captain's aboard. Uh, I was sitting just after the foremast, herring boning a split in the spare jib. I sprang to the bulwark, and there, sure enough, was a child going fast astern, but pretty high in the water. How it happened, I can't think to this day, sir, but I, I suppose my needle, in the hurry, had got into my jacket, so as to skewer it to my jersey, for we were far south of the line at the time, sir, and it was cold. However that may be, as soon as I was overboard, which you may be sure didn't want the time I take telling it, I found that I ought to have pulled my jacket off afore I gave the bulwark the last kick. So I rose on the water and began to pull it over my head, for it was wide, and that was the easiest way, I thought, in the water. But when I had got it right over my head, there it stuck. And there was I, blind as a Dutchman in a fog, and in as straight a jacket as ever poor wretch in Bedlam, for I could only just wag my flippers. Mr. Walton, I believe I swore, and the Lord forgive me, but it was trying, and what was far worse for one moment, I, I disbelieved him, and I do say that's worse than swearing, in a hurry, I mean. In that moment, something went, the jacket was off, and there was I feeling as if every stroke I took was as wide as a mainyard. I had no time to repent, only to thank God. And wasn't it more than I deserved, sir? Ah, he can rebuke a man for unbelief by giving him the desire of his heart. And that's a better rebuke than tying him up to the gratings. And did you save the child? Oh, yes, sir. And wasn't the captain pleased? I, I believe he was, sir. He gave me a glass of grog, sir. But you was a saying of something, sir, when I interrupted of you. I am very glad you did interrupt me. I, I'm not, though, sir. I've lost some it. I, I'll never hear more. No, you shan't lose it. I was going to tell you how I think I came to understand a little about the things I was talking of today. Uh, that's it, sir. That's it. Well, sir, if you please. You've heard of Sir Philip Sidney, haven't you, old Rogers? <laughs> he was a great joker, wasn't he, sir? No, no, you're thinking of Sidney Smith Rogers. It may be, sir, I am an ignorant man. You are no more ignorant than you ought to be, but it is time you should know of him, for he was just one of your sort. Uh, I will come down some evening and tell you about him. I may as well mention here that this led to week evening lectures in the barn, which, with the help of Weir, the carpenter, was changed into a comfortable room with fixed seats all around it, and plenty of cane chairs besides, for I always disliked forms in the middle of a room. The object of these lectures was to make the people acquainted with the true heroes of their own country, men great in themselves. And the kind of choice I made may be seen by those who know about both, from the fact that while my first two lectures were on Philip Sidney, I did not give one whole lecture even to Walter Raleigh, grand fellow as he was. I wanted chiefly to set forth the men that could rule themselves, first of all, after a noble fashion. But I have not finished these lectures yet, for I never wished to confine them to the English heroes. I am going on still, old man as I am, 
not however without retracing past ground sometimes for a new generation has come up since i came here and there is a new one behind coming up now which i may be honored to present in its turn to some of this grand company this cloud of witnesses to the truth in our own and other lands some of whom subdued kingdoms and others were tortured to death for the same cause and with the same result meantime i went on i only want to tell you one little thing he says in a letter to a younger brother whom he wanted to turn out as fine a fellow as possible it is about horses or rather riding for sir philip was the best horseman in europe in his day as indeed all things taken together he seems to have really been the most accomplished man generally of his time in the world writing to this brother he says i could not repeat the words exactly to old rogers but i think it better to copy them exactly in writing this account of our talk at horsemanship when you exercise it read chris and claudio and a book that is called la gloria del cavallo withal that you may join the thorough contemplation of it with the exercise and so shall you profit more in a month than others in a year i think i see what you mean sir i had got to learn it all without a book as it were though you know i had my old bible that my mother gave me and without that i should not have learned at all i only mean it comparatively you know you have had more of the practice and i more of the theory but if we had not both had both we should neither of us had known anything about the matter i never was content without trying at least to understand things and if they are practical things and you try to practice them at the same time as far as you do understand them there is no end to the way in which the one lights up the other i suppose that is how without your experience i have more to say about such things than you could expect you know besides that a small matter in which a principle is involved will reveal the principle if attended to just as well as a great one containing the same principle the only difference and that a most important one is that though i've got my clay and my straw together and they stick pretty well as yet my brick after all is not half so well baked as yours old friend and it may crumble away yet though i hope not i pray god to make both our bricks into stones of the new jerusalem sir i think i understand you quite well i know about a thing is of no use uh, except you do it besides as i found out when i went to sea you never can know a thing till you do it uh, though i thought i had a tidy fancy about some things beforehand it's better not to be quite sure that all your seams are cocked and so to keep a lookout on the bilge pump isn't it sir during most of this conversation we were standing by the mill water half frozen over the ice from both sides came towards the middle leaving an empty space between along which the dark water showed itself hurrying away as if in fear of its life from the white death of the frost the wheel stood motionless and the drip from the thatch of the mill over it in the sun had frozen in the shadows into icicles which hung in long spikes from the spokes and the floats making the wheel soft green and mossy when it revolved in the gentle sun-mingled summer water look like its own gray skeleton now the sun was getting low and i should want all my time to see my other friends before dinner for i would not willingly offend mrs pearson on christmas day by being late especially as i guess she was using extraordinary skill 
to prepare me a more than comfortable meal. I must go, old Rogers, I said, but I will leave you something to think about till we meet again. Find out why our Lord was so much displeased with the disciples, whom he knew to be ignorant men, for not knowing what he meant when he warned them against the leaven of the Pharisees. I want to know what you think about it. You'll find the story told both in the 16th chapter of St. Matthew and the 8th of St. Mark. Well, sir, I'll try, that is, if you will tell me what you think about it afterwards, so as to put me right if, if I'm wrong. Uh, of course I will. I, I can find out an explanation to satisfy me, but it is not at all clear to me now. In fact, I do not see the connecting links of our Lord's logic in the rebuke he gives them. How oh, am I to find out then, sir, knowing nothing of logic at all? said the old man, his rough, worn face summered over with his childlike smile. There are many things which a little learning, while it cannot really hide them, may make you less ready to see all at once, I answered, shaking hands with old Rogers and then springing across the brook with my carpet bag in my hand. By the time I had got through the rest of my calls, the fogs were rising from the streams and the meadows to close in upon my first Christmas day in my own parish. How much happier I was than when I came such a few months before. The only pang I felt that day was as I passed the monsters on the gate leading to Old Castle Hall. Should I be honored to help only the poor of the flock? Was I to do nothing for the rich for whom it is and has been and doubtless will be so hard to enter into the kingdom of heaven? And it seemed to me at the moment that the world must be made for the poor. They had so much more done for them to enable them to inherit it than the rich had. To these people at the hall I did not seem acceptable. I might in time do something with Judy, but the old lady was still so dreadfully repulsive to me that it troubled my conscience to feel how I disliked her. Mr. Stoddart seemed nothing more than a dilettante in religion, as well as in the arts and sciences, music always excepted. While for Miss Oldcastle I simply did not understand her yet, and she was so beautiful. I thought her more beautiful every time I saw her, but I never appeared to make the least progress towards any real acquaintance with her thoughts and feelings. It seemed to me, I say for a moment, coming from the houses of the warm-hearted poor, as if the rich had not quite fair play, as it were, as if they were sent into the world chiefly for the sake of the cultivation of the virtues of the poor, and without much chance for the cultivation of their own. I know better than this, you know, my reader, but the thought came, as thoughts will come sometimes. It vanished the moment I sought to lay hands upon it, as if I knew quite well it had no business there. But certainly I did believe that it was more like the truth to say the world was made for the poor than to say that it was made for the rich, and therefore I longed the more to do something for these whom I considered the rich of my flock, for it was dreadful to think of their being poor inside instead of outside. Perhaps my reader will say, and say with justice, that I ought to have been as anxious about the poor farmer Brownrig as about the beautiful lady. But the farmer will have given me good reason to hope some progress in him after the way he had given in about Jane Rogers. Positively I had caught his eye during the sermon that very day. And besides, but I will not be a hypocrite, and seeing I did not certainly take the same interest in Mr. Brownrigg, 
I will at least be honest and confess it. As far as regards the discharge of my duties, I trust I should have behaved impartially had the necessity for my choice arisen. But my feelings were not quite under my own control, and we are nowhere told to love everybody alike, only to love everyone who comes within reach as ourselves. I wonder whether my old friend Dr. Duncan was right. He had served on shore in Egypt under General Abercrombie, and had, of course, after the fighting was over on each of the several occasions, the French being always repulsed, exercised his office amongst the wounded left on the field of battle. I do not know, he said, whether I did right or not, but I always took the man I came to first, French or English. I only know that my heart did not wait for the opinion of my head on the matter. I loved the old man the more that he did as he did, but as a question of casuistry, I am doubtful about its answer. This digression is, I fear, unpardonable. I made Mrs. Pearson sit down with me to dinner, for Christmas Day was not one to dine alone upon, and I have ever since had my servants to dine with me on Christmas Day. Then I went out and made another round of visits, coming in for a glass of wine at one table, an orange at another, and a hot chestnut at a third. Those whom I could not see that day I saw on the following days between it and the new year, and so ended my Christmas holiday with my people. But there is one little incident which I ought to relate before I close this chapter, and which I am ashamed of having so nearly forgotten. When we had finished our dinner, I was sitting alone, drinking a glass of claret before going out again. Mrs. Pearson came in and told me that little Gerard Weir wanted to see me. I asked her to show him in, and the little fellow entered, looking very shy and clinging first to the door and then to the wall. Come in, my dear boy, I said, and sit down by me. He came directly and stood before me. Would you like a little wine and water, I said, for unhappily there was no dessert, Mrs. Pearson knowing that uh, I never eat such things. No, no thank you, sir. I never tasted wine. I did not press him to take it. Please, sir, he went on after a pause, putting his hand in his pocket. Mother gave me some goodies, and I kept them till I saw you come back. And here they are, sir. Does any reader doubt what I did or said upon this? I said, Thank you, my darling, and I ate them up, every one of them, that he might see me eat them before he left the house, and the dear child went off radiant. If anybody cannot understand why I did so, I beg him to consider the matter. If then he cannot come to a conclusion concerning it, I doubt if any explanation of mine would greatly subserve his enlightenment. Meantime, I am forcibly restraining myself from yielding to the temptation to set forth my reasons, which would result in a half-hour sermon on the Jewish dispensation, including the burnt offering and the wave and heave offerings, with an application to the ignorant nurses and mothers of English babies, who do the best they can to make original sin an actual fact by training children down in the way they should not go. Chapter 12 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. 
Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald Chapter 12 The Avenue It will not appear strange that I should linger so long upon the first few months of my association with a people who, now that I am an old man, look at me like my own children. For those who were then older than myself are now old dwellers in those high countries where there is no age only wisdom and i shall soon go to them how glad i shall be to see my old rogers again who as he taught me upon earth will teach me yet more i thank my god in heaven but i must not let the reverie which always gathers about the feather end of my pen the moment i take it up to write these recollections interfere with the work before me after this christmas tide i found myself in closer relationship to my parishioners no doubt i was always in danger of giving unknown offence to those who were ready to fancy that i neglected them and did not distribute my favours equally but as i never took offence the offence i gave was easily got rid of a clergyman of all men should be slow to take offence for if he does he will never be free or strong to reprove sin and it must sometimes be his duty to speak severely to those especially the good who are turning their faces the wrong way it is of little use to reprove the sinner but it is worth while sometimes to reprove those who have a regard for righteousness however imperfect they may be Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. But I took great care about interfering, though I would interfere upon request, not always, however, upon the side whence the request came, and more seldom still upon either side. The clergyman must never be a partisan. When our Lord was requested to act as umpire between two brothers, he refused, but he spoke and said, Take heed and be aware of covetedness. Now, though the best of men is unworthy to loose the latchet of his shoe, yet the servant must be as his master. Ah me, while I write it, I remember that the sinful woman might yet do as she would with his sacred feet. I bethink me, desert may not touch his shoe tie, love may kiss his feet. I visited, of course, at the hall, as at the farmhouses in the country, and the cottages in the village. I did not come to like Mrs. Oldcastle better, and there was one woman in the house whom I disliked still more, that Sarah, whom Judy had called in my hearing a white wolf. Her face was yet whiter than that of her mistress, only it was not smooth like hers, for its whiteness came apparently from the smallpox, which had so thickened the skin that no blood, if she had any, could shine through. I seldom saw her, only indeed caught a glimpse of her now and then, as I passed through the house. Nor did I make much progress with Mr. Stoddart. He had always something friendly to say, and often some theosophical theory to bring forward, which I must add never seemed to me to mean or at least to reveal anything He was a great reader of mystical books and yet the man's nature seemed cold It was sunshiny, but not sunny His intellect was rather a lambent flame than a genial warmth He could make things but he could not grow anything and when I came to see that he had had more than any one else to do with the education of Miss Oldcastle I Understood her a little better and saw that her so-called education had been in a great measure repression of a negative sort no doubt but not therefore the less mischievous for to teach speculation instead of devotion mysticism instead of love Word instead of deed is surely ruinously repressive to the nature that is meant for sun-bright activity both of heart and hand My chief perplexity continued to be how he could play the organ as he did My reader will think that I am always coming round to miss Oldcastle But if he does I cannot help it I began I say to understand her a little better 
She seemed to me always like one walking in a watery sunbeam, without knowing that it was but the wintry pledge of a summer sun at hand. She took it, or was trying to take it, for the sunlight, trying to make herself feel all the glory people said was in the light, instead of making haste towards the perfect day. I found afterwards that several things had combined to bring about this condition, and I know she will forgive me, should I, for the sake of others, endeavour to make it understood by and by. I have not much more to tell my readers about this winter, as but of a whole changeful season, only one day, or, it may be, but one moment, in which the time seemed to burst into its own blossom, will cling to the memory. So of the various interviews with my friends, and the whole flow of the current of my life, during that winter, nothing more of nature or human nature occurs to me worth recording. I will pass on to the summer season as rapidly as I may, though the early spring will detain me with the relation of just a single incident. I was on my way to the hall to see Mr. Stoddart. I wanted to ask him whether something could not be done beyond his exquisite playing to rouse the sense of music in my people. I believe that nothing helps you so much to feel as the taking of what share may, from the nature of the thing, be possible to you, because, for one reason, in order to feel, it is necessary that the mind should rest upon the matter, whatever it is. The poorest success, provided the attempt has been genuine, will enable one to enter into any art ten times better than before. Now I had, I confess, little hope of moving Mr. Stoddart in the matter, but if I should succeed, I thought it would do himself more good to mingle with his humble fellows in the attempt to do them a trifle of good than the opening of any number of intellectual windows towards the circumambient truth. It was just beginning to grow dusk. The wind was blustering in gusts among the trees, swaying them suddenly and fiercely like a keen passion, now sweeping them all one way, as if the multitude of tops would break loose and rush away like a wild river, and now subsiding as suddenly, and allowing them to recover themselves and stand upright, with tones and motions of indignant expostulation. There was just one cold bar of light in the west, and the east was one grey mass, while overhead the stars were twinkling. The grass and all the ground about the trees were very wet. The time seemed more dreary somehow than the winter. Rigour was past, and tenderness had not come, for the wind was cold without being keen, and bursting from the trees every now and then was a roar as of a sea breaking on distant sands, whirled about me, as if it wanted me to go and join in its fierce play. Suddenly I saw, to my amazement, in a walk that ran alongside of the avenue, Miss Oldcastle struggling against the wind, which blew straight down the path upon her. The cause of my amazement was twofold. First, I had supposed her to be with her mother in London, whither their journeys had not been infrequent since Christmas tide. And next, why should she be fighting with the wind so far from the house, and only a shawl drawn over her head? The reader may wonder how I should know her in this attire in the dusk, and where there was not the smallest probability of finding her. Suffice it to say that I did recognise her at once, and passing between two great tree trunks and through an opening in some underwood, was by her side in a moment. But the noise of the wind had prevented her from hearing my approach, and when I uttered her name she started violently, and, turning, drew herself up very haughtily, in part, I presume, to hide her tremor. She was always a little haughty with me, I must acknowledge. Could there have been anything in my address, however unconscious of it I was, that made her fear I was ready to become intrusive? Or might it not be that, hearing of my footing with my parishioners generally, she was prepared to resent any assumption of clerical familiarity with her, 
and so in my behaviour any poor innocent bush was supposed to bear for i need not tell my reader that nothing was farther from my intention even with the lowliest of my flock than to presume upon my position as clergyman i think they all gave me the relation i occupied towards them personally but i had never seen her look so haughty as now if i had been watching her very thoughts she could hardly have looked more indignant i beg your pardon i said distressed i have startled you dreadfully not in the least she replied but without moving and still with a curve in her form like the neck of a frayed horse i thought it better to leave apology which was evidently disagreeable to her and speak of indifferent things i was on my way to call on mr stoddart i said you will find him at home i believe i fancied you were mrs oldcastle in london we returned yesterday still she stood as before i made a movement in the direction of the house she seemed as if she would walk in the opposite direction may i not walk with you to the house i am not going in just yet are you protected enough for such a night i enjoy the wind i bowed and walked on for what else could i do i cannot say that i enjoyed leaving her behind me in the gathering dark the wind blowing her about with no more reverence than if she had been a bush or privet nor was it with a light heart that i bore her repulse as i slowly climbed the hill to the house however a little personal mortification is wholesome though i cannot say either that i derived much consolation from the reflection sarah opened the glass door her black glossy restless eyes looking out of her white face from under grey eyebrows i knew at once by her look beyond me that she had expected to find me accompanied by her young mistress i did not volunteer any information as my reader may suppose i found as i had feared that although mr stoddart seemed to listen with some interest to what i said i could not bring him to the point of making any practical suggestion or of responding to one made by me and i left him with the conviction that he would do nothing to help me yet during the whole of our interview he had not opposed a single word i said he was like clay too much softened with water to keep the form into which it had been modelled he would take some kind of form easily and lose it yet more easily i did not show all my dissatisfaction however for that would only have estranged us and it is not required nay it may be wrong to show all you feel or think what is required of us is not to show what we do not feel or think for that is to be false i left the house in a gloomy mood i know i ought to have looked up to god and said these things do not reach to thee my father thou art ever the same and i rise above my small as well as my great troubles by remembering thy peace and thy unchangeable godhood to me and all thy creatures but i did not come to myself all at once the thought of god had not come though it was pretty sure to come before i got home i was brooding over the littleness of all i could do and feeling that sickness which sometimes will overtake a man in the midst of the work he likes best when the unpleasant parts of it crowd upon him and his own efforts especially those made from the will without sustaining impulse come back upon him with a feeling of unreality decay and bitterness as if he had been unnatural and untrue and putting himself in false relations by false efforts for good i know this all came from selfishness thinking about myself instead of about god and my neighbor but so it was and so i was walking down the avenue where it was now very dark with my head bent to the ground when i in my turn started at the sound of a woman's voice and looking up saw by the starlight the dim form of miss oldcastle standing before me she spoke first mr walton i was very rude to you i beg your pardon indeed i did not think so 
I only thought what a blundering awkward fellow I was to startle you as I did you have to forgive me I fancy and here I know she smiled though how I know I do not know I Fancy I have made that even she said pleasantly for you must confess I startled you now You did but it was in a very different way I annoyed you with my rudeness you only scattered a swarm of bats that kept flapping their skinny wings in my face What do you mean there are no bats at this time of the year? Not outside in winter and rough weather they creep inside you know ah I ought to understand you, but I did not think you were ever like that. I thought you were too good. I wish I were. I hope to be some day. I am not yet, anyhow, and I thank you for driving the bats away in the meantime. You make me the more ashamed of myself to think that perhaps my rudeness had a share in bringing them. Yours is no doubt thankless labor sometimes. She seemed to make the last remark just to prevent the conversation to returning to her as its subject and Now all the bright portions of my work came up before me You are quite mistaken in that miss Oldcastle on the contrary the thanks I get are far more than commensurate with the labor of course one meets with a disappointment sometimes but that is only when they don't know what you mean and how should they know what you mean till they are different themselves? You remember what Wordsworth says on this very subject in his poem of Simon Lee. I do not know anything of Wordsworth. I've heard of hearts unkind, kind deeds. With coldness still returning, alas, the gratitude of men hath oftener left me mourning. I do not quite see what he means. May I recommend you to think about it you will be sure to find it out for yourself And that will be ten times more satisfactory than if I were to explain it to you and besides you will never forget it if you do Will you repeat the lines again I did so all this time the wind had been still now it rose with a slow gush in the trees was it fancy or as the wind moved the shrubbery did I see a white face and could it be the white wolf as Judy called her I Spoke aloud, but it is cruel to keep you standing here in such a night You must be a real lover of nature to walk in the dark wind. I Like it good night So we parted I gazed into the darkness after her though she disappeared at the distance of a yard or two and would have stood longer had I not still suspected the proximity of Judy's wolf Which made me turn and go home regardless now of mr. Stoddart's doughiness I Met miss Oldcastle several times before the summer But her old manner remained or rather had returned For there had been nothing of it in the tone of her voice in that interview if interview Chapter Thirteen, Part One, of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood, by George MacDonald. Chapter Thirteen, Part One. Young Weir. By slow degrees, the summer bloomed. Green came instead of white, rainbows instead of icicles. The grounds about the hall seemed the incarnation of a summer which had taken years to ripen to its perfection. The very grass seemed to have aged into perfect youth in that haunt of ancient peace, for surely nowhere else was such thick, delicate-bladed, delicate-colored grass to be seen. Gnarled old trees of May stood like altars of smoking perfume, or each like one million petaled flower of upheaved whiteness, or of tender rosiness, as if the snow which had covered it in winter had sunk in and gathered warmth from the life of the tree, 
and now crept out again to adorn the summer. The long loops of the laburnum hung heavy with gold towards the sod below, and the air was full of the fragrance of the young leaves of the limes. Down in the valley below the daisies shone in all the meadows, varied with the buttercup and celandine, while in damp places grew large pimpernels, and along the sides of the river the meadow-sweet stood amongst the reeds at the very edge of the water, breathing out the odors of dreamful sleep. The clumsy pollards were each one mass of undivided green. The mill-wheel had regained its knotty look, with its moss and its dip and drip, as it yielded to the slow water, which would have let it alone, but that there was no other way out of the land to the sea. I used now to wander about in the fields and woods with a book in my hand at which I often did not look the whole day, and which yet I liked to have with me, and I seemed somehow to come back with most upon those days in which I did not read. In this manner I prepared almost all my sermons that summer. But, although I prepared them thus in the open country, I had another custom which perhaps may appear strange to some before I preached them. This was to spend the Saturday evening not in my study but in the church. This custom of mine was known to the sexton and his wife, and the church was always clean and ready for me after about midday, so that I could be alone there as soon as I pleased. It would take more space than my limits will afford to explain thoroughly why I liked to do this, but I will venture to attempt a partial explanation in a few words. This fine old church in which I was honored to lead the prayers of my people was not the expression of the religious feeling of my time. There was a gloom about it, a sacred gloom, I know, and I loved it, but such gloom as was not in my feeling when I talked to my flock. I honored the place, I rejoiced in its history. I delighted to think that even by the temples made with hands outlasting these bodies of ours, we were in a sense united to those who in them had before us lifted up holy hands without wrath or doubting, and with many more who, like us, had lifted up at least prayerful hands without hatred or despair. The place soothed me, tuned me to a solemn mood, one of self-denial and gentle gladness in all sober things. But, had I been an architect, and had I had to build a church, I do not in the least know how I should have built it. I am certain it would have been very different from this. Else I should be a mere imitator, like all the church architects I know anything about in the present day. For I always found the open air the most genial influence upon me for the production of religious feeling and thought. I had been led to try whether it might not be so with me by the fact that our Lord seemed so much to delight in the open air, and late in the day as well as early in the morning would climb the mountain to be alone with his Father. I found that it helped to give a reality to everything that I thought about, if I only contemplated it under the high, untroubled blue, with the lowly green beneath my feet and the wind blowing on me to remind me the spirit that once moved on the face of the waters, bringing order out of disorder and light out of darkness, and was now seeking every day a fuller entrance into my heart, that there he might work the one will of the Father in heaven. My reader will see that there was, as it were, not so much a discord as a lack of harmony between the surroundings wherein my thoughts took form, or, to use a homelier phrase, my sermon was studied, and the surroundings wherein I had to put these forms into the garments of words, or preach that sermon. I therefore sought to bridge over this difference. If I understood music, I am sure I could find an expression exactly fitted to my meaning. To find an easy passage between the open-air mood and the church mood so as to be able to bring into the church as much of the fresh air, and the tree music, and the color harmony, and the gladness over all, as might be possible. And in order to do this, I thought all my sermon over again in the afternoon sun, as it shone slantingly through the stained window over Lord Eagley's tomb, and in the failing light thereafter, and the gathering dusk of the twilight, pacing up and down the solemn old place, hanging my thoughts here on a crocket, 
there on a corbel, now on the gable point over which Weir's face would gaze next morning, and now on the aspiring peaks of the organ. I thus made the place a cell of thought and prayer, and when the next day came I found the forms around me so interwoven with the forms of my thought that I felt almost like one of the old monks who had built the place, so little did I find any check to my thought or utterance from its unfitness for the expression of my individual modernism. But not one atom the more did I incline to the evil fancy that God was more in the past than in the present, that He is more within the walls of the church than in the unwalled sky and earth, or seek to turn backwards one step from a living now to an entombed and consecrated past. One lovely Saturday I had been out all the morning. I had not walked far, for I had sat in the various places longer than I had walked, my path lying through fields and copses, crossing a country road only now and then. I had my Greek Testament with me, and I read when I sat, and thought when I walked. I remember well enough that I was going to preach about the cloud of witnesses, and explain to my people that this did not mean persons looking at, witnessing our behavior. Not so could any addition be made to the awfulness of the fact that the eye of God was upon us. But witnesses to the truth, people who did what God wanted them to do, come of it what might, whether a crown or a rack, scoffs or applause. To behold those witnessing might well rouse all that was human and divine in us to choose our part with them and their Lord. When I came home, I had an early dinner, and then betook myself to my Saturday's resort. I had never had a room large enough to satisfy me before. Now my study was to my mind. All through the slowly fading afternoon, the autumn of the day, when the colors are richest and the shadows long and lengthening, I paced my solemn old thoughted church. Sometimes I went up into the pulpit and sat there, looking on the ancient walls which had grown up under men's hands, that men might be helped to pray by the visible symbol of unity which the walls gave, and that the voice of the Spirit of God might be heard exhorting men to forsake the evil and choose the good. And I thought how many witnesses to the truth had knelt in those ancient pews. For as the great church is made up of numberless communities, so is the great shining orb of witness-bearers made up of millions of lesser orbs. All men and women of true heart bear individual testimony to the truth of God, saying, I have trusted and found him faithful. And the feeble light of the glow-worm is yet light, pure and good, and with a loveliness of its own. So, O Lord, I said, let my light shine before men and I felt no fear of vanity in such a prayer, for I knew that the glory to come of it is to God only, that men may glorify their Father in heaven. And I knew that when we seek glory for ourselves, the light goes out, and the horror that dwells in darkness breathes cold upon our spirits. And I remember that, just as I thought thus, my eye was caught first by a yellow light that gilded the apex of the font cover, which had been wrought like a flame or a bursting blossom. It was so old and worn I never could tell which. And then by a red light all over a white marble tablet in the wall, the red of life on the cold hue of the grave. And this red light did not come from any work of man's device, but from the great window of the West, which little Gerard Weir wanted to help God to paint. I must have been in a happy mood that Saturday afternoon, for everything pleased me and made me happier, and all the church forms about me blended and harmonized graciously with the throne and footstool of God which I saw through the windows, and I lingered on till the night had come, till the church only gloomed about me and had no shine, and then I found my spirit burning up the clearer, as a lamp which has been flaming all the day with light unseen becomes a glory in the room when the sun has gone down. At length I felt tired and would go home, yet I lingered for a few moments in the vestry, thinking what hymns would harmonize best with the things I wanted to make my people think about. It was now almost quite dark out of doors, at least as dark as it would be. Suddenly, 
Through the gloom I thought I heard a moan and a sob. I sat upright in my chair and listened, but I heard nothing more, and concluded I had deceived myself. After a few moments I rose to go home and have some tea, and turn my mind rather away from than towards the subject of witness-bearing any more for that night, lest I should burn the fuel of it out before I came to warm the people with it, and should have to blow its embers instead of flashing its light and heat upon them in gladness. So I left the church by my vestry door, which I closed behind me, and took my way along the path through the clustering group of graves. Again I heard a sob. This time I was sure of it, and there lay something dark upon one of the grassy mounds. I approached it, but it did not move. I spoke. "'Can I be of any use to you?' I said. "'No,' returned an almost inaudible voice. Though I did not know whose was the grave, I knew that no one had been buried there very lately, and if the grief were for the loss of the dead, it was more than probably aroused to fresh vigour by recent misfortune. I stooped, and taking the figure by the arm, said, "'Come with me, and let us see what can be done for you.' I then saw that it was a youth, perhaps scarcely more than a boy, and as soon as I saw that, I knew that his grief could hardly be incurable. He returned no answer, but rose at once to his feet and submitted to be led away. I took him the shortest road to my house through the shrubbery, brought him into the study, made him sit down in my easy chair, and rang for lights and wine, for the dew had been falling heavily, and his clothes were quite dank. But when the wine came, he refused to take any. "'But you want it,' I said. "'No, sir, I don't indeed.' "'Take some for my sake, then.' "'I would rather not, sir.' Why? I promised my father a year ago, when I left home, that I would not drink anything stronger than water, and I can't break my promise now. Where is your home? In the village, sir. That wasn't your father's grave I found you upon, was it? No, sir, it was my mother's. Then your father is still alive? Yes, sir, you know him very well. Thomas Weir. Ah! He told me he had a son in London. Are you that son? Yes, sir, answered the youth, swallowing a rising sob. Then what is the matter? Your father is a good friend of mine, and would tell you you might trust me. I don't doubt it, sir. But you won't believe me any more than my father. By this time I had perused his person, his dress, and his countenance. He was of middle size, but evidently not full-grown. His dress was very decent, his face was pale and thin, and revealed a likeness to his father. He had blue eyes that looked full at me, and, as far as I could judge, betokened, along with the whole of his expression, an honest and sensitive nature. I found him very attractive, and was therefore the more emboldened to press for the knowledge of his story. I cannot promise to believe whatever you say, but almost I could and if you tell me the truth, I like you too much already to be in great danger of doubting you, for you know the truth has a force of its own. I thought so till to-night, he answered, but if my father would not believe me, how can I expect you to do so, sir? Your father may have been too much troubled by your story to be able to do it justice. It is not a bit like your father to be unfair. No, sir and so much the less chance of your believing me. Somehow his talk prepossessed me still more in his favour. There was a certain refinement in it, a quality of dialogue which indicated thought, as I judged, and I became more and more certain that, whatever I might have to think of it, when told, he would yet tell me the truth. "'Come, try me,' I said. "'I will, sir, but I must begin at the beginning.' begin where you like. I have nothing more to do to-night, and you may take what time you please. But I will ring for tea first, for I dare say you have not made any promise about that." A faint smile flickered on his face. He was evidently beginning to feel a little more comfortable. "'When did you arrive from London?' I asked. 
about two hours ago, I suppose. Bring tea, Mrs. Pearson, and that cold chicken and ham and plenty of toast. We are both hungry. Mrs. Pearson gave a questioning look at the lad and departed to do her duty. When she returned with the tray, I saw by the unconsciously eager way in which he looked at the eatables that he had had nothing for some time, and so, even after we were left alone, I would not let him say a word till he had made a good meal. It was delightful to see how he ate. Few troubles will destroy a growing lad's hunger, and indeed it has always been to me a marvel how the feelings and the appetites affect each other. I have known grief actually make people, and not sensual people at all, quite hungry. At last I thought I had better not offer him any more. After the tea-things had been taken away, I put the candles out, and the moon, which had risen nearly full while we were at tea, shone into the room. I had thought that he might possibly find it easier to tell his story in the moonlight, which, if there were any shame in the recital, would not, by too much revelation, reduce him to the despair of Macbeth, when feeling that he could contemplate his deed, but not his deed and himself together, he exclaimed, To know my deed, twere best not know myself. So, sitting by the window in the moonlight, he told his tale. The moon lighted up his pale face as he told it, and gave rather a wild expression to his eyes, eager to find faith in me. I have not much of the dramatic in me, I know, and I am rather a flat teller of stories on that account. I shall not, therefore, seeing there is no necessity for it, attempt to give the tale in his own words, but indeed, when I think of it, they did not differ so much from the form of my own, for he had, I presume, lost his provincialisms, and being, as I found afterwards, a reader of the best books that came in his way, had not caught up many cockneyisms instead. He had filled a place in the employment of Messrs. Blank and Company, large silk mercers, linen drapers, etc., etc., in London. For all the trades are mingled now. His work at first was to accompany one of the carts which delivered the purchases of the day. But, I presume, because he showed himself to be a smart lad, they took him at length into the shop to wait behind the counter. This he did not like so much, but, as it was considered a rise in life, made no objection to the change. He seemed to himself to get on pretty well. He soon learned all the marks on the goods intended to be understood by the shopmen and within a few months believed that he was found generally useful. He had as yet had no distinct department allotted to him, but was moved from place to place, according as the local pressure of business might demand. "'I confess,' he said, "'that I was not always satisfied with what was going on about me. I mean I could not help doubting if everything was done on the square, as they say. But nothing came plainly in my way.' and so I could honestly say it did not concern me. I took care to be straightforward for my part, and, knowing only the prices marked for the sale of the goods, I had nothing to do with anything else. But one day, while I was showing a lady some handkerchiefs which were marked as Mouchoir de Paris—I don't know if I pronounce it right, sir—she said she did not believe they were French cambric, and I, knowing nothing about it, said nothing. But happening to look up while we both stood silent, the lady examining the handkerchiefs, and I doing nothing, till she should have made up her mind, I caught sight of the eyes of the shop-walker, as they call the man who shows customers where to go for what they want, and sees that they are attended to. He is a fat man, dressed in black, with a great gold chain, which they say in the shop is only copper gilt. But that doesn't matter, only it would be the liker himself. He was standing staring at me. I could not tell what to make of it, but from that day I often caught him watching me, as if I had been a customer suspected of shoplifting. Still, I only thought he was very disagreeable, and tried to forget him. One day, the day before yesterday, two ladies, an old lady and a young one, came into the shop and wanted to look at some shawls. It was dinner-time, and most of the men were in the house at their dinner. The shop-walker sent me to them, and then, I do believe, though I did not see him, stood behind a pillar to watch me. 
as he had been in the way of doing more openly. I thought I had seen the ladies before, and though I could not then tell where, I am now almost sure they were Mrs. and Miss Oldcastle of the hall. They wanted to buy a cashmere for the young lady. I showed them some. They wanted better. I brought the best we had, inquiring that I might make no mistake. They asked the price. I told them. They said they were not good enough, and wanted to see some more. I told them they were the best we had. They looked at them again, said they were sorry, but the shawls were not good enough, and left the shop without buying anything. I proceeded to take the shawls upstairs again, and as I went passed the shop-walker, whom I had not observed while I was attending to the ladies. "'You're for no good, young man,' he said, with a nasty sneer. "'What do you mean by that, Mr. B?' I asked, for his sneer made me angry. "'You'll know before to-morrow,' he answered, and walked away. That same evening, as we were shutting up shop, I was sent for— to the principal's room. The moment I entered, he said, "'You won't suit us, young man. I find you had better pack up your box to-night, and be off to-morrow. There's your quarter's salary.' "'What have I done?' I asked in astonishment, and yet with a vague suspicion of the matter. "'It's not what you've done, but what you don't do,' he answered. "'Do you think we can afford to keep you here and pay you wages to send people away from the shop?' without buying? If you do, you're mistaken, that's all. You may go. But what could I do? I said. I suppose that spy, B— I believe I said so, sir. Now, now, young man, none of your sauce, said Mr. Blank. Honest people don't think about spies. I thought it was for honesty you were getting rid of me, I said. Mr. Blank rose to his feet, his lips white, and pointed to the door. "'Take your money and be off, and mind you don't refer me for a character. After such impudence I couldn't in conscience give you one.' Then, calming down a little when he saw I turned to go, "'You had better take to your hands again, for your head will never keep you. There, be off,' he said, pushing the money towards me, and turning his back to me. I could not touch it. "'Keep the money, Mr. Blank.' I said, it'll make up for what you've lost by me. And I left the room at once without waiting for an answer. While I was packing my box, one of my chums came in, and I told him all about it. He is a rather good fellow, that, sir. But he laughed, and said, What a fool you are, Weir! You'll never make your daily bread, and you needn't think it. If you knew what I know, you'd have known better. And it's very odd it was about shawls, too. I'll tell you. As you're going away, you won't let it out. Mr. Blank, that was the same who had just turned me away, was serving some ladies himself, for he wasn't above being in the shop like his partner. They wanted the best Indian shawl they could get. None of those he showed them were good enough, for the ladies really didn't know one from another. They always go by the price you ask. And Mr. Blank knew that well enough. He had sent me upstairs for the shawls, and as I brought them he said, "'These are the best imported, madam.' There were three ladies, and one shook her head, and another shook her head, and they all shook their heads. And then Mr. Blank was sorry, I believe you, that he had said they were the best. But you won't catch him in a trap. He's too old a fox for that. I'm telling you, sir, what Johnson told me. He looked close down at the shawls, as if he were short-sighted, though he could see as far as any man. "'I beg your pardon, ladies,' said he. "'You're right. I am quite wrong. What a stupid blunder to make! And yet they did deceive me. Here, Johnson, take these shawls away. How could you be so stupid? I will fetch the thing you want myself, ladies.' So I went with him. He chose out three or four shawls of the nicest patterns, from the very same lot, marked in the very same way, folded them differently, and gave them to me to carry down. "'Now, ladies, here they are,' he said. "'These are quite a different thing, as you will see. And indeed they cost half as much again. In five minutes they had bought two of them. 
and pay just half as much more than he had asked for them the first time. That's Mr. Blank. And that's what you should have done if you had wanted to keep your place. But I assure you, sir, I could not help being glad to be out of it. But there is nothing in all this to be miserable about, I said. You did your duty. It would be all right, sir, if father believed me. I don't want to be idle, I'm sure. Does your father think you do? I don't know what he thinks. He won't speak to me. I told my story, as much of it as he would let me, at least. But he wouldn't listen to me. He only said he knew better than that. I couldn't bear it. He always was rather hard upon us. I'm sure if you hadn't been so kind to me, sir, I don't know what I should have done by this time. I haven't another friend in the world. Yes, you have. Your father in heaven is your friend. I don't know that, sir. I'm not good enough. That's quite true. But you would never have done your duty if he had not been with you. Do you think so, sir? He returned, eagerly. Indeed I do. Everything good comes from the Father of Lights. Every one that walks in any glimmering of light walks so far in His light. For there is no light, only darkness, comes from below. And man apart from God can generate no light. He's not meant to be separated from God, you see. And only think then what light He can give you if you will turn to Him and ask for it. What He has given you should make you long for more. For what you have is not enough. Ah, far from it. I think I understand. But I didn't feel good at all in the matter. I didn't see any other way of doing. So much the better. We ought never to feel good. We are but unprofitable servants at best. There is no merit in doing your duty. Only you would have been a poor wretched creature not to do as you did. And now, instead of making yourself miserable over the consequences of it, you ought to bear them like a man, with courage and hope thanking God that He has made you suffer for righteousness' sake, and denied you the success and praise of cheating. I will go to your father at once, and find out what he is thinking about it, for no doubt Mr. Blank has written to him with his version of the story. Perhaps he will be more inclined to believe you when he finds that I believe you. Oh, thank you, sir, cried the lad, and jumped up from his seat to go with me. No, I said, you had better stay where you are. I shall be able to speak more freely if you are not present. Here is a book to amuse yourself with. I do not think I shall be long gone. But I was longer gone than I thought I should be. When I reached the carpenter's house, I found, to my surprise, that he was still at work. By the light of a single tallow candle placed beside him on the bench, he was ploughing away at a groove. His pale face, of which the lines were unusually sharp, as I might have expected after what had occurred, was the sole object that reflected the light of the candle to my eyes as I entered the gloomy place. He looked up, but without even greeting me, dropped his face again, and went on with his work. "'What?' I said cheerily, for I believed that, like Gideon's pitcher, I held dark within me the light that would discomfit his Midianites which consciousness may well make the pitcher cheery inside, even while the light, as yet, is all its own, worthless till it break out upon the world, and cease to illuminate only glazed pitcher sides. What? I said. Working so late? Yes, sir. It is not usual with you, I know. It's all a humbug, he said fiercely, but coldly notwithstanding as he stood erect from his work and turned his white face full on me, of which, however, the eyes drooped. It's all a humbug, and I don't mean to be humbugged any more. Am I a humbug? I returned, not quite taken by surprise. I don't say that. Don't make a personal thing of it, sir. You're taken in, I believe, like the rest of us. Tell me that a god governs the world. What have I done to be used like this? I thought with myself how I could retort for his young son. What has he done to be used like this? But that was not my way, though it might work well enough in some hands. Some men are called to be prophets. I could only stand and wait. 
"'It would be wrong in me to pretend ignorance,' I said, "'of what you mean. I know all about it.' "'Do you? He has been to you, has he? But you don't know all about it, sir, the impudence of the young rascal.' He paused for a moment. "'A man like me,' he resumed, becoming eloquent in his indignation, and as I thought afterwards entirely justifying what Wordsworth says about the language of the so-called uneducated, a man like me, who was as proud of his honour as any aristocrat in the country, prouder than any of them would grant me the right to be. Not too careful of it, I said, but I was thankful he did not heed me, for the speech would only have irritated him. He went on. Me to be treated like this. One child a— Here came a terrible break in his speech, but he tried again. And the other a— Instead of finishing the sentence, however, he drove his plough fiercely through the groove, splitting off some inches of the wall of it at the end. "'If any one has treated you so,' I said, "'it must be the devil, not God. But if there was a God, he could have prevented it all. Mind what I said to you once before. He hasn't done yet. And there is another enemy in his way as bad as the devil.' I mean ourselves. When people want to walk their own way without God, God lets them try it, and then the devil gets a hold of them, but God won't let him keep them. As soon as they are wearied in the greatness of their way, they begin to look about for a Saviour, and then they find God ready to pardon, ready to help, not breaking the bruised reed, leading them to his own self manifest, with whom no man can fear any longer, Jesus Christ the righteous lover of men, their elder brother, what we call big brother, you know, one to help them and take their part against the devil, the world, and the flesh, and all the rest of the wicked powers. So you see God is tender, just like the prodigal son's father, only with this difference that God has millions of prodigals and never gets tired of going out to meet them and welcome them back, every one as if he were the only prodigal son he ever had. There's a father, indeed. Have you been such a father to your son? The prodigal didn't come with a pack of lies. He told his father the truth, bad as it was. How do you know that your son didn't tell you the truth? All the young men that go from home don't do as the prodigal did. Why should you not believe what he tells you? I'm not one to reckon without my host. Here's my bill. And so saying, he handed me a letter. I took it and read. Sir, it has become our painful duty to inform you that your son has this day been discharged from the employment of Messrs. Blank and Company. His conduct not being such as to justify the confidence hitherto reposed in him. It would have been contrary to the interests of the establishment to continue him longer behind the counter although we are not prepared to urge anything against him beyond the fact that he has shown himself absolutely indifferent to the interests of his employers. We trust that the chief blame will be found to lie with certain connections of a kind easy to be formed in large cities, and that the loss of his situation may be punishment sufficient, if not for justice, yet to make him consider his ways and be wise. We enclose his quarter's salary, which the young man rejected with insult, and we remain, etc., blank and company. And, I exclaimed, this is what you found your judgment of your own son upon? You reject him unheard, and take the word of a stranger. I don't wonder you cannot believe in your father when you behave so to your son. I don't say your conclusion is false, though I don't believe it. But I do say— the grounds you go upon are anything but sufficient. You don't mean to tell me that a man of Mr. Blank's standing, who has one of the largest shops in London, and whose brother is mayor of Addishead, would slander a poor lad like that? Oh, you mammon worshipper! I cried, because a man has one of the largest shops in London, and his brother is mayor of Addishead? You take his testimony and refuse your son's? I did not know the boy till this evening, but I call upon you to bring back to your memory 
all that you have known of him from his childhood, and then ask yourself whether there is not, at least, as much probability of his having remained honest as of the master of a great London shop being infallible in his conclusions, at which conclusions, whatever they be, I confess no man can wonder, after seeing how readily his father listens to his defamation. I spoke with warmth. Before I had done, the pale face of the carpenter was red as fire, for he had been acting contrary to all his own theories of human equality, and that in a shameful manner. Still, whether convinced or not, he would not give in. He only drove away at his work, which he was utterly destroying. His mouth was closed so tight he looked as if he had his jaw locked, and his eyes gleamed over the ruined board with a light which seemed to me to have more of obstinacy in it than contrition. "'Ah, Thomas,' I said, taking up the speech once more, if God had behaved to us as you have behaved to your boy, be he innocent, be he guilty, there's not a man or woman of all our lost race would have returned to him from the time of Adam till now. I don't wonder that you find it difficult to believe in him. And with those words I left the shop, determined to overwhelm the unbeliever with proof, and put him to shame before his own soul, whence, I thought, would come even more good to him than to his son. For there was a great deal of self-satisfaction mixed up with the man's honesty, and the sooner that had a blow the better. It might prove a death-blow in the long run. It was pride that lay at the root of his hardness. He visited the daughter's fault upon the son. His daughter had disgraced him, and he was ready to flash into wrath with his son upon any imputation which recalled to him the torture he had undergone when his daughter's dishonor came first to the light. Her he had never forgiven, and now his pride flung his son out after her upon the first suspicion. His imagination had filled up all the blanks in the wicked insinuations of Mr. Blank. He concluded that he had taken money to spend in the worst company, and had so disgraced him beyond forgiveness. His pride paralyzed his love. He thought more about himself than about his children. His own shame outweighed, in his estimation, the sadness of their guilt. It was a less matter that they should be guilty than that he, their father, should be disgraced. End of chapter 13《Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood》by George MacDonald Chapter 13, Part 2 Thinking over all this, and forgetting how late it was, I found myself halfway up the avenue of the hall. I wanted to find out whether young Weir's fancy that the ladies he had failed in serving, or rather whom he had really served with honesty, were Mrs. and Miss Oldcastle, was correct. What a point it would be if it was! I should not then be satisfied except I would prevail on Miss Oldcastle to accompany me to Thomas Weir, and shame the faithlessness out of him. So eager was I after certainty that it was not till I stood before the house that I saw clearly the impropriety of attempting anything further that night. One light only was burning in the whole front, and that was on the first floor. Glancing up at it, I knew not why, as I turned to go down the hill again, I saw a corner of the blind drawn aside and a face peeping out, whose I could not tell. This was uncomfortable for what could be taking me there at such a time? But I walked steadily away, certain I could not escape recognition, and determining to refer to this ill-considered visit when I called the next day. I would not put it off till Monday. I was resolved. I lingered on the bridge as I went home, 
Not a light was to be seen in the village except one over Catherine Weir's shop. There were not many restless souls in my parish. Not so many as there ought to be. Yet gladly would I see the troubled in peace, not a moment, though, before their troubles should have brought them, where the weary and heavy-laden can alone find rest to their souls, finding the Father's peace in the Son, the Father himself reconciling them to himself. How still the night was! My soul hung, as it were, suspended in stillness. For the whole sphere of heaven seemed to be about me, the stars above shining as clear below in the mirror of the all but motionless water. It was a pure type of the rest that remaineth. Rest, the one immovable centre, wherein lie all the stores of might, whence issue all forces, all influences of making and moulding. And indeed, I said to myself, after all the noise, uproar, and strife that there is on the earth, after all the tempests, earthquakes, and volcanic outbursts, there is yet more of peace than of tumult in the world. How many nights like this glide away in loveliness when deep sleep hath fallen upon men, and they know neither how still their repose nor how beautiful the sleep of nature! Ah! what must the stillness of the kingdom be! When the heavenly day's work is done, with what a gentle wing will the night come down! But I bethink me, the rest there, as here, will be the presence of God, and if we have Him with us, the battlefield itself will be, if not quiet, yet as full of peace as this night of stars. So I spoke to myself, and went home. I had little immediate comfort to give my young guest, but I had plenty of hope. I told him he must stay in the house to-morrow, for it would be better to have the reconciliation with his father over before he appeared in public. So the next day neither Weir was at church. As soon as the afternoon service was over, I went once more to the hall, and was shown into the drawing-room, a great faded room in which the prevailing color was a dingy gold, hence called the yellow drawing-room when the house had more than one. It looked down upon the lawn, which, although little expense was now laid out on any of the ornamental adjuncts of the hall, was still kept very nice. There sat Mrs. Oldcastle reading with her face to the house. A little way farther on Miss Oldcastle sat with a book on her knee, but her gaze fixed on the widespread landscape before her, of which, however, she seemed to be as inobservant as of her book. I caught glimpses of Judy flitting hither and thither among the trees, never a moment in one place. Fearful of having an interview with the old lady alone, which was not likely to lead to what I wanted, I stepped from a window which was open, out upon the terrace, and thence down the steps to the lawn below. The servant had just informed Mrs. Oldcastle of my visit when I came near. She drew herself up in her chair and evidently chose to regard my approach as an intrusion. "'I did not expect a visit from you to-day, Mr. Walton, you will allow me to say.' "'I am doing Sunday work,' I answered. "'Will you kindly tell me whether you were in London on Thursday last? But stay, allow me to ask Miss Oldcastle to join us.' Without waiting for answer, I went to Miss Oldcastle, and begged her to come and listen to something in which I wanted her help. She rose courteously, though without cordiality, and accompanied me to her mother, who sat with perfect rigidity, watching us. "'Again, let me ask,' I said, "'if you were in London on Thursday.' Though I addressed the old lady, the answer came from her daughter. "'Yes, we were.' Were you in Blank and Companies in Blank Street? But now before Miss Oldcastle could reply, her mother interposed. Are we charged with shoplifting, Mr. Walton? Really, one is not accustomed to such cross-questioning except from a lawyer. Have patience with me for a moment, I returned. I am not going to be mysterious for more than two or three questions. Please tell me whether you were in that shop or not. I believe we were, said the mother. Yes, certainly, said the daughter. Did you buy anything? No, we, 
Miss Oldcastle began. "'Not a word more,' I exclaimed eagerly. "'Come with me at once.' "'What do you mean, Mr. Walton?' said the mother, with a sort of cold indignation, while the daughter looked surprised, but said nothing. "'I beg your pardon for my impetuosity, but much is in your power at this moment. The son of one of my parishioners has come home in trouble. His father, Thomas Weir—' "'Ah!' said Mrs. Oldcastle, in a tone considerably at strife with refinement, but I took no notice. His father will not believe his story. The lad thinks you were the ladies in serving whom he got into trouble. I am so confident he tells the truth that I want Miss Oldcastle to be so kind as to accompany me to Weir's house. Really, Mr. Walton, I am astonished at your making such a request, exclaimed Mrs. Oldcastle, with suitable emphasis on every salient syllable, while her white face flushed with anger. To ask Miss Oldcastle to accompany you to the dwelling of the ringleader of all the canale of the neighborhood. It is for the sake of justice, I interposed. That is no concern of ours. Let them fight it out between them. I am sure any trouble that comes of it is no more than they all deserve. A low family, men and women of them. I assure you, I think very differently. I dare say you do. But neither your opinion nor mine has anything to do with the matter. Here I turned to Miss Oldcastle, and went on. It is a chance which seldom occurs in one's life, Miss Oldcastle, a chance of setting wrong right by a word. And as a minister of the gospel of truth and love, I beg you to assist me with your presence to that end. I would have spoken more strongly but I knew that her word given to me would be enough without her presence. At the same time I felt not only that there would be a propriety in her taking a personal interest in the matter, but that it would do her good, and tend to create a favor towards each other in some of my flock between whom at present there seemed to be nothing in common. But at my last words Mrs. Oldcastle rose to her feet, no longer red, now whiter than her usual whiteness with passion. "'You dare to persist? You take advantage of your profession to persist in dragging my daughter into a vile dispute between mechanics of the lowest class, against the positive command of her only parent. Have you no respect for her position in society? For her sex? Mr. Walton, you act in a manner unworthy of your cloth. I had stood looking in her eyes with as much self-possession as I could muster, and I believe I should have borne it all quietly, but for that last word. If there is one epithet I hate more than another, it is that execrable word cloth, used for the office of a clergyman. I have no time to set forth its offence now. If my reader cannot feel it, I do not care to make him feel it. Only I am sorry to say it overcame my temper. Madam, I said, I owe nothing to my tailor, but I owe God my whole being, and my neighbor all I can do for him. He that loveth not his brother is a murderer, or murderous, as the case may be. At that word murderous, her face became livid, and she turned away without reply. By this time her daughter was halfway to the house. She followed her and here I was left to go home, with the full knowledge that, partly from trying to gain too much, and partly from losing my temper, I had at best but a mangled and unsatisfactory testimony to carry back to Thomas Weir. Of course I walked away, around the end of the house and down the avenue, and the farther I went the more mortified I grew. It was not merely the shame of losing my temper, though that was a shame and with a woman, too, merely because she used a common epithet. But I saw that it must appear very strange to the carpenter that I was not able to give a more explicit account of some sort, what I had learned not being in the least decisive in the matter. It only amounted to this, that Mrs. and Miss Oldcastle were in the shop on the very day on which Weir was dismissed. It proved that so much of what he had told me was correct. Nothing more. 
and if I tried to better the matter by explaining how I had offended them, would it not deepen the very hatred I had hoped to overcome? In fact, I stood convicted before the tribunal of my own conscience of having lost all the certain good of my attempt, in part at least from the foolish desire to produce a conviction of Weir, rather than in Weir which should be triumphant after a melodramatic fashion, and, must I confess it, should punish him for not believing in his son when I did. Forgetting in my miserable selfishness that not to believe in his son was an unspeakably worse punishment in itself than any conviction or consequent shame brought about by the most overwhelming of stage effects, I assure my reader I felt humiliated. Now I think humiliation is a very different condition of mind from humility. Humiliation no man can desire. It is shame and torture. Humility is the true right condition of humanity, peaceful, divine. And yet a man may gladly welcome humiliation when it comes, if he finds that with fierce shock and rude revulsion it has turned him right round, with his face away from pride, whither he was travelling, and towards humility however far away upon the horizon's verge she may sit waiting for him. To me, however, there came a gentle and not therefore less effective dissolution of the bonds both of pride and humiliation. And before Weir and I met, I was nearly as anxious to heal his wounded spirit as I was to work justice for his son. I was walking slowly, with burning cheek and downcast eyes, the one of conflict, the other of shame and defeat, away from the great house, which seemed to be staring after me down the avenue with all its window eyes, when suddenly my deliverance came. At a somewhat sharp turn, where the avenue changed into a winding road, Miss Oldcastle stood waiting for me, the glow of haste upon her cheek, and the firmness of resolution upon her lips. Once more I was startled by her sudden presence, but she did not smile. Mr. Walton, what do you want me to do? I would not willing refuse, if it is, as you say, really my duty to go with you. I cannot be positive about that, I answered. I think I put it too strongly. But it would be a considerable advantage, I think, if you would go with me, and let me ask you a few questions in the presence of Thomas Weir. It will have more effect if I am able to tell him that I have only learned as yet that you were in the shop on that day and refer him to you for the rest. I will go. A thousand thanks. But how did you manage to— Here I stopped, not knowing how to finish the question. You are surprised that I came notwithstanding Mamma's objection to my going? I confess I am. I should not have been surprised at Judy's doing so now. She was silent for a moment. Do you think obedience to parents is to last forever? The honor is, of course, but I am surely old enough to be right in following my conscience, at least. You mistake me. That is not the difficulty at all. Of course you ought to do what is right against the highest authority on earth, which I take to be just the parental. What I am surprised at is your courage. Not because of its degree, only that it is mine and she sighed. She was quite right, and I did not know what to answer. But she resumed. I know I am cowardly, but if I cannot dare, I can bear. Is it not strange? With my mother looking at me, I dare not say a word, dare hardly move against her will. And it is not always a good will. I cannot honor my mother as I would. But the moment her eyes are off me, I can do anything, knowing the consequences perfectly and just as regardless of them. For, as I tell you, Mr. Walton, I can endure, and you do not know what that might come to mean with my mother. Once she kept me shut up in my room, and sent me only bread and water, for a whole week, to the very hour. Not that I minded that much, but it will let you know a little of my position in my own home. That is why I walked away before her. I saw what was coming. 
and Miss Oldcastle drew herself up with more expression of pride than I had yet seen in her, revealing to me that perhaps I had hitherto quite misunderstood the source of her apparent haughtiness. I could not reply for indignation. My silence must have been the cause of what she said next. Ah! You think I have no right to speak so about my own mother. Well, well, but indeed I would not have done so a month ago. If I am silent, Miss Oldcastle, it is that my sympathy is too strong for me. There are mothers and mothers, and for a mother not to be a mother is too dreadful. She made no reply. I resumed. It will seem cruel, perhaps, certainly in saying it, I lay myself open to the rejoinder that talk is so easy. Still I shall feel more honest when I have said it. The only thing I feel should be altered in your conduct, forgive me, is that you should dare your mother. Do not think, for it is an unfortunate phrase, that my meaning is a vulgar one. If it were, I should at least know better than to utter it to you. What I mean is, that you ought to be able to be and do the same before your mother's eyes that you are and do when she is out of sight. I mean that you should look in your mother's eyes and do what is right. I know that, know it well, she emphasized the words as I do. But you do not know what a spell she casts upon me, how impossible it is to do as you say. Difficult, I allow. Impossible, not. You will never be free till you do so. You are too hard upon me. Besides, though you will scarcely be able to believe it now, I do honor her, and cannot help feeling that by doing as I do I avoid irreverence, impertinence, rudeness, whichever is the right word for what I mean. I understand you perfectly, but the truth is more than propriety of behavior, even to a parent and indeed it has in it a deeper reverence, or the germ of it at least, than any adherence to the mere code of respect. If you once did as I want you to do, you would find that in reality you both revered and loved your mother more than you do now. You may be right, but I am certain you speak without any real idea of the difficulty. That may be, and yet what I say remains just as true. How could I meet violence, for instance? Impossible. She returned no reply. We walked in silence for some minutes. At length she said, My mother's self-will amounts to madness, I do believe. I have yet to learn where she would stop of herself. All self-will is madness, I returned, stupidly enough, for what is the use of making general remarks when you have a terrible concrete before you? To want one's own way, just and only because it is one's own way, is the height of madness. Perhaps. But when madness has to be encountered as if it were sense, it makes it no easier to know that it is madness. Does your uncle give you no help? He. Poor man. He is as frightened at her as I am. He dares not even go away. He did not know what he was coming to when he came to Old Castle Hall. Dear uncle, I owe him a great deal. But for any help of that sort, he is of no more use than a child. I believe Mama looks upon him as half an idiot. He can do anything or everything but help one to live, to be anything. Oh, me! I am so tired! And the proud lady, as I had thought her, perhaps not incorrectly, burst out crying. What was I to do? I did not know in the least. What I said I do not even now know. But by this time we were at the gate, and as soon as we had passed the guardian monstrosities, we found the open road an effectual antidote to tears. When we came within sight of the old house where Weir lived, Miss Oldcastle became again a little curious as to what I required of her. Trust me, I said, there is nothing mysterious about it. Only I prefer the truth to come out fresh in the ears of the man most concerned. I do trust you, she answered. And we knocked at the house door. Thomas Weir himself opened the door, with a candle in his hand. He looked very much astonished to see his lady visitor. He asked us 
politely enough to walk upstairs, and ushered us into the large room I have already described. There sat the old man, as I had first seen him, by the side of the fire. He received us with more than politeness, with courtesy, and I could not help glancing at Miss Oldcastle to see what impression this family of low, free-thinking Republicans made upon her. It was easy to discover that the impression was a favorable surprise. But I was as much surprised at her behavior as she was at theirs. Not a haughty tone was to be heard in her voice, not a haughty movement to be seen in her form. She accepted the chair offered her, and sat down, perfectly at home, by the fireside, only that she turned towards me, waiting for what explanation I might think proper to give. Before I had time to speak, however, old Mr. Weir broke the silence. "'I've been telling Tom, sir, as I've told him many a time afore, as how he's a deal too hard with his children.' "'Father,' interrupted Thomas angrily, "'have patience a bit, my boy,' persisted the old man, turning again towards me. "'Now, sir, he won't even hear young Tom's side of the story.' And I say that boy won't tell him no lie, if he's the same boy he went away. I tell you, father, again began Thomas, but this time I interposed, to prevent useless talk beforehand. Thomas, I said, listen to me. I have heard your son's side of the story. Because of something he said, I went to Miss Oldcastle, and asked her whether she was in his late master's shop last Thursday. That is all I have asked her, and all she has told me is that she was. I know no more than you what she is going to reply to my questions now, but I have no doubt her answers will correspond to your son's story. I then put my questions to Miss Oldcastle, whose answers amounted to this, that they had wanted to buy a shawl, that they had seen none good enough, that they had left the shop without buying anything and that they had been waited upon by a young man who, while perfectly polite and attentive to their wants, did not seem to have the ways or manners of a London shop-lad. I then told them the story as young Tom had related it to me, and asked if his sister was not in the house and might not go to fetch him. But she was with her sister Catherine. "'I think, Mr. Walton, if you have done with me, I ought to go home now,' said Miss Oldcastle. "'Certainly,' I answered. I will take you home at once. I am greatly obliged to you for coming." "'Indeed, sir,' said the old man, rising with difficulty, "'we're obliged to both you and the lady more than we can tell, to take such a deal of trouble for us. But you see, sir, you're one of them as thinks a man's got his duty to do one way or another, whether he be clergyman or carpenter. God bless you, miss. You're of the right sort which you'll excuse an old man, miss, as'll never see you again till you've got the wings you ought to have." Miss Oldcastle smiled very sweetly, and answered nothing, but shook hands with them both, and bade them good-night. Weir could not speak a word. He could hardly even lift his eyes. But a red spot glowed on each of his pale cheeks, making him look very like his daughter Catherine. And I could see Miss Oldcastle wince and grow red, too with the grip he gave her hand. But she smiled again none the less sweetly. "'I will see Miss Oldcastle home, and then go back to my house and bring the boy with me,' I said, as we left. It was some time before either of us spoke. The sun was setting, the sky, the earth, and the air lovely with rosy light, and the world full of that peculiar calm which belongs to the evening of the day of rest. Surely the world ought to wake better on the morrow. "'Not very dangerous people, those, Miss Oldcastle,' I said at last. "'I thank you very much for taking me to see them,' she returned cordially. "'You won't believe all you may happen to hear against the working people now?' "'I never did. There are ill-conditioned, cross-grained, low-minded, selfish, unbelieving people amongst them. God knows it but there are ladies and gentlemen amongst them, too. That old man is a gentleman. He is. And the only way to teach them all to be such is to be such to them. 
The man who does not show himself a gentleman to the working people, why should I call them the poor? Some of them are better off than many of the rich, for they can pay their debts, and do it. I had forgotten the beginning of my sentence. You were saying that the man who does not show himself a gentleman to the poor is no gentleman at all, only a gentle without the man. And if you consult my namesake, old Isaac, you will find what that is. I will look. I know your way now. You won't tell me anything I can find out for myself. Is it not the best way? Yes, because for one thing you find out so much more than you look for. Certainly that has been my own experience. Are you a descendant of Isaac Walton? No. I believe there are none. But I hope I have so much of his spirit that I can do two things like him. Tell me. Live in the country, though I was not brought up in it, and know a good man when I see him. I am very glad you asked me to go to-night. If people only knew their own brothers and sisters, the kingdom of heaven would not be far off. I do not think Miss Oldcastle quite liked this, for she was silent thereafter, though I allow that her silence was not conclusive, and we had now come close to the house. I wish I could help you, I said. In what? To bear what I fear is waiting you. I told you I was equal to that. It is where we are unequal that we want help. You may have to give it me some day. Who knows? I left her most unwillingly in the porch, just as Sarah, the white wolf, had her hand on the door, rejoicing in my heart, however, over her last words. My reader will not be surprised after all this if, before I get very much further with my story, I have to confess that I loved Miss Oldcastle. When young Tom and I entered the room, his grandfather rose and tottered to meet him. His father made one step towards him, and then hesitated. Of all conditions of the human mind, that of being ashamed of himself must have been the strangest to Thomas Weir. The man had never in his life, I believe, done anything mean or dishonest, and therefore he had had less frequent opportunities than most people of being ashamed of himself. Hence his fall had been from another pinnacle, that of pride. When a man thinks it such a fine thing to have done right, he might almost as well have done wrong. For it shows he considers right something extra, not absolutely essential to human existence not the life of a man. I call it Thomas Weir's fall, for surely to behave in an unfatherly manner to both daughter and son, the one sinful, and therefore needing the more tenderness, the other innocent, and therefore claiming justification, and to do so from pride, and hurt pride, was fall enough in one history, worse a great deal than many sins that go by harder names. For the world's judgment of wrong does not exactly correspond with reality. And now if he was humbled in the one instance, there would be room to hope he might become humble in the other. But I had soon to see that, for a time, his pride, driven from its entrenchment against his son, only retreated, with all its forces, into the other against his daughter. Before a moment had passed, justice overcame so far that he held out his hand, and said, "'Come, Tom, let bygones be bygones.' But I stepped between. "'Thomas Weir,' I said, "'I have too great a regard for you, and you know I dare not flatter you, to let you off this way, or rather leave you to think you have done your duty when you have not done the half of it. You have done your son a wrong, a great wrong. How can you claim to be a gentleman?' I say nothing of being a Christian, for therein you make no claim. How, I say, can you claim to act like a gentleman, if having done a man wrong, his being your own son has nothing to do with the matter one way or other, except that it ought to make you see your duty more easily, having done him wrong, why don't you beg his pardon, I say, like a man? He did not move a step, but young Tom stepped hurriedly forward, and catching his father's hand in both of his, cried out, "'My father shan't beg my pardon. I beg yours, father, 
for everything I ever did to displease you. But I wasn't to blame in this. I wasn't indeed. Tom, I beg your pardon, said the hard man, overcome at last. And now, sir, he added, turning to me, will you let bygones be bygones between my boy and me? There was just a touch of bitterness in his tone. With all my heart, I replied, but I want just a word with you in the shop before I go. Certainly, he answered stiffly, and I bade the old and the young man good night, and followed him down the stairs. Thomas, my friend, I said, when we got into the shop, laying my hand on his shoulder, will you after this say that God has dealt hardly with you? There's a son for any man God ever made to give thanks for on his knees. Thomas, you have a strong sense of fair play in your heart, and you give fair play neither to your own son nor yet to God himself. You close your doors and brood over your own miseries and the wrongs people have done you, whereas if you would but open those doors, you might come out into the light of God's truth, and see that his heart is as clear as sunlight towards you. You won't believe this, and therefore naturally you can't quite believe that there is a God at all. For, indeed, a being that was not all light would be no God at all. If you would but let him teach you, you would find your perplexities melt away like the snow in spring, till you could hardly believe you had ever felt them. No arguing will convince you of a God. But let him once come in, and all argument will be tenfold useless to convince you that there is no God. Give God justice. Try him as I have said. Good night. He did not return my farewell with a single word, but the grasp of his strong, rough hand was more earnest and loving even than usual. I could not see his face, for it was almost dark, but indeed I felt that it was better I could not see it. I went home as peaceful in my heart as the night whose curtains God had drawn about the earth, that it might sleep till the morrow. Chapter 14 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Blanchard Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald Chapter 14 My Pupil Although I do happen to know how Miss Oldcastle fared the night after I left her, the painful record is not essential to my story. Besides, I have here too recorded only those things quorum, paras, magna, or minima, as the case may be. Phooey, there is one exception, old Weir's story, for the introduction of which my reader cannot yet see the artistic reason, for whether a story be real in fact or only real in meaning, there must always be an idea or artistic model in the brain, after which it is fashioned in the latter case one of invention, in the former case one of choice. In the middle of the following week I was returning from a visit I had paid to Tompkins and his wife, when I met in the only street of the village my good and honoured friend Dr. Duncan. Of course I saw him often, and I beg my reader to remember that this is no diary, but only gathering together of some of the more remarkable facts of my history, admitting of being ideally grouped but this time I recall distinctly, because the interview bore upon many things. Well, Dr. Duncan, I said, busy as usual fighting the devil? Ah, my dear Walton, returned the doctor, and the kind word from him went a long way into my heart. I know what you mean. You fight the devil from the inside, and I fight him from the outside. My chance is a poor one. It would be, perhaps, if you were confined to outside remedies. But what an opportunity your profession gives you of attacking the enemy from the inside as well. And you have the advantage over us, that no man can say it belongs to your profession to say such things, and therefore disregard them. Ah, Mr. Walton, I have too great a respect for your profession to dare to interfere with it. 
the doctor in Macbeth, you know, could not minister to a mind diseased, pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow, raised out the writing troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleansed the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart. What a memory you have, but you don't think I can do that any more than you. You know the best medicine to give, anyhow. I wish I always did. But you see, we have no thoriaca now. Well, we have, for the Lord says, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. There, I told you, that will meet all diseases. Strangely now there comes into my mind a line of Chaucer, with which I will make a small return for your quotation from Shakespeare. You have mentioned thoriaca, and I, without thinking of this line, quoted our Lord's words. Chaucer brings the two words together, for the word triacle is merely a corruption of thoriaca, the unfailing cure for everything. Christ, which is that to every harm, triacle. That is delightful, I thank you, and that is in Chaucer. Yes, in the man of law's tale. Shall I tell you how I was able to quote so correctly from Shakespeare? I have just come from referring to the passage, and I mention that because I want to tell you what made me think of the passage. I had been to see poor Catherine Weir. I think she is not long for this world. She has a bad cough, and I fear her lungs are going. I am concerned to hear that. I consider her very delicate, and I am not surprised, but I wish, I do wish, I had got a little hold of her before, that I might be of some use to her now. Is she in immediate danger, do you think? No, I do not think so, but I have no expectation of her recovery. Very likely she will live through the winter and die in the spring. Those patients so often go as the flowers come. All her coughing, poor woman, will not cleanse her stuffed bosom. The perilous stuff weighs on her heart, as Shakespeare says, as well as on her lungs. Ah, dear, what is it, doctor, that weighs upon her heart? Is it shame, or what is it? For she is so uncommunicative that I hardly know anything at all about her yet. I cannot tell. She has the faculty of silence. But do not think I complain that she has not made me her confessor. I only mean that if she would talk at all, one would have the chance of knowing something of her state of mind, and so might give her some help. Perhaps she will break down all at once, and open her mind to you. I have not told her she is dying. I think a medical man ought at least to be quite sure before he dares to say such a thing. I have known a long life endured, to human view at least, by the medical verdict in youth of ever imminent death. Certainly one has no right to say what God is going to do with any one till he knows it beyond a doubt. Illness has its own peculiar mission, independent of any association with coming death, and may often work better when mingled with the hope of life. I mean, we must take care of presumption when we measure God's plans by our theories. But could you not suggest something, Dr. Duncan, to guide me in trying to do my duty by her? I cannot. You see, you don't know what she is thinking. Until you know that, I presume you will agree with me that all is a name in the dark. How can I prescribe without some diagnosis? It is just one of those few cases in which one would like to have the authority of the Catholic priests to urge confession with. I do not think anything will save her life, as we say, but you have taught some of us to think of the life that belongs to the spirit as the life. And I do believe confession would do everything for that. Yes, if made to God. But I will grant that communication of one's sorrows, or even sins, to a wise brother of mankind may help to a deeper confession to the Father in heaven. But I have no wish for authority in the matter. Let us see whether the Spirit of God working in her may not be quite as powerful for a final illumination of her being as the feared confessio of a priest. I have no confidence in forcing in the moral or spiritual garden. A hothouse development must necessarily be a sickly one, rendering the plant unfit for the normal life of the open air. Wait, we must not hurry things. She will perhaps come to me of herself before long. 
but I will call and inquire after her. We parted, and I went at once to Catherine Weir's shop. She received me much as usual, which was hardly to be called receiving at all. Perhaps there was a doubtful shadow, not of more cordiality, but of less repulsion in it. Her eyes were full of a stony brilliance, and the flame of the fire that was consuming her glowed upon her cheeks more brightly, I thought, than ever. But that might be fancy, occasioned by what the doctor had said about her. Her hand trembled, but her demure was perfectly calm. I am sorry to hear you are complaining, Miss Weir, I said. I suppose Dr. Duncan told you so, sir, but I am quite well. I did not send for him. He called of himself, and wanted to persuade me I was ill. I understood that she felt injured by the interference. You should attend to his advice, though. He is a prudent man, and not in the least given to alarming people without cause. She returned no answer, so I tried another subject. What a fine fellow your brother is. Yes, he grows very much. Has your father found another place for him yet? I don't know. My father never tells me about any of his doings. But don't you go and talk to him sometimes? No. He does not care to see me. I am going there now. Will you come with me? Thank you. I never go where I am not wanted. But it is not right that father and daughter should live as you do. Suppose he may not have been so kind to you as he ought. You should not cherish resentment against him for it. That only makes matters worse, you know. I never said to human being that he had been unkind to me. And yet you let every person in the village know it. How? Her eyes had no longer the stony glitter. It flashed now. You are never seen together. You scarcely speak when you meet. Neither of you crosses the other's threshold. It is not my fault. It is not all your fault, I know. But do you think you can go to a heaven at last, where you will be able to be apart from each other, he in his house and you in your house, without any sign that it was through his father on earth that you were born into the world, which the father in heaven redeemed by the gift of his own son? She was silent, and after a pause I went on. I believe in my heart that you love your father. I could not believe otherwise of you and you will never be happy till you have made it up with him. Have you done him no wrong? At these words her face turned white with anger. I could see all but those spots on her cheekbones, which shone out in dreadful contrast to the deathly paleness of the rest of her face. Then the returning blood surged violently from her heart, and the red spots were lost in one crimson glow. She opened her lips to speak, but apparently changed her mind, turned and walked haughtily out of the shop and closed the door behind her. I waited, hoping she would recover herself and return, but after ten minutes had passed, I thought it better to go away. As I had told her, I was going to her father's shop. There I was received very differently. There was a certain softness in the manner of the carpenter, which I had not observed before, with the same heartiness in the shake of his hand which had accompanied my last leave-taking. I had purposely allowed ten days to elapse before I called again, to give time for the unpleasant feeling associated with my interference to vanish. And now I had something in my mind about young Tom. Have you got anything for your boy yet, Thomas? Not yet, sir. There's time enough. I don't want to part with him just yet. There he is, taking his turn at what's going. Tom! and from the farther end of the large shop where I had not observed him now approached young Tom, in a canvas jacket, looking quite like a workman. Well, Tom, I am glad to find you can turn your hand to anything. I must be a stupid, sir, if I couldn't handle my father's tools, returned the lad. I don't know that quite. I am not just prepared to admit it for my own sake. My father is a lawyer, and I never could read a chapter in one of his books his tools, you know. Perhaps you never tried, sir. Indeed, I did, and no doubt I could have done it if I had made up my mind to it, but I never felt inclined to finish the page. And that reminds me why I called today. 
Thomas, I know that lad of yours is fond of reading. Can you spare him from his work for an hour or so before breakfast? Tomorrow, sir? Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, I answered. And there's Shakespeare for you. Of course, sir, whatever you wish, said Thomas, with a perplexed look, in which pleasure seemed to long for confirmation, and to be, till that came, afraid to put its native semblance on. I want to keep him some direction in his reading. When a man is fond of any tools, and can use them, it is worth while showing him how to use them better. Oh, thank you, sir, exclaimed Tom, his face beaming with delight. That is kind of you, sir. Tom, you're a made man, cried his father. So, I went on, if you will let him come to me for an hour every morning, till he gets another place, say from eight to nine, I will see what I can do for him. Tom's face was as red with delight as his sister's had been with anger, and I left the shop somewhat consoled for the pain I had given Catherine, which grieved me without making me sorry that I had occasioned it. I had intended to try to do something from the father's side towards a reconciliation with his daughter, but no sooner had I made up my proposal for Tom than I saw I had blocked up my own way towards my more important end, for I could not bear to seem to offer to bribe him even to allow me to do him good, nor would he see that it was for his good and his daughter's, not at first. The first impression would be that I had a professional end to gain, that the reconciliation of father and daughter was a sort of parish business of mine, and that I had smoothed the way to it by offering a gift, an intellectual one, true, but not, therefore, the lesser gift in the eyes of Thomas, who had a great respect for books. This was just what would irritate such a man, and I resolved to say nothing about it, but bide my time. When Tom came, I asked him if he had read any Wordsworth, for I always give people what I like myself, because that must be wherein I can best help them. I was anxious, too, to find out what he was capable of, and for this anything that has more than a surface meaning will do. I had no doubt about the lad's intellect, and now I wanted to see what there was deeper than the intellect in him. He said he had not. I therefore chose one of Wordsworth's sonnets, not one of his best by any means, but suitable for my purpose, the one entitled Composed During a Storm. This I gave him to read, telling him to let me know when he considered that he had mastered the meaning of it, and sat down to my own studies. I remember I was reading the Anglo-Saxon Gospels. I think it was fully half an hour before Tom rose and gently approached my place. I had not been uneasy about the experiment after ten minutes had passed, and after that time was doubled, I felt certain of some measure of success. This may possibly puzzle my reader, but I will explain. It was clear that Tom did not understand the sonnet at first, and I was not in the least certain that he would come to understand it by any exertion of his intellect without further experience. But what I was delighted to be made sure of was that Tom at least knew that he did not know, for that is the very next step to knowing. Indeed, it may be said to be a more valuable gift than the other. Being of general application, for some quick people will understand many things very easily, but when they come to a thing that is beyond their present reach, will fancy they see a meaning in it, or invent one, or even, which is far worse, pronounce it nonsense, and indeed show themselves capable of any device for getting out of the difficulty, except seeing and confessing to themselves that they are not able to understand it. Possibly this sonnet might be beyond Tom now, but at least there was great hope that he saw or believed that there must be something beyond him in it. I only hoped that he would not fall upon some wrong interpretation, seeing he was brooding over it so long. Well, Tom, I said, have you made it out? I can't say I have, sir. I'm afraid I'm very stupid, for I've tried hard. I must just ask you to tell me what it means. 
But I must tell you one thing, sir. Every time I read it over, twenty times, I dare say, I thought I was lying on my mother's grave. As I lay that trembling night, and then, at the end, there you were standing over me and saying, Can I do anything to help you? I was struck with astonishment, for here, in a wonderful manner, I saw the imagination outrunning the intellect, and manifesting to the heart what the brain could not yet understand. It indicated undeveloped gifts of a far higher nature than those belonging to the mere power of understanding alone. For there was a hidden sympathy of the deepest kind between the life experience of the lad and the embodiment of such life experience on the part of the poet. But he went on. I am sure, sir, I ought to have been at my prayers then, but I wasn't, so I didn't deserve you to come. But don't you think God is sometimes better to us than we deserve? He is just everything to us, Tom, and we don't and can't deserve anything. Now I will try to explain the sonnet to you. I had always had an impulse to teach, not for the teaching's sake, for that, regarded as the attempt to fill skulls with knowledge, had always been, to me, a desolate dreariness. But the moment I saw a sign of hunger, an indication of readiness to receive, I was invariably seized with a kind of passion for giving. I now proceeded to explain the sonnet. Having done so, nearly as well as I could, Tom said, it is very strange, sir, but now that I have heard you say what the poem means, I feel as if I had known it all the time, though I could not say it. Here at least was no common mind. The reader will not be surprised to hear that the hour before breakfast extended into two hours after breakfast as well. Nor did this take up too much of my time, for the lad was capable of doing a great deal for himself under the sense of help at hand. His father, so far from making any objection to the arrangement, was delighted with it, nor do I believe that the lad did less work in the shop for it. I learnt that he worked regularly till eight o'clock every night. Now the good of the arrangement was this. I had the lad fresh in the morning, clear-headed, with no mist from the valley of labour to cloud his height of understanding. From the exercise of the mind, it was a pleasant and revealing change to turn to bodily exertion. I am certain that he both thought and worked better, because he had thought and worked. Every literary man ought to be mechanical, to use a Shakespearean word, as well. But it would have been quite a different matter if he had come to me after the labour of the day. He would not then have been able to think nearly so well, but labour, sleep, thought labour again, seems to me to be the right order for those who, earning their bread by the sweat of the brow, would yet remember that man shall not live by bread alone. Were it possible that our mechanics could attend the institution, called by their name, in the morning instead of the evening, perhaps we should not find them so ready to degrade into places of mere amusement. I am not objecting to the amusement, only to cease to educate in order to amuse is to degenerate. Amusement is a good and sacred thing, but it is not on par with education, and indeed, if it does not in any way further the growth of the higher nature, it cannot be called good at all. Having exercised him in the analysis of some of the best portions of our home literature, I mean helped him to take them to pieces, that putting them together again, he might see what kind of things they were, for who could understand a new machine, or find out what it was meant for, without either actually, or in his mind, taking it to pieces. Which pieces, however, let me remind my reader, are utterly useless, except in their relation to the whole. I resolved to try something fresh with him. At this point I had intended to give my readers a theory of mine about the teaching and learning of a language, and tell them how I had found the trial of its success in the case of Tom Weir. But I think this would be too much of a digression from the course of my narrative, and would, besides, be interesting to those only who had given a good deal of thought to subjects belonging to education. I will only say, therefore, that, by the end of the three months, my pupil, without knowing any other Latin author, was able to read any part 
of the first book of the Aeneid, to read it tolerably in measure, and to enjoy the poetry of it, and this not without a knowledge of the declensions and the conjunctions. As to the syntax, I made the sentences themselves teach him that. Now I know that, as an end, all this was of no great value, but as a beginning it was invaluable, for it made and kept him hungry for more, whereas in most modes of teaching the beginnings are such that without the pressure of circumstances no boy, especially after an interval of secession, will return to them. Such is not nature's mode, for the beginnings with her are as pleasant as the fruition, and that without being less thorough than they can be. The knowledge a child gains of the external world is the foundation upon which all his future philosophy is built. Every discovery he makes is fraught with pleasure. That is the secret of his progress, and the essence of my theory, that learning should, in each individual case, as in the first case, be discovery, bringing its own pleasure with it. Nor is this to be confounded with turning study into play. It is upon the moon itself that the infant speculates, after the moon itself, that he stretches out his eager hands, to find in after years that he still wants her, but that in science and poetry he has her a thousandfold more than if she had been handed him down to suck. So after all, I have bored my reader with a shadow of my theory, instead of a description. After all, again, the description would have plagued him more, and that must be both his and my comfort. So through the whole of that summer and the following winter, I went on teaching Tom Weir. He was a lad of uncommon ability, else he could not have effected what I say he had within his first three months of Latin. Let my theory be not only perfect in itself, but true as well, true to human nature, I mean. And his father, though his own book learning was but small, had enough of insight to perceive that his son was something out of the common, and that any possible advantage he might lose by remaining in Marshmallow was considerably more than counterbalanced by the instruction he got from the vicar. Hence, I believe, it was that not a word was said about another situation for Tom, and I was glad of it. Chapter 15 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald Chapter 15 Dr. Duncan's Story On the next Sunday but one, which was surprising to me when I considered the manner of our last parting, Catherine Weir was in church, for the second time since I had come to the place. As it happened, only as Spencer says, it chanced eternal God that chance did guide. And why I say this will appear afterwards. I had, in preaching upon, that is, in endeavouring to enforce the Lord's Prayer, by making them think about the meaning of the words they were so familiar with, come to the petition, Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors with which I naturally connected the words of our Lord that follow, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I need not tell my reader more of what I said about this, than that I tried to show that even were it possible with God to forgive an unforgiving man, the man himself would not be able to believe for a moment that God did forgive him, and therefore could get no comfort, or help, or joy of any kind, from the forgiveness. So essentially does hatred, or revenge, or contempt, or anything that separates us from man, separate us from God too. To the loving soul alone does the Father reveal himself, for love alone can understand him. It is the peacemakers who are his children. 
This I said, thinking of no one more than another of my audience. But as soon as I closed my sermon, I could not help fancying that Mrs. Oldcastle looked at me with more than her usual fierceness. I forgot all about it, however, for I never seemed to myself to have any hold of, or relation to, that woman. I know that I was wrong in being unable to feel my relation to her, because I disliked her. But not till years after did I begin to understand how she felt, or recognize in myself a common humanity with her. A sin of my own made me understand her condition. I can hardly explain now. I will tell it when the time comes. When I called upon her next, after the interview last related, she behaved much as if she had forgotten all about it, which was not likely. In the end of the week after the sermon to which I have alluded, I was passing the hall-gate on my usual Saturday's walk, when Judy saw me from within as she came out of the lodge. She was with me in a moment. "'Mr. Walton,' she said, "'how could you preach at Granny as you did last Sunday?' "'I did not preach at anybody, Judy.' "'Oh, Mr. Walton!' "'You know I didn't, Judy. You know that if I had, I would not say I had not.' "'Yes, yes, I know that perfectly,' she said, seriously. "'But Granny thinks you did.' How do you know that? By her face. That is all, is it? You don't think Granny would say so? No, nor yet that you could know by her face what she was thinking. Oh, can't I just? I can read her face, not so well as plain print, but, let me see, as well as what Uncle Stoddart calls black letter, at least. I know she thought you were preaching at her and her face said, I shan't forgive you anyhow. I never forgive, and I won't for all your preaching. That's what her face said. I am sure she would not say so, Judy, I said, really not knowing what to say. Oh, no, she would not say so. She would say, I always forgive, but I never forget. That's a favorite saying of hers. But, Judy, don't you think it is rather hypocritical of you to say all this to me about your grandmother, when she is so kind to you, and you seem such good friends with her? She looked up in my face with an expression of surprise. It is all true, Mr. Walton, she said. Perhaps. But you are saying it behind her back. I will go home and say it to her face directly. She turned to go. "'No, no, Judy, I did not mean that,' I said, taking her by the arm. "'I won't say you told me to do it. I thought there was no harm in telling you. Granny is kind to me, and I am kind to her. But Granny is afraid of my tongue, and I mean her to be afraid of it. It's the only way to keep her in order. Darling Aunt Winnie, it's all she's got to defend her.' If you knew how she treats her sometimes, you would be cross with Granny yourself, Mr. Walton, for all your goodness and your white surplice. And to my yet greater surprise the wayward girl burst out crying, and, breaking away from me, ran through the gate and out of sight amongst the trees, without once looking back. I pursued my walk, my meditations somewhat discomposed by the recurring question, would she go home and tell her grandmother what she had said to me? And if she did, would it not widen the breach upon the opposite side of which I seemed to see Ethelwyn stand, out of the reach of my help? I walked quickly on to reach a stile by means of which I should soon leave the little world of marshmallows quite behind me, and be alone with nature and my Greek testament. Hearing the sound of horse-hoofs on the road from Addishead, I glanced up from my pocket-book, in which I had been looking over the thoughts that had at various moments passed through my mind that week, in order to choose one or more if they would go together, to be brooded over to-day for my people's spiritual diet to-morrow. I say I glanced up from my pocket-book and saw a young man, that is, if I could call myself young still, of distinguished appearance, 
approaching upon a good serviceable hack. He turned into my road and passed me. He was pale, with a dark moustache, and large dark eyes, sat his horse well and carelessly, had fine features of the type commonly considered Grecian, but thin, and expressive chiefly of conscious weariness. He wore a white hat, with crape upon it, white gloves, and long military-looking boots. All this I caught as he passed me, and I remember them, because looking after him, I saw him stop at the lodge of the hall, ring the bell, and then ride through the gate. I confess I did not quite like this, but I got over the feeling so far as to be able to turn to my testament when I had reached and crossed the stile. I came home another way, after one of the most delightful days I had ever spent. Having reached the river in the course of my wandering, I came down the side of it towards old Rogers's cottage, loitering and looking, quiet in heart and soul and mind, because I had committed my cares to him who careth for us. The earth was round me. I was rooted, as it were, in it, but the air of a higher life was about me. I was swayed to and fro by the motions of a spiritual power. Feelings and desires and hopes passed through me, passed away, and returned. And still my head rose into the truth, and the will of God was the regnant sunlight upon it. I might change my place and condition, new feelings might come forth, and old feelings retire into the lonely corners of my being. But still my heart should be glad and strong in the one changeless thing, in the truth that maketh free. Still my head should rise into the sunlight of God, and I should know that because He lived I should live also, and because He was true I should remain true also. Nor should any change pass upon me that should make me mourn the decadence of humanity. And then I found that I was gazing over the stump of an old pollard, on which I was leaning, down on a great bed of white water-lilies, that lay in the broad slow river here broader and slower than in most places. The slanting yellow sunlight shone through the water down to the very roots anchored in the soil, and the water swathed their stems with coolness and freshness, and a universal sense, I doubt not, of watery presence and nurture. And there on their lovely heads as they lay on the pillow of the water shone the life-giving light of the summer sun, filling all the spaces between their outspread petals of living silver, with its sea of radiance, and making them gleam with the whiteness which was born of them and the sun. And then came a hand on my shoulder, and turning, I saw the gray head and the white smock of my old friend Rogers, and I was glad that he loved me enough not to be afraid of the parson and the gentleman. "'I found it, sir, I do think,' he said, his brown furrowed old face shining with a yet lovelier light than that which shone from the blossoms of the water-lilies, though, after what I had been thinking about them, it was no wonder that they seemed both to mean the same thing, both to shine in the light of his countenance. "'Found what, old Rogers?' I returned, raising myself and laying my hand in return on his shoulder. "'Why, he was displeased with the disciples for not knowing what he meant about the leaven of the Pharisees,' I interrupted. Yes. "'Yes, of course. Tell me, then.' "'I will try, sir. It was all dark to me for days, for it appeared to me very natural that, seeing they had no bread in the locker, and hearing tell of leaven which they weren't to eat, they should think it had some to do with their having none of any sort. But he didn't seem to think it was right of them to fall into the blunder. For why, then? A man can't always be right. He may be like myself, a foremast man, with no schoolin' but what the winds and the waves puts into him. And I'm thinkin' those fishermen the Lord took to so much were something of that sort. How could they help it, I said to myself, sir. And from that I came to ask myself, could they have helped it? If they couldn't, he wouldn't have been vexed with them. Mayhap they ought to have been able to help it. And all at once, sir, this morning— it came to me. I don't know how, but it was give to me anyhow. And I flung down my rake, and I ran into the old woman, 
but she wasn't in the way, and so I went back to my work again. But when I saw you, sir, a reading upon the lilies of the field, leastways the lilies of the water, I couldn't help running out to tell you. Isn't it a satisfaction, sir, when your dead reckoning runs you right in betwixt the cheeks of the harbor? I see it all now. Well, I want to know, old Rogers. I'm not so old as you, and so I may live longer, and every time I read that passage I should like to be able to say to myself, Old Rogers gave me this. I only hope it's right, sir. It was just this. Their heads was full of their dinner because they didn't know where it was to come from. But they ought to have known where it always come from. If their hearts had been full of the dinner he gave the five thousand hungry men and women and children, they wouldn't have been uncomfortable about not having a loaf. And so they wouldn't have been set upon the wrong tack when he spoke about the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they would have known in a moment what he meant. And if I hadn't been too much of the same sort, I wouldn't have started saying it was but reasonable to be in the doldrums because they were at sea with no biscuit in the locker. You're right. You must be right, old Rogers. It's as plain as possible, I cried, rejoiced at the old man's insight. Thank you. I'll preach about it to-morrow. I thought I had got my sermon in Foxborough Wood, but I was mistaken. You had got it. But I was mistaken again. I had not got my sermon yet. I walked with him to his cottage, and left him after a greeting with the old woman— Passing through the village, and seeing by the light of her candle the form of Catherine Weir behind her counter, I went in. I thought old Rogers's tobacco must be nearly gone, and I might safely buy some more. Catherine's manner was much the same as usual, but as she was weighing my purchase, she broke out all at once. "'It's no use your preaching at me, Mr. Walton. I cannot, I will not forgive.' I will do anything but forgive, and it's no use. It is not I that say it, Catherine. It is the Lord himself. I saw no great use in protesting my innocence, yet I thought it better to add. And I was not preaching at you. I was preaching to you as much as to any one there, and no more. Of this she took no notice, and I resumed. Just think of what he says, not what I say. I can't help it. If he won't forgive me, I must go without it. I can't forgive. I saw that good and evil were fighting in her, and felt that no words of mine would be of further avail at the moment. The words of our Lord had laid hold of her. That was enough for this time. Nor dared I ask her any questions. I had the feeling that it would hurt, not help. All I could venture to say was, "'I won't trouble you with talk, Catherine.' Our Lord wants to talk to you. It is not for me to interfere. But please to remember, if ever you think I can serve you in any way, you have only to send for me. She murmured a mechanical thanks, and handed me my parcel. I paid for it, bade her good night, and left the shop. O oh Lord, I said in my heart as I walked away, what a labor thou hast with us all! Shall we ever some day be all and quite good like thee? Help me, fill me with thy light, that my work may all go to bring about the gladness of thy kingdom, the holy household of us brothers and sisters, all thy children. And now I found that I wanted very much to see my friend Dr. Duncan. He received me with his stately cordiality, and a smile that went farther than all his words of greeting. Come now, Mr. Walton, I am just going to sit down to my dinner, and you must join me. I think there will be enough for us both. There is, I believe, a chicken apiece for us, and we can make up with cheese and a glass of, would you believe it, my own father's port. He was fond of port, the old man, though I never saw him with one glass more aboard than the registered tonnage. He always sat light on the water. Ah, dear me, I'm old myself now. But what am I to do with Mrs. Pearson, I said. There's some chef d'oeuvre of hers waiting for me by this time. She always treats me particularly well on Saturdays and Sundays. Ah, then you must not stop with me. You will fare better at home. 
But I should much prefer stopping with you. Couldn't you send a message for me? To be sure. My boy will run with it at once. Now, what is the use of writing all this? I do not know. Only that even a tete-a-tete -tete dinner with an old friend, now that I am an old man myself, has such a pearly halo about it in the mists of the past, that every little circumstance connected with it becomes interesting, though it may be quite unworthy of record. So, kind reader, let it stand. We sat down to our dinner, so simple and so well cooked, that it was just what I liked. I wanted very much to tell my friend what had occurred in Catherine's shop, but I would not begin till we were safe from interruption. And so we chatted away concerning many things, he telling me about his seafaring life, and I telling him some of the few remarkable things that had happened to me in the course of my life voyage. There is no man but has met with some remarkable things that other people would like to know and which would seem stranger to them than they did at the time to the person to whom they happened. At length I brought our conversation round to my interview with Catherine Weir. "'Can you understand,' I said, "'a woman finding it so hard to forgive her own father?' "'Are you sure it is her father?' he returned. "'Surely she has not this feeling towards more than one. That she has it towards her father I know.' "'I don't know,' he answered. "'I have known resentment preponderate over every other feeling and passion, in the mind of a woman, too. I once heard of a good woman who cherished this feeling against a good man because of some distrustful words he had once addressed to herself. She had lived to a great age, and was expressing to her clergymen her desire that God would take her away. She had been waiting a long time. The clergyman, a very shrewd as well as devout man, and not without a touch of humor, said, "'Perhaps God doesn't mean to let you die till you've forgiven Mr. Blank.' She was as if struck with a flash of thought, sat silent during the rest of his visit, and when the clergyman called the next day, he found Mr. Blank and her talking together, very quietly over a cup of tea. And she hadn't long to wait after that, I was told, but was gathered to her father's, or went home to her children, whichever is the better phrase. "'I wish I had had your experience, Dr. Duncan,' I said. "'I have not had so much experience as a general practitioner, because I have been so long at sea, but I am satisfied that until a medical man knows a good deal more about his patient than most medical men give themselves the trouble to find out, his prescriptions will partake a good deal more than is necessary of haphazard. As to this question of obstinate resentment, I know one case in which it is the ruling presence of a woman's life, the very light that is in her, is resentment. I think her possessed myself. Tell me something about her. I will. But even to you I will mention no names. Not that I have her confidence in the least. But I think it is better not. I was called to attend a lady at a house where I had never yet been. Was it in—' I began, but checked myself. Dr. Duncan smiled and went on without remark. I could see that he told his story with great care, lest I thought he should let anything slip that might give a clue to the place or people. I was led up into an old-fashioned, richly furnished room. A great wood fire burned on the hearth. The bed was surrounded with heavy dark curtains, in which the shadowy remains of bright colors were just visible. In the bed lay one of the loveliest young creatures I had ever seen, and, one on each side, stood two of the most dreadful-looking women I had ever beheld. Still as death, while I examined my patient, they stood, with moveless faces, one as white as the other. Only the eyes of both of them were alive. One was evidently mistress, and the other servant. The latter looked more self-contained than the former, but less determined, and possibly more cruel. That both could be unkind, at least, was plain enough. There was trouble and signs of inward conflict in the eyes of the mistress. The maid gave no sign of any inside to her at all, but stood watching her mistress. A child's toy was lying 
in a corner of the room. I may here interrupt my friend's story to tell my reader that I may be mingling some of my own conclusions with what the good man told me of his, for he will see well enough already that I had in a moment attached his description to persons I knew, and, as it turned out, correctly, though I could not be certain about it till the story had advanced a little beyond this early stage of its progress. I found the lady very weak and very feverish, a quick feeble pulse, now bounding and now intermitting, and a restlessness in her eye which I felt contained the secret of her disorder. She kept glancing, as if involuntarily, towards the door, which would not open for all her looking, and I heard her once murmur to herself, for I was still quick of hearing then, "'He won't come. Perhaps I only saw her lips move to those words. I cannot be sure. But I am certain she said them in her heart. I prescribed for her as far as I could venture, but begged a word with her mother. She went with me into an adjoining room. "'The lady is longing for something,' I said, not wishing to be so definite as I could have been. The mother made no reply. I saw her lips shut yet closer than before. She is your daughter, is she not? Yes. Very decidedly. Could you not find out what she wishes? Perhaps I could guess. I do not think I can do her any good till she has what she wants. Is that your mode of prescribing, doctor? she said tartly. Yes, certainly, I answered. In the present case, is she married? Yes. Has she any children? One daughter. Let her see her, then. She does not care to see her. Where is her husband? Excuse me, doctor. I did not send for you to ask questions, but to give advice. And I come to ask questions in order that I might give advice. Do you think a human being is like a clock that can be taken to pieces, cleaned, and put together again? My daughter's condition is not a fit subject for jesting. Certainly not. Send for her husband, or the undertaker, whichever you please, I said, forgetting my manners and my temper together, for I was more irritable then than I am now, and there was something so repulsive about the woman that I felt as if I was talking to an evil creature that for her own ends, though what I could not tell, was tormenting the dying lady. I understood you were a gentleman of experience and breeding. I am not in the question, madam. It is your daughter. She shall take your prescription. She must see her husband, if it be possible. It is not possible. Why? I say it is not possible, and that is enough. Good morning. I could say no more at the time. I called the next day. She was just the same, only that I knew she wanted to speak to me, and dared not, because of the presence of the two women. Her troubled eyes seemed searching mine for pity and help, and I could not tell what to do for her. There are, indeed, as someone says, strongholds of injustice and wrong into which no law can enter to help. One afternoon, about a week after my first visit, I was sitting by her bedside, wondering what could be done to get her out of the clutches of these tormentors, who were, evidently to me, consuming her in the slow fire of her own affections. When I heard a faint noise, a rapid foot in the house so quiet before, heard doors open and shut, then a dull sound of conflict of some sort. Presently a quick step came up the oak stair, the face of my patient flushed and her eyes gleamed as if her soul would come out of them. Weak as she was, she sat up in bed, almost without an effort, and the two women darted from the room, one after the other. "'My husband,' said the girl, for indeed she was little more in age, turning her face, almost distorted with eagerness, towards me. "'Yes, my dear,' I said, "'I know.' but you must be as still as you can, else you will be very ill. Do keep quiet." "'I will, I will,' she gasped, stuffing her pocket-handkerchief actually into her mouth to prevent herself from screaming, 
as if that was what would hurt her. But go to him. They will murder him. That moment I heard a cry, and what sounded like an articulate imprecation, but both from a woman's voice, and the next a young man, as fine a fellow as I ever saw, dressed like a gamekeeper, but evidently a gentleman walked into the room with a quietness that strangely contrasted with the dreadful paleness of his face and with his disordered hair, while the two women followed, as red as he was white, and evidently in fierce wrath from a fruitless struggle with the powerful youth. He walked gently up to his wife, whose outstretched arms and face followed his face, as he came round the bed to where she was at the other side, till arms and face and head fell into his embrace. I had gone to the mother. Let us have no scene now, I said, or her blood will be on your head. She took no notice of what I said, but stood silently glaring, not gazing, at the pair. I feared an outburst, and had resolved, if it came, to carry her at once from the room, which I was quite able to do then, Mr. Walton, though I don't look like it now. But in a moment more the young man, becoming uneasy at the motionlessness of his wife, lifted up her head, and glanced in her face. Seeing the look of terror in his, I hastened to him, and lifting her from him, laid her down. Dead. Disease of the heart, I believe. The mother burst into a shriek, not of horror, or grief, or remorse, but of deadly hatred. "'Look at your work!' she cried to him as he stood gazing in stupor on the face of the girl. You said she was yours, not mine. Take her. You may have her now you have killed her. He may have killed her, but you have murdered her, madam, I said, as I took the man by the arm and led him away, yielding like a child. But the moment I got him out of the house he gave a groan, and breaking away from me rushed down a road leading from the back of the house towards the home farm. I followed, but he had disappeared. I went on, but before I could reach the farm I heard the gallop of a horse, and saw him tearing away at full speed along the London road. I never heard more of him, or of the story. Some women can be secret enough, I assure you. I need not follow the rest of our conversation. I could hardly doubt whose was the story I had heard. It threw a light upon several things about which I had been perplexed. What a horror of darkness seemed to hang over that family! What deeds of wickedness! But the reason was clear. The horror came from within. Selfishness and fierceness of temper were its source. No unhappy doom. The worship of one's own will fumes out around the being an atmosphere of evil, an altogether abnormal condition of the moral firmament, out of which will break the very flames of hell. The consciousness of birth and of breeding, instead of stirring up to deeds of gentleness and high emprise, becomes then but an incentive to violence and cruelty, and things which seem as if they could not happen in a civilized country and a polished age are proved as possible as ever where the heart is unloving, the feelings unrefined, self the centre, and God nowhere in the man or woman's vision. The terrible things that one reads in old histories or in modern newspapers were done by human beings, not by demons. I did not let my friend know that I knew all that he concealed, but I may as well tell my reader now what I could not have told him then. I know all the story now, and as no better place will come, as far as I can see, I will tell it at once and briefly. Dorothy, a wonderful name, the gift of God to be so treated, faring in this, however, like many other of God's gifts, Dorothy Oldcastle was the eldest daughter of Jeremy and Sybil Oldcastle, and the sister, therefore, of Ethelwyn. Her father, who was an easy-going man entirely under the dominion of his wife, died when she was about fifteen, and her mother sent her to school with a special recommendation to the care of a clergyman in the neighborhood, whom Mrs. Oldcastle knew. 
for somehow and the fact is not so unusual as to justify especial inquiry here though she paid no attention to what our lord or his apostles said nor indeed seemed to care to ask herself if what she did was right or what she accepted i cannot say believed was true she had yet a certain to me all but incomprehensible leaning to the clergy i think it belongs to the same kind of superstition which many of our own day are turning to offered the spirit of god for the asking offered it by the lord himself in the misery of their unbelief they betake themselves to necromancy instead and raise the dead to ask their advice and follow it and will find some day that satan had not forgotten how to dress like an angel of light nay he can be more cunning with the demands of the time we are clever he will be cleverer why should he dress and not speak like an angel of light why should he not give good advice if that will help to withdraw people by degrees from regarding the source of all good he knows well enough that good advice goes for little but that what fills the heart and mind goes for much what religion is there in being convinced of a future state is that to worship god it is no more religion than the belief that the sun will rise to-morrow is religion it may be a source of happiness to those who could not believe it before but it is not religion where religion comes that will certainly be likewise but the one is not the other the devil can afford a kind of conviction of that it costs him little but to believe that the spirits of the departed are the mediators between god and us is essential paganism to call it nothing worse and a bad enough name too since christ has come and we have heard and seen the only begotten of the father thus the instinctive desire for the wonderful the need we have of a revelation from above us denied its proper food and nourishment turns in its hunger to feed upon garbage as a devout german says i do not quote him quite correctly where God rules not, demons will. Let us once see with our spiritual eyes the Wonderful, the Counselor, and surely we shall not turn from him to seek elsewhere the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Those who sympathize with my feeling in regard to this form of the materialism of our day will forgive this divergence. I submit to the artistic blame of such as do not and return to my story. Dorothy was there three or four years. I said I would be brief. She and the clergyman's son fell in love with each other. The mother heard of it and sent for her home. She had other views for her. Of course, in such eyes, a daughter's fancy was, irrespective of its object altogether, a thing to be sneered at. But she found, to her fierce disdain, that she had not been able to keep all her beloved obstinacy to herself. She had transmitted a portion of it to her daughter. But in her it was combined with noble qualities, and ceasing to be the evil thing it was in her mother, became an honorable firmness, rendering her able to withstand her mother's stormy importunities. Thus nature had begun to right herself. The right in the daughter turning to meet and defy the wrong in the mother and that in the same strength of character which the mother had misused for evil and selfish ends and thus the bad breed was broken she was and would be true to her lover the consequent scenes were dreadful the spirit but not the will of the girl was all but broken she felt that she could not sustain the strife long by some means, unknown to my informant, her lover contrived to communicate with her. He had, through means of relations who had great influence with government, procured a good appointment in India, whither he must sail within a month. The end was that she left her mother's house. Mr. Gladwin was waiting for her near, and conducted her to his father's, 
who had constantly refused to aid Mrs. Oldcastle by interfering in the matter. They were married next day by the clergyman of a neighboring parish, but almost immediately she was taken so ill that it was impossible for her to accompany her husband, and she was compelled to remain behind at the rectory, hoping to join him the following year. Before the time arrived, she gave birth to my little friend, Judy, and her departure was again delayed by a return of her old complaint, probably the early stages of the disease of which she died. Then, just as she was about to set sail for India, news arrived that Mr. Gladwin had had a sunstroke, and would have leave of absence and come home as soon as he was able to be moved so that instead of going out to join him, she must wait for him where she was. His mother had been dead for some time. His father, an elderly man of indolent habits, was found dead in his chair one Sunday morning, soon after the news had arrived of the illness of his son, to whom he was deeply attached. And so the poor young creature was left alone with her child, without money, and in weak health. The old man left nothing behind him but his furniture and books, and nothing could be done in arranging his affairs till the arrival of his son, of whom the last accounts had been that he was slowly recovering. In the meantime his wife was in want of money, without a friend to whom she could apply. I presume that one of the few parishioners who visited at the rectory had written to acquaint Mrs. Oldcastle with the condition in which her daughter was left, for— Influenced by motives of which I dare not take upon me to conjecture and analysis, she wrote, offering her daughter all that she required in her old home. Whether she fore-intended her following conduct, or old habit returned with the return of her daughter, I cannot tell. But she had not been more than a few days in the house before she began to tyrannize over her, as in old times and although Mrs. Gladwin's health, now always weak, was evidently failing in consequence, she either did not see the cause, or could not restrain her evil impulses. At length the news arrived of Mr. Gladwin's departure for home. Perhaps then for the first time the temptation entered her mind to take her revenge upon him, by making her daughter's illness a pretext for refusing him admission to her presence. She told her she should not see him till she was better, for that it would make her worse, persisted in her resolution after his arrival, and effected, by the help of Sarah, that he should not gain admittance to the house, keeping all the doors locked except one. It was only by the connivance of Ethelwyn, then a girl about fifteen, that he was admitted by the underground way, of which she unlocked the upper door for his entrance. She had then guided him as far as she dared, and directed him the rest of the way to his wife's room. My reader will now understand how it came about in the process of writing these my recollections, that I have given such a long chapter chiefly to that one evening spent with my good friend Dr. Duncan. For he will see, as I have said, that what he told me opened up a good deal to me. I had very little time for the privacy of the church that night. Dark as it was, however, I went in before I went home. I had the key of the vestry door always in my pocket. I groped my way into the pulpit, and sat down in the darkness, and thought. Nor did my personal interest in Dr. Duncan's story make me forget poor Catherine Weir, and the terrible sore in her heart the sore of unforgivingness. And I saw that of herself she would not, could not, forgive to all eternity, that all the pains of hell could not make her forgive, or that it was a divine glory to forgive, and must come from God. And thinking of Mrs. Oldcastle, I saw that in ourselves we could be sure of no safety, not from the worst and vilest sins. For who could tell how he might not stupefy himself by degrees, and by one action after another, each a little worse than the former, till the very fires of Sinai 
would not flash into eyes blinded with the incense arising to the golden calf of his worship. A man may come to worship a devil without knowing it. Only by being filled with a higher spirit than our own, which, having caused our spirits, is one with our spirits, and is in them the present life principle, are we or can we be safe from this eternal death of our being? This spirit was fighting the evil spirit in Catherine Weir. How was I to urge her to give her ear to the good? If Will would but side with God, the forces of self, deserted by their leader, must soon quit the field. And the woman, the kingdom within her no longer torn by conflicting forces, would sit quiet at the feet of the Master, reposing in that rest which he offered to those who would come to him. Might she not be roused to utter one feeble cry to God for help? That would be one step towards the forgiveness of others. To ask something for herself would be a great advance in such a proud nature as hers. And to ask good-heartily is the very next step to giving good-heartily. Many thoughts such as these passed through my mind, chiefly associated with her, for I could not think how to think about Mrs. Oldcastle yet. And the old church gloomed about me all the time. I kept lifting up my heart to the God who had cared to make me, and then drew me to be a preacher to my fellows, and had surely something to give me to say to them. For did he not choose so to work by the foolishness of preaching? Might not my humble ignorance work his will, though my wrath could not work his righteousness? And I descended from the pulpit, thinking with myself, Let him do as he will. Here I am. I will say what I see. Let him make it good. And the next morning I spoke about the words of our Lord. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And I looked to see. And there Catherine Weir sat, looking me in the face. There likewise sat Mrs. Oldcastle, looking me in the face, too. And Judy sat there, also looking me in the face, as serious as man could wish grown woman to look. End of chapter Chapter 16 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter 16 the organ one little matter i forgot to mention as having been talked about between dr duncan and myself that same evening i happened to refer to old rogers what a fine old fellow that is said dr duncan indeed he is i answered he is a great comfort and help to me i don't think anybody but myself has an idea what there is in that old man the people in the village don't quite like him, though, I find. He is too ready to be down upon them when he sees things going amiss. The fact is, they are afraid of him. Something as the Jews were afraid of John the Baptist, because he was an honest man, and spoke not merely his own mind, but the mind of God in it. Just so. I believe you're quite right. Do you know, the other day, happening to go into Weir's shop to get him to do a job for me, I found him and old Rogers at close quarters in an argument. I could not well understand the drift of it, not having been present at the beginning. But I soon saw that, keen as Ware was, and far surpassing Rogers in correctness of speech, and precision as well. The old sailor carried too heavy metal for the carpenter. It evidently annoyed Ware, but such was the good humor of Rogers, 
that he could not, for very shame, lose his temper, the old man's smile again and again compelling a response on the thin cheeks of the other. I know how he would talk exactly, I returned. He has a kind of loving banter with him, if you will allow me the expression, that is irresistible to any man with a heart in his bosom. I am very glad to hear that there is anything like communion begun between them. Where will get good from him? My man of all work is going to leave me. I wonder if the old man would take his place. I do not know whether he is fit for it, but of one thing you may be sure. If old Rogers does not honestly believe he is fit for it, he will not take it, and he will tell you why, too. Of that, however, I think I may be a better judge than he. There is nothing to which a good sailor cannot turn his hand, whatever he may think himself. You see, Mr. Walton, it is not like a routine trade. Things are never twice the same at sea. The sailor has a thousand chances of using his judgment, if he has any to use, and that old Rogers has in no common degree. So I should have no fear of him. If he won't let me steer him, you must put your hand to the tiller for me. I will do what I can, I answered, for nothing would please me more than to see him in your service. It would be much better for him, and his wife too, than living by uncertain jobs, as he does now. The result of it all was that old Rogers consented to try for a month, but when the end of the month came, nothing was said on either side, and the old man remained, and I could see several little new comforts about the cottage, in consequence of the regularity of his wages. Now I must report another occurrence in regular sequence. To my surprise, and I must confess, not a little to my discomposure, when I rose in the reading desk on the day after this dinner with Dr. Duncan, I saw that the hall pew was full. Miss Oldcastle was there for the first time, and, by her side, the gentleman whom the day before I had encouraged on horseback. He sat carelessly, easily, contentedly, indifferently, for, although I never that morning looked up for my prayer book, except involuntarily in the changes of posture, I could not help seeing that he was always behind the rest of the congregation, as if he had no idea of what was coming next or did not care to conform. Gladly would I, that day, have shunned the necessity of preaching that was laid upon me. But, I said to myself, shall the work given me to do fair ill because of the perturbation of my spirit? No harm is done though I suffer, but much harm if one tone fails of its force because I suffer. I therefore prayed God to help me, and feeling the right, because I felt the need of looking to Him for aid, I cast my care upon him, kept my thoughts strenuously away from that which discomposed me, and never turned my eyes towards the hall pew from the moment I entered the pulpit, and partly, I presume, from the freedom given by the sense of irresponsibility for the result, I being weak and God strong, I preached, I think, a better sermon than I had ever preached before. But when I got into the vestry, I found that I could scarcely stand for trembling, and I must have looked ill. For when my attendant came in, he got me a glass of wine without even asking me if I would have it, although it was not my custom to take any there. But there was one of my congregation that morning who suffered more than I did from the presence of one of those who filled the hall pew. I recovered in a few moments from my weakness, but altogether disinclined to face any of my congregation, went out at my vestry door, and home through the shrubbery, a path I seldom used because it had a separatist look about it. When I got to my study, I threw myself on the couch and fell fast asleep. How often in trouble have I had to thank God for sleep, as for one of his best gifts, and how often, when I have awake refreshed and calm, have I thought of poor Sir Philip Sidney, who, dying slowly and patiently in the prime of life and health, was sorely troubled in his mind to know how he had offended God, because, having prayed earnestly for sleep, no sleep came in answer to his cry. I woke just in time for my afternoon service, and the inward peace in which I found my heart was to myself a marvel and a delight. I felt almost as if I was walking in a blessed dream, come from a world of serener air than this of ours. I found, after I was already in the reading desk, that I was a few minutes early, and while, with bowed head, 
I was simply living in the consciousness of the presence of a supreme quiet. The first low notes of the organ broke upon my stillness with the sense of a deeper delight. Never before had I felt, as I felt that afternoon, the triumph of contemplation in Handel's rendering of I Know That My Redeemer Liveth, and I felt how through it all ran a cold, silvery quiver of sadness, like the light in the east after the sun has gone down, which would have been pain, but for the golden glow of the west, which looks after the light of the world with a patient waiting. Before the music ceased, it had crossed my mind that I had never before heard that organ utter itself in the language of Handel. But I had no time to think more about it just then, for I rose to read the words of our Lord. I will arise and go to my father. There was no one in the hall pew. Indeed, it was a rare occurrence if anyone was there in the afternoon. But for all the quietness of my mind during that evening service, I fell ill before I went to bed, and awoke in the morning with a headache, which increased along with other signs of perturbation of the system, until I thought it better to send for Dr. Duncan. I have not yet got so imbecile as to suppose that, a history of the following six weeks would be interesting to my readers, for during so long did I suffer from low fever, and more weeks passed during which I was unable to meet my flock. Thanks to the care of Mr. Brownrigg, a clever young man in priest's orders, who was living at Addis Head while waiting for a curacy, kindly undertook my duty for me, and thus relieved me from all anxiety about supplying my Chapter Seventeen of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Curtis. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter Seventeen. But I cannot express equal satisfaction in regard to everything that Mr. Brownrigg took upon his own responsibility, as my reader will see. He and another farmer, his neighbor, had been so often re-elected church wardens that at last they seemed to have gained a prescriptive right to the office, and the form of election fell into disuse, so much so that after Mr. Summers' death, which took place some year and a half before I became vicar of marshmallows, Mr. Brownrigg continued to exercise the duty in his own single person, and nothing had as yet been said about the election of a colleague. So little seemed to fall to the duty of the churchwarden that I regarded the neglect as a trifle, and was remiss in setting it right. I had, therefore, to suffer, as was just. Indeed, Mr. Brownrigg was not the man to have power in his hands unchecked. I had so far recovered that I was able to rise about noon and go into my study, though I was very weak and had not yet been out, when one morning Mrs. Pearson came into the room and said, "'Please, sir, here's young Thomas Wire, in a great way about something, and insisting upon seeing you, if you possibly can.' I had as yet seen very few of my friends except the doctor, and those only for two or three minutes. But although I did not feel very fit for seeing anybody just then, I could not but yield to his desire, confident there must be a good reason for it, and so told Mrs. Pearson to show him in. "'Oh, sir, I know you would be vexed if you hadn't been told,' he exclaimed, "'and I am sure you will not be angry with me for troubling you.' "'What is the matter, Tom?' I said. "'I assure you I shall not be angry with you. "'There's Farmer Brownrigg, at this moment, "'taking away Mr. Templeton's table "'because he won't pay the church rate.' "'What church rate?' I cried, starting up from the sofa. "'I never heard of a church rate.' Now, before I go farther, it is necessary to explain some things. One day before I was taken ill, I had had a little talk with Mr. Brownrigg about some repairs of the church, which were necessary and must be done before another winter. I confess I was rather pleased, for I wanted my people to feel that the church was their property, and that it was their privilege, if they could regard it as a blessing to have the church, to keep it in decent order and repair. So I said in a, by the by, the by to my church warden, we must call a vestry before long and have this looked to. Now my predecessor had left everything of the kind to his church wardens, and the inhabitants from their side had likewise left the whole affair to the church wardens. But Mr. Brownrigg, who I must say, 
had taken more pains than might have been expected of him to make himself acquainted with the legalities of his office, did not fail to call a vestry, to which, as usual, no one had responded. Whereupon he imposed a rate according to his own unaided judgment. This, I believe, he did during my illness, with the notion of pleasing me by the discovery that the repairs had been already effected according to my mind. Nor did any one of my congregation throw the least difficulty in the churchwarden's way. And now I must refer to another circumstance in the history of my parish. I think I have already alluded to the fact that there were dissenters and marshmallows. There was a little chapel down a lane leading from the main street of the village, in which there was service three times every Sunday. People came to it from many parts of the parish, amongst whom were the families of two or three farmers of substance, while the village and its neighborhood contributed a portion of the poorest of their inhabitants. A year or two before I came their minister died, and they had chosen another, a very worthy man of considerable erudition, but of extreme use, as I heard, upon insignificant points, and moved by a great dislike to national churches and episcopacy. This, I say, is what I had made out about him, from what I had heard, and my reader will very probably be inclined to ask, but why, with principles such as yours, should you have only hearsay to go upon? Why did you not make the honest man's acquaintance? In such a small place, men should not keep each other at arm's length. And any reader who says so will say right. All I have to suggest for myself is simply a certain shyness for which I cannot entirely account, but which was partly made up of fear to intrude, or of being supposed to arrogate to myself the right of making advances, partly of a dread lest we should not be able to get on together, and so the attempt should result in something unpleasantly awkward. I dare say, likewise, that the natural shelliness of the English had something to do with it. At all events, I had not made his acquaintance. Mr. Templeton, then, had refused, as a point of conscience, to pay the church rate when the collector went round to demand it had been summoned before a magistrate in consequence, had suffered a default, and proceedings being pushed from the first in all the pride of Mr. Brownrigg's legality, had on this very day been visited by the church warden, accompanied by a broker from the neighboring town of Addishead, and at the very time when I was hearing of the fact was suffering distraint of his goods. The porcine head of the church warden was not on his shoulders by accident, nor without significance. But I did not wait to understand all this now. It was enough for me that Tom bore witness to the fact that at that moment proceedings were thus driven to extremity. I rang the bell for my boots, and, to the open-mouthed dismay of Mrs. Pearson, left the vicarage leaning on Tom's arm. But such was the commotion in my mind that I had become quite unconscious of illness or even feebleness. Hurrying on in more terror than I can well express lest I should be too late, I reached Mr. Templeton's house just as a small mahogany table was being hoisted into a spring-cart which stood at the door. Breathless with haste, I was yet able to call out, Put that table down directly. At the same moment Mr. Brownrigg appeared from within the door. He approached with the self-satisfied look of a man who had done his duty and is proud of it. I think he had not heard me. You see, I'm prompt, Mr. Walton, he said, but bless my soul, how ill you look. Without answering him, for I was more angry with him than I ought to have been, I repeated, Put that table down, I tell you. They did so. Now, I said, carry it back into the house. Why, sir, imposed Mr. Brownrigg, it's all right. Yes, I said, as right as the devil would have it. I assure you, sir, I've done everything according to law. I'm not so sure of that. I believe I had the right to be chairman at the vestry meeting, but instead of even letting me know, you took advantage of my illness to hurry on matters to this shameful and wicked excess. I did the poor man wrong in this, for I believe he had hurried things really to please me. His face had lengthened considerably by this time, and its rubicund hue declined. I did not think you would stand upon ceremony about it, sir. You never seem to care for business. If you talk about legality, so will I. Certainly you didn't stand upon ceremony. I didn't expect you would turn against your own churchwarden in the execution of his duty, sir, he said in an offended tone. It's bad enough to have a meetin' house in the place, with t'other parson, as won't pay a lawful church rate. I would have paid the church rate for the whole parish ten times over, before such a thing should have happened. I feel so disgraced I am ashamed to look Mr. Templeton in the face. Carry the table into the house again directly. "'It's my property now,' interposed the broker. 
I bought it of the church warden and paid for it. I turned to Mr. Brownrigg. How much did he give you for it? I asked. Twenty shillings, returned he sulkily, and it won't pay expenses. Twenty shillings, I exclaimed, for a table that costs three times as much at least. What do you expect to sell it for? That's my business, answered the broker. I pulled out my purse and threw a sovereign and a half on the table, saying, Fifty per cent will be, I think, profit enough, even on such a transaction. I did not offer you the table, returned the broker. I am not bound to sell except I please and at my own price. Possibly, but I tell you the whole affair is illegal, and if you carry away the table, I shall see what the law will do for me. I assure you I will prosecute you myself. You take up that money or I will. It will go to pay counsel, I give you my word, if you do not take it to quench strife. I stretched out my hand, but the broker was before me. Without another word he pocketed the money, jumped into his cart with his man, and drove off, leaving the church warden and the parson standing at the door of the dissenting minister with his mahogany table on the path between them. Now, Mr. Brownrigg, I said, lend me a hand to carry this table in again. He yielded, not graciously, that could not be expected, but in silence. "'Oh, sir!' interposed young Tom, who had stood by during the dispute. "'Let me take it. You're not able to lift it.' "'Nonsense, Tom. Keep away,' I said. "'It's all the reparation I can make.' And so Mr. Brownrigg and I blundered into the little parlor with our burden. Not a great one, but I began to find myself railing. Mr. Templeton sat in a Windsor chair in the middle of the room. Evidently the table had been carried away from before him, leaving his position uncovered. The floor was strewed with the books which had lain upon it. He sat reading an old folio as if nothing had happened but when we entered, he rose. He was a man of middle size, about forty, with short black hair and overhanging bushy eyebrows. His mouth indicated great firmness, not unmingled with sweetness and even with humor. He smiled as he rose, but looked embarrassed, glancing first at the table, then at me, and then at Mr. Brownrigg, as if begging someone to tell him what to say. But I did not leave him a moment in this perplexity. "'Mr. Templeton,' I said, quitting the table and holding out my hand, "'I beg your pardon for myself and my friend here, my church warden. "'Mr. Brownrigg gave a grunt. "'That you should have been annoyed like this. "'I have—' "'Mr. Templeton interrupted me. "'I assure you it was a matter of conscience with me,' he said. "'On no other ground. "'I know it, I know it,' I said, interrupting him in my turn. "'I beg your pardon, and I have done my best to make amends for it.' Offenses must come, you know, Mr. Templeton, but I trust I have not incurred the woe that follows upon them by means of whom they come, for I knew nothing of it, and indeed was too ill. Here my strength left me altogether, and I sat down. The room began to whirl round me, and I remember nothing more till I knew that I was lying on a couch, with Mrs. Templeton bathing my forehead, and Mr. Templeton trying to get something into my mouth with a spoon. Ashamed to find myself in such circumstances, I tried to rise, but Mr. Templeton, laying his hand on mine, said, My dear sir, add to your kindness this day by letting my wife and me minister to you. Now was not that a courteous speech? He went on. Mr. Brownrigg has gone for Dr. Duncan and will be back in a few moments. I beg you will not exert yourself. I yielded and lay still. Dr. Duncan came, his carriage followed, and I was taken home. Before we started, I said to Mr. Brownrigg, for I could not rest till I had said it, Mr. Brownrigg, I spoke in heat when I came up to you, and I am sure I did you wrong. I am certain you had no improper motive in not making me acquainted with your proceedings. You meant no harm to me, but you did very wrong towards Mr. Templeton. I will try to show you that when I am well again, but— But you mustn't talk more now, said Dr. Duncan. So I shook hands with Mr. Brownrigg, and we parted. I fear, from what I know of my churchwarden, that he went home with the conviction that he had done perfectly right, and that the parson had made an apology for interfering with the churchwarden, who was doing his best to uphold the dignity of church and state. But perhaps I may be doing him wrong again. I went home to a week more of bed and a lengthened process of recovery, during which many were the kind inquiries made after me by my friends, and amongst them by Mr. Templeton, and here I may as well sketch the result of that strange introduction to the dissenting minister. 
After I was tolerably well again, I received a friendly letter from him one day, expostulating with me on the inconsistency of my remaining within the pale of the established church. The gist of the letter lay in these words. I confess it perplexes me to understand how to reconcile your Christian and friendly behavior to one whom most of your brethren would consider as much beneath their notice as inferior to them in social position, with your remaining the minister of a church in which such enormities, as you employed your private influence to counteract in my case, are not only possible, but certainly lawful, and recognized by most of its members as likewise expedient. To this I replied, my dear sir, I do not like writing letters, especially on subjects of importance. There are a thousand chances of misunderstanding, whereas in a personal interview there is a possibility of controversy being hallowed by communion. Come and dine with me to-morrow at an hour convenient to you, and make my apologies to Mrs. Templeton for not inviting her with you, on the ground that we are to have a long talk with each other about the distracting influence which even her presence would unavoidably occasion. I am, etc., etc. He accepted my invitation at once. During dinner we talked away, not upon indifferent, but upon the most interesting subjects, connected with the poor and the parish work and the influence of the higher upon the lower classes of society. At length we sat down on opposite sides of the fire, and as soon as Mrs. Pearson had shut the door, I said, You ask me, Mr. Templeton, in your very kind letter, and here I put my hand in my pocket to find it. I asked you, imposed Mr. Templeton, how you could belong to a church which authorizes things of which you yourself so heartily disapprove. And I answer you, I returned, that just to such a church our Lord belonged. I do not quite understand you. Our Lord belonged to the Jewish church, but ours is his church. Yes, but principles remain the same. I speak of him as belonging to a church. His conduct would be the same in the same circumstances, whatever church he belonged to, because he would always do right. I want, if you will allow me, to show you the principle upon which he acted with regard to church rates. Certainly. I beg your pardon for interrupting you. The Pharisees demanded a tribute, which, it is allowed, was for the support of the temple and its worship. Our Lord did not refuse to acknowledge their authority, notwithstanding the many ways in which they had degraded the religious observances of the Jewish church. He acknowledged himself a child of the church, but said that as a child he ought to have been left to contribute as he pleased to the support of its ordinances, and not to be compelled after such a fashion. "'There I have you,' exclaimed Mr. Templeton. He said they were wrong to make the tribute or church rate, if it was really such compulsory. "'I grant it, it is entirely wrong.' a very unchristian proceeding. But our Lord did not therefore desert the church, as you would have me do. He paid the money, lest he should offend, and not having it of his own, he had to ask his father for it, or, what came to the same thing, make a servant of his father, namely a fish in the Sea of Galilee, bring him the money. Have you, Mr. Templeton, it is wrong to compel and wrong to refuse the payment of a church rate, I do not say equally wrong. It is much worse to compel than to refuse. You are very generous, returned Mr. Templeton. May I hope that you will do me the credit to believe that if I saw clearly that they were the same thing, I would not hesitate a moment to follow our Lord's example. I believe it perfectly. Therefore, however we may defer, we are in reality at no strife. But is there not this difference that our Lord was, as you say, a child of the Jewish church? which was indubitably established by God. Now, if I cannot conscientiously belong to the so-called English church, why should I have to pay church rate or tribute? Shall I tell you the argument the English church might then use? The church might say, Then you are a stranger and no child. Therefore, like the kings of the earth, we may take tribute of you. So you see, it would come to this, that dissenters alone should be compelled to pay church rates. We both laughed at this pushing of the argument to illegitimate conclusions. Then I resumed. But the real argument is that not for such faults should we separate from each other, not for such faults or any fault, so long as it is the repository of the truth should you separate from the church. 
I will yield the point when you can show me the same ground for believing the Church of England, the national church appointed such by God, that I can show you, and you know already, for receiving the Jewish church as the appointment of God. That would involve a long argument, upon which, though I have little doubt upon the matter myself, I cannot say I am prepared to enter at this moment. Meantime, I would just ask you whether you are not sufficiently a child of the Church of England, having received from it a thousand influences for good, if in no other way, yet through your fathers to find it no great hardship, and not very unreasonable, to pay a trifle to keep and repair one of the tabernacles in which our forefathers worshipped together, as I hope you will allow, in some imperfect measure God is worshipped, and the truth is preached in it. Most willingly would I pay the money. I object simply because the rate is compulsory. And therein you have our Lord's example to the contrary. A silence followed, for I had to deal with an honest man who was thinking. I resumed. A thousand difficulties will no doubt come up to be considered in the matter. Do not suppose I am anxious to convince you. I believe that our father, our elder brother, and the spirit that proceedeth from them is teaching you as I believe I too am being taught by the same. Why, then, should I be anxious to convince you of anything? Will you not, in his good time, come to see what he would have you see? I am relieved to speak my mind, knowing he would have us speak our minds to each other, but I do not want to proselytize. If you change your mind, you will probably do so on different grounds from any I give you on grounds which show themselves in the course of your own search and the foundations of truth in regard, perhaps, to some other question altogether. Again a silence followed. Then Mr. Templeton spoke. "'Don't think I am satisfied,' he said, "'because I don't choose to say anything more till I have thought about it. I think you are wrong in your conclusion about the Church, though surely you are right in thinking we ought to have patience with each other. And now tell me true, Mr. Walton,' I'm a blunt kind of man, descended from an old Puritan, one of Cromwell's Ironsides, I believe, and I haven't been to a university like you, but I'm no fool either, I hope. Don't be offended at my question. Wouldn't you be glad to see me out of your parish now? I began to speak, but he went on. Don't you regard me as an interloper now, one who has no right to speak because he does not belong to the church? God forbid, I answered. If a word of mine would make you leave my parish to-morrow, I dare not say it. I do not want to incur the rebuke of our Lord, for surely the words forbid him not involve some rebuke. Would it not be a fearful thing that one soul, because of a deed of mine, should receive a less portion of elevation or comfort in his journey towards his home? Are there not countless modes of saying the truth? You have some of them. I hope I have some. People will hear you. Who will not hear me? Preach to them in the name and love of God, Mr. Templeton. Speak that you do know and testify that you have seen. You and I will help each other in proportion as we serve the Master. I only say that in separating from us you are in effect and by your conduct saying to us, Do not preach, for you follow not with us. I will not be guilty of the same towards you. Your fathers did the church no end of good by leaving it, but it is time to unite now. Once more followed a silence. If people could only meet and look each other in the face, said Mr. Templeton at length, they might find there was not such a gulf between them as they had fancied. And so we parted. Now I do not write all this for the sake of the church rate question. I write it to commemorate the spirit in which Mr. Templeton met me. For it is of consequence that two men who love their master should recognize each that the other does so, and thereupon, if not before, should cease to be estranged because of difference of opinion, which surely, inevitable as offense, does not involve the same denunciation of woe. After this, Mr. Templeton and I found some opportunities of helping each other, and many a time ere his death we consulted together about things that befell. Once he came to me about a legal difficulty in connection with the deed of trust of his chapel, and although I could not help him myself, I directed him to such help as was thorough, and cost him nothing. I need not say he never became a churchman, or that I never expected he would. 
all his memories of a religious childhood, all the sources of the influences which had refined and elevated him, were surrounded with other associations than those of the church and her forms. The church was his grandmother, not his mother, and he had not made any acquaintance with her till comparatively late in life. But while I do not say that his intellectual objections to the church were less strong than they had been, I am sure that his feelings were moderated, even changed towards her. And though this may seem of no consequence to one who loves the church more than the brotherhood, it does not seem of little consequence to me who love the church because of the brotherhood, of which it is the type and the restorer. It was long before another church rate was levied in marshmallows, and when the circumstance did take place, no one dreamed of calling on Mr. Templeton for his share in it. But having heard of it, he called himself upon the church warden, Mr. Brownrigg still, and offered the money cheerfully. And Mr. Brownrigg refused to take it till he had consulted me. I told him to call on Mr. Templeton, and say he would be much obliged to him for his contribution, and give him a receipt for it. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter 18 Judy's News. Perhaps my reader may be sufficiently interested in the person who, having once begun to tell a story, may possibly have allowed his feelings, in concert with the comfortable confidence afforded by the mask of namelessness, to run away with his pen, and so have babbled of himself more than he ought, may be sufficiently interested, I say, in my mental condition, to cast a speculative thought upon the state of my mind, during my illness, with regard to Miss Oldcastle, and the stranger who is her mother's guest at the hall. Possibly, being by nature gifted, as I have certainly discovered, with more of hope than is usually mingled with the other elements composing the temperament of humanity, I did not suffer quite so much as some would have suffered during such an illness. But I have reason to fear that when I was lightheaded from fever, which was a not uncommon occurrence, especially in the early mornings during the worst of my illness, when Mrs. Pearson had to sit up with me, and sometimes an old woman of the village who was generally called in upon such occasions, I may have talked a good deal of nonsense about Miss Oldcastle. For I remember that I was haunted with visions of magnificent conventual ruins which I had discovered, and which, no one seeming to care about them but myself, I was left to wander through at my own lonely will. Would I could see with the waking eye such a grandeur of Gothic arches and long-drawn aisles as then arose upon my sick sense. Within was a labyrinth of passages in the walls, and long-sounding corridors, and sudden galleries, whence I looked down into the great church aching with silence. Through these I was ever wandering, ever discovering new rooms, new galleries, new marvels of architecture ever disappointed and ever dissatisfied, because I knew that in one room somewhere in the forgotten mysteries of the pile sat Ethelwyn reading, never lifting those sea-blue eyes of hers from the great volume on her knee, reading every word, slowly turning leaf after leaf, knew that she would sit there reading till, one by one, every leaf in the huge volume was turned, and she came to the last and read it from top to bottom down to the phoenix and the urn with a weeping willow over it, when she would close the book with a sigh, lay it down on the floor, rise and walk slowly away, and leave the glorious ruin dead to me, as it had so long been to everyone else, knew that if I did not find her before that terrible last page was read, I should never find her at all but have to go wandering alone all my life through those dreary galleries and corridors, with one hope only left, 
that I might yet before I died find the palace chamber far apart, and see the red and forsaken volume lying on the floor where she had left it, and the chair beside it upon which she had sat so long waiting for someone in vain. And perhaps to words spoken under these impressions may partly be attributed the fact, which I knew nothing of till long afterwards, that the people of the village began to couple my name with that of Miss Oldcastle. When all this vanished from me in the returning wave of health that spread through my weary brain, I was yet left anxious and thoughtful. There was no one from whom I could ask any information about the family at the hall so that I was just driven to the best thing, to try to cast my care upon him who cared for my care. How often do we look upon God as our last and feeblest resource? We go to him because we have nowhere else to go, and then we learn that the storms of life have driven us, not upon the rocks, but into the desired haven, that we have been compelled, as to the last remaining, so to the best, the only, the central help, the cause and cause of all the helps to which we had turned aside as nearer and better. One day, when, having considerably recovered from my second attack, I was sitting reading in my study, who should be announced but my friend Judy. "'Oh, dear Mr. Walton, I am so sorry that you have been so ill,' exclaimed the impulsive girl, taking my hand in both of hers and sitting down beside me. I haven't had a chance of coming to see you before, though we've always managed, I mean Auntie and I, to hear about you. I would have come to nurse you, but it was no use thinking of it. I smiled as I thanked her. Ah, you think because I'm such a tomboy that I couldn't nurse you. I only wish I had had a chance of letting you see. I'm so sorry for you. But I'm nearly well now, Judy, and I have been taken good care of. "'But that frumpy old thing, Mrs. Pearson, and—' "'Mrs. Pearson is a very kind woman, and an excellent nurse,' I said, but she would not heed me. "'And that awful old witch, Mother Goose, she was enough to give you bad dreams all night she sat by you.' "'I didn't dream about Mother Goose, as you call her, Judy, I assure you. "'But now I want to hear how everybody is at the hall. "'What, Granny, and the White Wolf, and all?' "'as many as you please to tell me about. "'Well, Granny is gracious to everybody but Auntie. "'Why isn't she gracious to Auntie? "'I don't know. I only guess. "'Is your visitor gone? "'Yes, long ago. "'Do you know I think Granny wants Auntie to marry him, "'and Auntie doesn't quite like it? "'But he's very nice. He's so funny. "'He'll be back again soon, I dare say. "'I don't quite like him.' "'Not so well as you by a whole half, Mr. Walton. "'I wish you would marry Auntie, but that would never do. "'It would drive Granny out of her wits.' "'To stop the strange girl and hide some confusion, I said, "'Now tell me about the rest of them. "'Sarah comes next. "'She's as white and as wolfy as ever. "'Mr. Walton, I hate that woman. "'She walks like a cat. "'I'm sure she is bad.' "'Did you ever think, Judy, what an awful thing it is to be bad? "'If you did, I think you would be so sorry for her. "'You could not hate her.' "'At the same time, knowing what I knew now, "'and remembering that impressions can date from further back than the memory can reach, "'I was not surprised to hear that Judy hated Sarah, "'though I could not believe that in such a child the hatred was of the most deadly description. "'I am sure I must go on hating in the meantime,' said Judy. I wish someone would marry Auntie and turn Sarah away. But that can't be so long as Granny lives. How is Mr. Stoddart? There, now, that's one of the things Auntie said I was to be sure to tell you. Then your aunt knew you were coming to see me? Oh, yes, I told her. Not Granny, you know. You mustn't let it out. I shall be careful. How is Mr. Stoddart, then? Not well at all. He was taken ill before you, and has been in bed and by the fireside ever since. And he doesn't know what to do with him. He is so out of spirits. If tomorrow is fine, I shall go and see him. Thank you. I believe that's just what Auntie wanted. He won't like it at first, I dare say. But he'll come to, and you'll do him good. You do everybody good you come near. I wish that were true, Judy. I fear it is not. 
"'What good did I ever do you, Judy?' "'Do me?' she exclaimed, apparently half angry at the question. "'Don't you know I have been an altered character ever since I knew you?' And here the odd creature laughed, leaving me in absolute ignorance of how to interpret her. But presently her eyes grew clearer, and I could see the slow film of a tear gathering. "'Mr. Walton,' she said, "'I have been trying not to be selfish. "'You have done me that much good.' "'I am very glad, Judy. "'Don't forget who can do you all good. "'There is one who can not only show you what is right, "'but can make you able to do and be what is right. "'You don't know how much you have got to learn yet, Judy, "'but there is that one teacher ever ready to teach "'if you will only ask him.' "'Judy did not answer, "'but sat looking fixedly at the carpet.' She was thinking, though, I saw. "'Who has played the organ, Judy, since your uncle was taken ill?' I asked at length. "'Why, Auntie, to be sure. Didn't you hear?' "'No,' I answered, turning almost sick at the idea of having been away from church for so many Sundays while she was giving voice and expression to the dear asthmatic old pipes. And I did feel very ready to murmur, like a spoilt child that had not had his way think of her there and me here. Then, I said to myself at last, it must have been she that played I know that my Redeemer liveth the last time I was in church. And instead of thanking God for that, here I am murmuring that he did not give me more. And this child has just been telling me that I have taught her to try not to be selfish. Certainly I should be ashamed of myself. When was your uncle taken ill? I don't exactly remember, but you will come and see him to-morrow, and then we shall see you too, for we are always out and in of his room just now. I will come if Dr. Duncan will let me. Perhaps he will take me in his carriage. No, no, don't you come with him. Uncle can't bear doctors. He never was ill in his life before, and he behaves to Dr. Duncan just as if he had made him ill. I wish I could send the carriage for you, but I can't, you know. Never mind, Judy. I shall manage somehow. What is the name of the gentleman who was staying with you? Don't you know? Captain George Everard. He would change his name to Old Castle, you know. What a foolish pain, like a spear thrust, they sent through me, those words spoken in such a taken-for-granted way. He's a relation, on Granny's side mostly, I believe. But I never could understand the explanation. What makes it harder is— that all the husbands and wives in our family, for a hundred and fifty years, have been more or less of cousins, or half-cousins, or second or third cousins. Captain Everard has what Grandmama calls a neat little property of his own from his mother, somewhere in Northumberland. For he is only a third son, one of a class Granny does not in general feel very friendly to, I assure you, Mr. Walton. But his second brother is dead, and the eldest something the worse for the wear, as Granny says, so that the captain comes just within sight of the coronet of an old uncle who ought to have been dead long ago. Just the match for Auntie. But you said Auntie doesn't like him. Oh, but you know that doesn't matter, returned Judy, with bitterness. What will Granny care for that? It's nothing to anybody but Auntie, and she must get used to it. Nobody makes anything of her. It was only after she had gone that I thought how astounding it would have been to me to hear a girl of her age show such an acquaintance with worldliness and scheming, had I not been personally so much concerned about one of the objects of her remarks. She certainly was a strange girl. But strange as she was, it was a satisfaction to think that the aunt had such a friend and ally in her wild niece. Evidently she had inherited her father's fearlessness— and if only it should turn out that she had likewise inherited her mother's firmness, she might render the best possible service to her aunt against the oppression of her willful mother. "'How are you able to get here today?' I asked, as she rose to go. "'Granny is in London, and the wolf is with her. Auntie wouldn't leave uncle.' "'They have been a good deal in London of late, have they not?' "'Yes. They say it's about money of auntie's. But I don't understand. I think it's that Granny wants to make the captain marry her, for they sometimes see him when they go to London.
Chapter 19 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Blanchard. Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald. Chapter 19 The Invalid. The following day being very fine, I walked to Old Castle Hall but i remember well how much slow i was forced to walk than i was willing i found to my relief that mrs oldcastle had not yet returned i was shown at once to mr stoddart's library there i found the two ladies in attendance upon him he was seated by a splendid fire for the autumn days were now chilly on the shady side in the most luxurious of easy chairs with his furred feet buried in the long hair of the hearth rug he looked worn and peevish all the placidity of his countenance had vanished the smooth expanse of his forehead was drawn into fifty wrinkles like a sea over which the fretting wind had been blowing all night nor was it only suffering that his face expressed he looked like a man who strongly suspected that he was ill-used after salutation you are well off mr stoddard i said to have two such nurses they are very kind sighed the patient you would recommend mrs pearson and mother goose instead would you not mr walton said judy her grey eyes sparkled with fun judy be quiet said the invalid languidly and yet sharply judy redeemed and was silent i'm sorry for finding you so unwell i said yes i am very ill he returned aunt and niece rose and left the room quietly do you suffer much mr stoddard much weariness worse than pain i could welcome death i do not think from what dr duncan says of you that there is reason to apprehend more than a lingering illness i said to try him i confess i hope not indeed he exclaimed angrily sitting up in his chair what right has dr duncan to talk of me so to a friend you know i return apologetically who is much interested in your welfare yes of course so is the doctor a sick man belongs to you both by prescription for my part i would rather talk about religion to a whole man rather than a sick man a sick man is not a whole man he is but part of a man as it were for the time and it is not so easy to tell what he can take thank you I am obliged to you for my new position in the social scale. Of the tailor species, I suppose. I could not help wishing he were as far up as any man that does such needful honest work. My dear sir, I beg your pardon. I meant only a glance at the peculiar relation of the words whole and heal. I do not find entomology interesting at present. Not seated in such a library as this? No, I am ill satisfied that ill as he was he might be better if he would i resolved to make another trial do you remember how ligarius in julius caesar discards his sickness i am not sick if brutus have in hand any exploit worthy the name of honour i want to be well i do not like to be ill but what there is in this foggy swampy world worth being well for i'm sure i haven't found out yet if you have not it must be because you have never tried to find out but i am not going to attack you when you are not able to defend yourself we shall find a better time for that but can't i do something for you would you like me to read to you for half an hour no thank you the girls tire me out with reading to me i hate the very sound of their voices I have today's times in my pocket. I've heard all the news already. Then I think I shall only bore you if I stay. He made me no answer. I rose. He just let me take his hand and return my good morning as if there was nothing good in the world, least of all the same morning. I found the ladies in the outer room. Judy was on her knees, on the floor occupied with a long row of books. How the books had got there, I wondered, but soon learned that the secret, which I had in vain asked of the butler on my first visit, namely, how Mr. Stoddard reached the volumes arranged immediately under the ceiling, in shelves, 
as my reader may remember, that looked like beams radiating from the centre. For Judy rose from the floor and proceeded to put in motion a mechanical arrangement concealed in one of the divisions of the bookshelves along the wall, and I now saw that there were strong cords reaching from the ceiling, and attached to the shelves, or rather long box sideways open, which contained the books. "'Do take care, Judy,' said Ethelin. "'You know it is very venturous of you to let that shelf down, when Uncle is so jealous of his books as a hen of her chickens. I oughtn't have let you touch the cords. You couldn't help it, Auntie dear, for I had the shelves halfway down before you saw me,' returned Judy, proceeding to rise the books to their usual position under the ceiling. But in another moment, either from Judy's awkwardness or from the gradual decay and final fracture of some cord, down came the whole shelf with a thundering noise, and the books were scattered hither and thither in confusion about the floor. Ethelin was gazing in dismay, and Judy had built up her face in a defiant look, when the door of the inner room opened and Mr. Stoddard appeared. His brow was already flushed, but when he saw the condition of his idols, for the lust of his eye, had its full share in his disregard for his books, he broke out in a passion to which he could not have given away but for the weak state of his health. "'How dare you!' he said, with terrible emphasis on the word dare. "'Judy, I beg you will not again show yourself in my apartment till I send for you.' "'And then,' said Judy, leaving the room, "'I am not in the least likely to be otherwise engaged.' "'I am very sorry, uncle,' begged Miss Oldcastle. But Mr. Stoddard had already retreated and banged the door behind him. So Miss Oldcastle and I were left standing together amid the ruins. She glanced at me with a distressed look. I smiled. She smiled in return. I assure you, she said, Uncle is not a bit like himself. And I fear in trying to rouse him, I have done him no good. Only made him more irritable, I said. But he will be sorry when he comes to himself. And so we must take the reversion of his repentance now and think nothing more of the matter than if he had already said he was sorry. Besides, when books are in the case, I, for one, must not be too hard upon my unfortunate neighbour. Thank you, Mr. Walton. I am so much obliged for you taking my uncle's part. He has been very good to me, and that dear Judy is provoking sometimes. I am afraid I help to spoil her, but you would hardly believe how good she really is, and what a comfort she is to me with all her waywardness. I think I understand, Judy, I replied, and I shall be more mistaken than I am willing to confess I have ever been before, if she does not turn out a very fine woman. The marvel to me is that with all the various influences amongst which she is placed here, she is not really, not seriously spoiled after all. I assure you, I have the greatest regard for, as well as confidence in, my friend Judy. Ethelin, Miss Oldcastle, I should say, gave me such a pleased look that I was well recompensed, if justice should ever talk of recompense for my defence of her niece. Will you come with me, she said, for I fear our talk may continue to annoy Mr. Stoddard. His hearing is acute at all times, and has been excessively so, since his illness. I am at your service, I returned, and followed her from the room. Are you still as fond of the old quarry as you used to be, Miss Oldcastle? I said, as we caught a glimpse of it from the window of a long passage we were going through. I think I am. I go there most days. I have not been today, though. Would you like to go down? Very much, I said. Ah, I forgot, though. You must not go. It is not a fit place for an invalid. I cannot call myself an invalid now. Your face, I am sorry to say, contradicts your words. And she looked so kindly at me that I almost broke out into thanks for the mere look. And indeed, she went on, it is too damp down there, not to speak of the stairs. By this time we had reached the little room in which I was received the first time I visited the hall. There we found Judy. If you are not too tired already, 
I should like to show you my little study. It has, I think, a better view than any other room in the house, said Miss Oldcastle. I shall be delighted, I replied. Come, Judy, said her aunt. You don't want me, I'm sure, Auntie. I do, Judy, really. You mustn't be cross to us because Uncle has been cross to you. Uncle is not well, you know, and isn't a bit like himself, and you know you should not have meddled with his machinery. And Miss Oldcastle put her arm round Judy and kissed her, whereupon Judy jumped from her seat, threw her book down, and ran to one of the several doors that opened from the room. This disclosed a little staircase, almost like a ladder, only that it wound about, up which we climbed, and reached a charming little room, whose window looked down upon the bishop's basin, glimmering slightly through the tops of the trees between. It was panelled in a small panel of dark oak, like the room below, but with more of carving. Consequently, it was sombre, and its sombreness was unrelieved by any mirror. I gazed about me with a kind of awe. I would gladly have carried away the remembrance of everything and its shadow. Just opposite the window was a small space of brightness formed from the backs of nicely bound books. Seeing that these attracted my eye. Those are almost all gifts from my uncle, said Miss Oldcastle. He is really very kind, and you will not think of him as you have seen him today. Indeed I will not, I replied. My eye fell upon a small pianoforte. Do sit down, said Miss Oldcastle. You have been very ill, and I could do nothing for you who have been so kind to me. She spoke as if we had wanted to say this. I only wish I had a chance of doing anything for you, I said, as I took a chair in the window. But if I had done all I ever could hope to do, you have repaid me long ago, I think. How? I do not know what you mean, Mr. Walton. I have never done you the least service. Tell me first, did you play the organ in the church that afternoon, when, after before I was taken ill, I mean the same day you had a friend with you in the pew in the morning? I dare say my voice was as irregular as my construction. I ventured just one glance. Her face was flushed, but she answered me at once. I did. Then I am in your debt, more than you know or I can tell you. Why, if that is all, I have played the organ every Sunday since Uncle was taken ill, she said, smiling. I know that now, and I am very glad I did not know it till I was better able to bear the disappointment. But it is only for what I heard that I mean now to acknowledge my obligation. Tell me, Miss Oldcastle, what is the most precious gift one person can give another? She hesitated, and I, fearing to embarrass her, answered for her. It must be something imperishable, something which, in its own nature, is, if instead of a gem or even of a flower, we could cast the gift of a loving thought into the heart of a friend. That would be giving, as the angels, I suppose, must give. But you did more and better for me than that. I had been troubled all the morning, and you made me know that my Redeemer liveth. I did not know you were playing, mind, though I felt a difference. You gave me more trust in God, and what other gift so great could one give? I think that last impression, just as I was taken ill, must have helped me through my illness. Often when I was most oppressed, I know that my Redeemer liveth, would rise up in the troubled air of my mind, and sung by a voice which, though I never heard you sing, I never questioned to be yours. She turned her face towards me. Those sea-blue eyes were full of tears. I was troubled myself, she said, with a flattering voice. When I sang, I mean played, that I am so glad it did somebody good. I fear it did not do me much. I will sing it to you now, if you like. And she rose to get the music. But that instant, Judy, who I then found had left the room, bounded into it with the exclamation, Auntie, Auntie, here's Granny. Miss Oldcastle turned pale. I confess I felt embarrassed, as if I had been caught 
in something on the hand. Is she come in? asked Miss Oldcastle, trying to speak with indifference. She's just at the door. Must be getting out of the fly now. What shall we do? What do you mean, Judy? said her aunt. Well, you know, auntie, as well as I do, that granny will look as black as thundercloud to find Mr. Walton here, and if she doesn't speak as loud, it will only be because she can't. I don't care for myself, but you know on whose head the storm will fall. Do, dear Mr. Walton, come down the back stair, then she won't be a bit the wiser. I'll manage it all. Here was a dilemma for me either to bring suffering on her, to save whom I would have borne any pain, or to creep out of the house as if I were and ought to be ashamed of myself. I believe that had I been in any other relation to my fellows, I would have resolved at once to lay myself open to the peculiarly unpleasant reproach of sneaking out of the house, rather than that she should innocently suffer for my being innocently there. But I was a clergyman, and I felt, more than I had ever before, that therefore I could not risk ever the appearance of what was mean. Miss Oldcastle, however, did not leave it to me to settle the matter. All that I had just written had but flashed through my mind when she said, Judy, for shame to propose such a thing to Mr. Walton. I am very sorry that he may chance to have any unpleasant meeting with Mamma, but we can't help it. Come, Judy, we will show Mr. Walton out together. It wasn't for Mr. Walton's sake, returned Judy, pouting. You are very troublesome, Auntie dear. Mr. Walton, she is so hard to take care of, and she's worse since you came. I shall have to give her up some day. Do be generous, Mr. Walton and take my side, that is, auntie's. I am afraid, Judy, I must thank your aunt for taking the part of my duty against my inclination. But this kindness, at least, I said to Miss Oldcastle, I can never hope to return. It was a stupid speech, but I could not be annoyed that I had made it. All obligations are not burdens to be got rid of, are they? she replied with a sweet smile on such a pale, troubled face, that I was more moved for her, deliberately handing her over to the torture for the truth's sake, than I care definitely to confess. Thereupon Miss Oldcastle led the way down the stairs. I followed, and Judy brought up the rear. The affair was not so bad as it might have been, inasmuch as, meeting the mistress of the house, in no penetralia of the same. I insisted on going out alone, and met Mrs. Oldcastle in the hall only. She held out no hand to greet me. I bowed, and said I was sorry to find Mr. Stoddard so far from well. I fear he is far from well, she returned. Certainly, in my opinion, too ill to receive visitors. So saying, she bowed and passed on. I turned and walked out not ill-pleased, as my readers will believe, with my visit. From that day I recovered rapidly, and the next Sunday had the pleasure of preaching to my flock. Mr. Aitken, the gentleman already mentioned as doing duty for me, reading prayers, I took for my subject one of our Lord's miracles of healing. I forget which now, and try to show my people that all healing and all kind of healing comes as certainly and only from his hand as though instance in which he put forth his bodily hand and touched the diseased and told them to be whole and as they left the church the organ played comfort ye comfort ye my people saith your god i tried hard to prevent my new feelings from so filling my mind as to make me fail of my duty towards my flock. I said to myself, let me be the more gentle, the more honourable, the more tender towards these my brothers and sisters, for as much as they are here brothers and sisters too, I wanted to do my work the better that I loved her. Thus week after week passed, 
with little that I can remember worthy of record. I seldom saw Miss Oldcastle, and during this period never alone. True, she played the organ still, for Mr. Stoddart continued too unwell to resume his ministry of sound, but I never made any attempt to see her as she came to or from the organ loft. I felt that I ought not, or at least that it was better not, lest an interview should trouble my mind, and so interfere with my work, which, in my calling, meant anything real, was a consideration of vital import. But one thing I could not help noting, that she seemed, by some intuition, to know the music I liked best, and great help she often gave me by so uplifting my heart upon the billows of the organ harmony, that my thinking became free and harmonious, and I spoke, as far as my own feelings was concerned, like one upheld on the unseen wings of a ministering cherubim, how it might be to those who heard me, or what the value of the utterance in itself might be, I cannot tell. I only speak of my own feelings, I say. Does my reader wonder why I did not yet make any further attempt to gain favour in the lady's eyes? He will see, if he will think for a moment. First of all, I could not venture until she had seen more of me, and how to enjoy more of her socially, while her mother was so unfriendly, both from instinctive dislike to me, and because of the offence I had given her more than once. I did not know, for I feared that to call oftener might only occasion measures upon her part to prevent me from seeing her daughter at all, and I could not tell how far such measures might expedite the event I most dreaded, or add to the discomfort to which Miss Oldcastle was already so much exposed. Meantime, I heard nothing of Captain Everett, and the comfort that flowed from such a negative source was yet of a very positive character. At the same time, will my reader understand me? I was in some measure deterred from making further advances by the doubt whether her favour for Captain Everett might not be greater than Judy had represented it, for I had always shrunk, I can hardly say, with invincible dislike, for I had never tried to conquer it from rivalry of every kind. It was, somehow, contrary to my nature. Besides, Miss Oldcastle was likely to be rich some day, apparently had money of her own, even now. And was it a weakness? Was it not a weakness? I cannot tell. I writhed at the thought of being supposed to marry for money, and being made the object of such remarks as, Ah, you see, that's the way with the clergy. They talk about poverty and faith, pretending to despise riches and to trust in God, but just put money in their way, and what chance will a poor girl have besides a rich one? It's all very well in the pulpit. It's their business to talk so. But does one of them believe what he says, or, at least, act upon it? I think I may be a little excused for the sense of creeping cold that passed over me at the thought of such remarks as these, accompanied by compressed lips and down-drawn corners of the mouth, and reiterated nods of the head of knowingness. But I mention this only as a repressing influence to which I certainly should not have been such a fool as to yield, had I seen the way otherwise clear. For a man, by showing how to use money, or rather simply by using money all right, may do more good than by refusing to possess it, if it comes to him in an entirely honourable way, that is, in such cases as mine, merely as an accident of his history. But I was glad to feel pretty sure that if I should be so blessed as to marry Miss Oldcastle, which at the time whereof I now write, seemed far too gorgeous a castle in the clouds ever to descend to earth for me to enter it, the poor of my own people would be these most likely to understand my position and feelings, and least likely to impute to me worldly motives, as paltry as they are vulgar and altogether unworthy of a true man. So the time went on. I called once or twice on Mr. Stoddard, and found him 
as I thought better, but he would not allow that he was. Dr. Duncan said he was better, and would be better still, if he would only believe it and exist. Chapter 20 of Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gertrude Durrett Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald Chapter 20 Mood and Will Winter came apace. When we look toward winter from the last borders of autumn, it seems as if we could not encounter it, and as if it never would go over. So does threatened trouble of any kind seem to us as we look forward upon its miry ways from the last borders of the pleasant green words on which we have hitherto been walking. But not only do both run their course, but each has its own alleviations, its own pleasures, and very marvelously does the healthy mind fit itself to the new circumstances, while to those who will bravely take up their burden and bear it, asking no more questions than just, is this my burden? A thousand ministrations of nature and life will come with gentle comfortings. Across a dark verdureless field will blow a wind through the heart of the winter, which will wake in the patient mind not a memory merely, but a prophecy of the spring, with a glimmer of crocus or snowdrop or primrose, and across the waste of tired endeavor will a gentle hope, coming he knows not whence, breathe spring-like upon the heart of the man around whom life looks desolate and dreary. Well do I remember a friend of mine telling me once, he was then a laborer in the field of literature, who had not yet begun to earn his penny a day, though he worked hard, telling me how once, when a hope that had kept him active for months was suddenly quenched, a book refused on which he had spent a passion of labor, the weight of money that must be paid and could not be had, pressing him down like the coffin lid that had lately covered the only friend to whom he could have applied confidently for aid, telling me, I say, how he stood at the corner of a London street with the rain dripping black from the brim of his hat, the dreariest of atmospheres about him, in the closing afternoon of the city, when the rich men were going home, and the poor men who worked for them were longing to follow, and how across the waste came energy and hope into his bosom, swelling thenceforth with courage to fight and yield no ear to suggested failure. And the story would not be complete, though it is for the fact of the arrival of unexpected and apparently unfounded hope that I tell it, if I did not add that in the morning his wife gave him a letter which their common trouble of yesterday had made her forget, and which had lain with its black border all night in the darkness unopened, waiting to tell him how the vanished friend had not forgotten him on her deathbed, but had left him enough to take him out of all those difficulties and give him strength and time to do far better work than the book which had failed of birth. Some of my readers may doubt whether I am more than a wandering voice, but whatever I am or may be thought to be, my friend's story is true. And all this has come out of the winter that I, in the retrospect of my history, am looking forward to. 
it came with its fogs and dripping boughs and sodden paths and rotting leaves and rains and skies of weary gray, but also with its fierce red suns shining aslant upon sheets of manna-like hoar-frost and delicate ice films over prisoned waters and those white falling chaoses of perfect forms called snowstorms those confusions confounded of infinite symmetries and when the hard frost came it brought a friend to my door it was mr stoddart he entered my room with something of the countenance naaman must have borne after his flesh had come again like unto the flesh of a little child he did not look ashamed but his pale face looked humble and distressed its somewhat self-satisfied placidity had vanished and instead of the diffused geniality which was its usual expression it now showed traces of feeling as well as plain signs of suffering i gave him as warm a welcome as i could and having seated him comfortably by the fire and found that he would take no refreshment began to chat about the day's news for i had just been reading the newspaper but he showed no interest beyond what the merest politeness required i would try something else the cold weather which makes so many invalids creep into bed seems to have brought you out into the air mr stoddard i said it has revived me certainly indeed one must believe that winter and cold are beneficent though not so genial as summer and its warmth winter kills many a disease and many a noxious influence and what is it to have the fresh green leaves of spring instead of the everlasting brown of some countries which have no winter i talked thus hoping to rouse him to conversation and i was successful i feel just as if i were coming out of a winter don't you think illness is a kind of human winter certainly more or less stormy with some a winter of snow and hail and piercing winds with others of black frosts and creeping fogs with now and then a glimmer of the sun the last is more like mine i feel as if i had been in a wet hole in the earth and many a man i went on the foliage of whose character had been turning brown and seared and dry rattling rather than rustling in the faint hot wind of even fortunes has come out of the winter of a weary illness with the fresh delicate buds of a new life bursting from the sun-dried bark i wish it would be so with me i know you mean me but i don't feel my green leaves coming facts are not always indicated by feelings indeed i hope not nor yet feelings indicated by facts i do not quite understand you well mr walton i will explain myself i have come to tell you how sorry and ashamed i am that i behaved so badly to you every time you came to see me oh nonsense i said it was your illness not you at least my dear sir the facts of my behavior did not really represent my feelings towards you i know that as well as you do don't say another word about it you had the best excuse for being cross i should have had none for being offended it was only the outside of me yes yes i acknowledge it heartily but that does not settle the matter between me and myself mr walton although by your goodness it settles it between me and you it is humiliating to think that illness should so completely overcrow me that i am no more myself lose my hold in fact of what i call me so that i am almost driven to doubt my personal identity you are fond of theories mr stoddard perhaps a little too much so perhaps 
Will you listen to one of mine? With pleasure. It seems to me sometimes I know it is a partial representation, as if life were a conflict between the inner force of the spirit, which lies in its faith in the unseen, and the outer force of the world, which lies in the pressure of everything it has to show us. The material operating upon our senses is always asserting its existence and if our inner life is not equally vigorous we shall be moved urged what is called actuated from without whereas all our activity ought to be from within but sickness not only overwhelms the mind but vitiating all the channels of the senses causes them to represent things they are not, of which misrepresentations the presence, persistency, and iteration seduce the man to act from false suggestions instead of from what he knows and believes. Well, I understand all that, but what use am I to make of your theory? I am delighted, Mr. Stoddard, to hear you put the question. That is always the point the inward holy garrison, that of faith, which holds by the truth, by sacred facts, and not by appearances, must be strengthened and nourished and upheld, and so enabled to resist the onset of the powers without. A friend's remonstrance may appear an unkindness, a friend's jest an unfeelingness, a friend's visit an intrusion, Nay, to come to higher things, during a mere headache, it will appear as if there was no truth in the world, no reality but that of pain anywhere, and nothing to be desired but deliverance from it. But all such impressions cause from without. For remember, the body and its innermost experiences are only outside of the man, have to be met by the inner confidence of the spirit, resting in God and resisting every impulse to act according to that which appears to it, instead of that which it believes. Hence faith is thus allegorically represented, but I had better give you Spencer's description of her. Here is the fairy queen. She was arrayed all in lily white, and in her right hand bore a cup of gold, with wine and water filled up to the height, in which a serpent did himself enfold. That horror made to all that did behold, and she no whit did change her constant mood. This serpent stands for the dire perplexity of things about us, at which yet faith will not blench, acting according to what she believes, and not what shows itself to her by impression and appearance. I admit all that you say, returned Mr. Stoddart, but still the practical conclusion, which I understand to be that the inward garrison must be fortified, is considerably incomplete unless we buttress it with the final how. How is it to be fortified? For... I have as much of this in art as you, but yet my nature could not bear it so. You see, I read Shakespeare as well as you, Mr. Walton, I dare say, from a certain inclination to take the opposite side and a certain dislike to the dogmatism of the clergy, I speak generally. I may have appeared to you indifferent, but I assure you that I have labored much to withdraw my mind from the influence of money and ambition and pleasure and to turn it to the contemplation of spiritual things. Yet, on the first attack of a depressing illness, I cease to be a gentleman. I am rude to ladies who do their best in kindness to serve me, and I talk to the friend who comes to cheer and comfort me as if he were an idle vagrant who wanted to sell me a worthless book with the recommendation of the pretense that he wrote it himself. 
Now that I am in my right mind, I am ashamed of myself, ashamed that it would be possible for me to behave so, and humiliated yet besides that I have no ground of assurance that, should my illness return tomorrow, I should not behave in the same manner the day after. I want to be always in my right mind. When I am not, I know I am not, and yet yield to the appearance of being. I understand perfectly what you mean, for I fancy I know a little more of illness than you do. Shall I tell you where I think the fault of your self-training lies? That is just what I want. The things which it pleased me to contemplate when I was well gave me no pleasure when I was ill. Nothing seemed the same. If we were always in a right mood, there would be no room for the exercise of the will. We should go by our mood and inclination only. But that is by the by. Where you have been wrong is that you have sought to influence your feelings only by thought and argument with yourself, and not also by contact with your fellows. Besides the ladies of whom you have spoken, I think you have hardly a friend in this neighborhood but myself. One friend cannot afford you half experience enough to teach you the relations of life and of human needs. At best, under such circumstances, you can only have right theories. Practice for realizing them in yourself is nowhere. It is no more possible for a man in the present day to retire from his fellows into the cave of his religion and thereby leave the world of his own faults and follies behind than it was possible for the Aramites of old to get close to God in virtue of declining the duties which their very birth of human father and mother laid upon them. I do not deny that you and the Aramite may both come nearer to God in virtue of whatever is true than your desires and your worship. But if a man love not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Which surely means to imply at least that to love our neighbor is a great help towards loving God. How this love is to come about without intercourse, I do not see, and how, without this love, we are to bear up from within against the thousand irritations to which, especially in sickness, our unavoidable relations with humanity will expose us, I cannot tell either. But, returned Mr. Stoddard, I have had a true regard for you, and some friendly communication with you. If human intercourse were what is required in my case, how should I fail just with respect to the only man with whom I had held such intercourse? Because the relations in which you stood with me were those of the individual, not of the race. You like me because I am fortunate enough to please you, to be a gentleman, I hope, to be a man of some education and capable of understanding or at least docile enough to try to understand what you tell me of your plans and pursuits. But you do not feel any relation to me on the ground of my humanity, that God made me and therefore I am your brother. It is not because we grow out of the same stem, but merely because my leaf is a little like your own that you draw to me. Our Lord took on him the nature of man. You will only regard your individual attractions. Disturb your liking and your love vanishes. You are severe. I don't mean really vanishes, but disappears for the time. Yet you confess you have to wait till somehow you know not how it comes back again, of itself, as it were. Yes, I confess, to my sorrow, I find it so. Let me tell you the truth, Mr. Stoddard. You seem to me to have been hitherto only a dilettante or amateur in spiritual matters, 
Do not imagine I mean a hypocrite. Very far from it. The word amateur itself suggests a real interest, though it may be of a superficial nature. But in religion, one must be all there. You seem to me to have taken much interest in unusual forms of theory and in mystical speculations, to which in themselves I make no objection. But to be content with those, instead of knowing God himself, or to substitute a general amateur friendship toward the race for the love of your neighbor, is a mockery which will always manifest itself to an honest mind like yours in such failure and disappointment in your own character as you are now lamenting if not indeed in some mode far more alarming because gross and terrible. Am I to understand you then that intercourse with one's neighbors ought to take the place of meditation? By no means, but ought to go side by side with it, if you would have at once a healthy mind to judge and the means of either verifying your speculations or discovering their falsehood. But where am I to find such friends beside yourself with whom to hold such spiritual communion? It is the communion of spiritual deeds, deeds of justice, of mercy, of humility, the kind word, the cup of cold water, the visitation in sickness, the lending of money, not spiritual conference or talk, that I mean. The latter will come of itself where it is natural, you would soon find that it is not only to those whose spiritual windows are of the same shape as your own that you are neighbor. There is one poor man in my congregation who knows more, practically I mean too, of spirituality of mind than any of us. Perhaps you could not teach him much, but he could teach you. At all events, our neighbors are just those round about us, and the most ignorant man in a little place like Marshmallows, one like you with leisure, ought to know and understand and have some good influence upon. He is your brother whom you are bound to care for and elevate. I do not mean socially, but really, in himself, if it be possible. You ought at least to get into some simple human relation with him, as you would with the youngest and most ignorant of your brothers and sisters, born of the same father and mother, approaching him not with pompous lecturing or fault-finding, still less with that abomination called condescension, but with the humble service of the older to the younger, in whatever he may be helped by you without injury to him. Never was there a more injurious mistake than that it is the business of the clergy only to have the care of souls. But that would be endless. It would leave me no time for myself. Would that be no time for yourself spent in leading a noble Christian life, in verifying the words of our Lord by doing them, in building your house on the rock of action instead of the sands of theory? in widening your own being by entering into the nature, thoughts, feelings, even fancies of those around you, in such intercourse you would find health radiating into your own bosom, healing sympathies springing up in the most barren acquaintance, channels opened for the inrush of truth into your own mind and opportunities afforded for the exercise of that self-discipline, the lack of which led to the failures which you now bemoan. Soon then, would you have cause to wonder how much some of your speculations had fallen into the background, simply because the truth, showing itself grandly true, had so filled and occupied your mind that it left no room for anxiety without such questions as, while secured in the interest all reality gives, were yet dwarfed by the side of it. Nothing, I repeat, so much as humble ministration to your neighbors will help you 
to that perfect love of God which casteth out fear. Nothing but the love of God, that God revealed in Christ, will make you able to love your neighbor aright. And the Spirit of God, which alone gives might for any good, will by those loves, which are life, strengthen you at last to believe in the light, even in the midst of darkness, to hold the resolution formed in health when sickness has altered the appearance of everything around you, and to feel tenderly towards your fellow, even when you yourself are punched in dejection or racked with pain. But, I said, I fear I have transgressed the bounds of all propriety by enlarging upon this manner as I have done. I can only say I have spoken in proportion to my feeling of its weight and truth. I thank you heartily, returned Mr. Stoddard, rising, and I promise you at least to think over what you have been saying. I hope to be in my own place in the Oregon loft next Sunday. So he was, and Miss 